2024 Atlanta workshop for single cell omics. I am Saurabh Sinha, faculty uh, of BME and ISYE at Georgia Tech, and uh, along with uh, my colleague Manoj Basin from Emory University, uh, we'll be uh, we are presenting to you this conference for the uh, third year um, after a highly successful uh, offering at Emory University last year. Um, over the next two days, we will uh, hear nearly 20 talks um, presenting the state of the art in analytics and experimental applications of single cell technologies um, for biological as well as clinical applications. These will include four uh, keynote talks by eminent researchers across the nation. Um, There'll be three industry representatives presenting the state of the art in commercial um, products in this field. And uh, there'll be 12 short talks that were selected from nearly 50 abstract submissions. And these will be presented mostly by trainees from a variety of labs. There will also be a poster session with nearly 40 posters, which present equally exciting signs, but couldn't be represented at the podium in, because of the time constraints. So the awesome conference is brought to you by ASCOM AI, the Atlanta Single Cell Omics and Analytics Initiative. And I'd urge you to go to its website, ascomai.org, which is a collaboration among Georgia Tech, Emory University, and Morehouse School of Medicine. The conference organization has been tremendously supported by IDEAS, the Institute of Data Engineering and Science, which was represented by an outstanding team of experts in putting together events like this. It has also been supported by Emory University and by 10X Genomics, Singular Genomics, and Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. Needless to say, this conference is a testament to the electric atmosphere in the greater Atlanta area in the single cell field through academic industrial clinical partnerships. A word about the scientific goal of the workshop. Of course, it is about single cell omics, and it underlines the ongoing revolution in the field, both in terms of measurement techniques and computational analysis. It is as if we have suddenly been gifted with a whole array of microscopes that we ne never had before, and we have to just look uh, and find out the exciting things that are going on in the living world. So it's only uh, up to uh, only uh, our imagination and creativity that's needed along with the expertise in using these um, modern day microscopes to figure out the mysteries of biology and medicine. We're about to find out more about that over the next two days. One logistical point I'd like to make that uh, Lauren asked me to remind you is please return the name tags at the end of each day. Um, that's a request for you. And you can pick it up again the next day. And with that, I'd like to welcome Julia Kubanek, Vice President for Interdisciplinary Research at Georgia Tech, for her opening statement. Thank you, Saurabh. My name is Julia Kubanik. Uh, I'm a professor here at Georgia Tech in biological sciences and chemistry and biochemistry, and also the vice president for interdisciplinary research. So I'm pleased to have you here all on our campus today. Um, and I'm glad to be joined here by colleagues from Emory University and from the Morehouse School of Medicine who are partners in this important initiative. I particularly like to recognize the planning committee, especially Saurabh and Manoj. Uh, Alex Korshi from Morehouse School of Medicine, as well as Manisha Aluru, Greg Gibson, Tony Pan, all of them from Georgia Tech, Deborah Hamilton, and Sartak Satpahi from Emory. And once again, for the third year in a row, you've pulled together a superb program and you've captured, I think, what is the best acronym for any meeting uh, in the city of Atlanta, maybe even in the Southeast with AWESOME. Um, at Georgia Tech, we couldn't host these kinds of programs and, and bring together such diverse faculty, students, and researchers across disciplines without our interdisciplinary research institutes, of which the Institute for Data Engineering and Science, mentioned earlier by Sarab as we call it IDEAS, so not quite as good an acronym as awesome, but I think second best here today. Um, that's one of our, our interdisciplinary research institutes, IDEAS. 
And that's the one that's hosting us today here on our campus. So the goal of IDEAS and our other nine interdisciplinary research institutes is to bring together researchers across Georgia Tech and with partnering organizations for transdisciplinary research, to support translation of research outcomes to communities and commercialization, to provide experiential learning for students and trainees working across disciplines, and to provide leadership nationally and internationally in areas of research critical to human health global sustainability, economic development, and quality of life. Um, the Awesome 24 program tackles exactly these critical challenges, especially the integration of AI and machine learning into omics experimental and bioinformatic analyses at the single cell level. As a chemical biologist, I'm still waiting for the full chemical microscope that will illuminate for me every single biomolecule and metabolite in a cell, show me their spatial distributions, show me what they're doing with each other, how they change over time. When I was a graduate student, this is something I dreamed about, and I think there was even a movie that came out in the 1990s that showed Harrison Ford with a microscope in the rainforest, looking through the microscope and seeing the chemical structures of all the molecules on a plant surface. I want that. And I think, actually, it is coming to be within reach, this idea of being able to describe uh, all of the molecules, whether they be uh, nucleic acids, proteins, peptides, or, or metabolites um, within the cell. So I think it's the generation of trainees who are here today who are going to break this for us, and I'm looking forward to you delivering that to my lab maybe within the decade. So I'd also like to thank the, uh, the invited and the keynote speakers who are here today and who traveled to join us um, and who will be inspiring us, I know, with your discoveries and your innovation. Uh, and I'm looking forward to the stimulating session coming up. And from here, I'm going to pass the microphone. Sorry, am I passing it to M Melissa, or who, who's the next? Uh, video. video, wonderful. Yeah. OK, I'll pass Thanks it Thanks very much, Ilya. Um, do you want to introduce uh, Melissa while I share my screen? Yeah. Uh, the next opening remarks are from um, Morehouse School of Medicine, our partner. Melissa Davis. Melissa Davis uh, is a recent recruit at uh, Morehouse School of Medicine. She is the director for Translational Health Institute, uh, and she was recently awarded, I think, a large uh, initiative funding for Cancer Grand Round uh, to really understand, like, how do diversity impact uh, omics landscape. So uh, here is her message. Okay, um, thanks everyone for coming over for third annual awesome conference. And uh, it's a, organized by ESCOMI, that is Atlanta Single Cell Omics and Analytical Initiative. Um, that is a joint initiative in between Emory University, uh, Georgia Tech, and Morehouse School of Medicine. And <clears throat> there is no doubt that in last decade, uh, 
single cell technologies have become the major technologies to really understand like how do different cells in different complex diseases, they contribute to the outcome and how do they alter uh, to produce like a particular kind of uh, phenotype. And uh, at Emory, a large number of clinical basic science as well as uh, translational researchers, they are utilizing or want to use single cell technologies to really understand the mechanism of complex uh, diseases. So keeping that in mind, uh, three years back in collaboration with uh, Greg Gibson and Georgia Tech team and Morehouse uh, team, we founded this initiative that is now co-led by me and Saurabh. So I think we are really excited about the progress that we made in last three years uh, under this initiative. We are helping the investigators to choose like what is the optimal technology in single cell or spatial space that you should use for the biological question that you're asking. That is the first thing. Second, we have the bioinformatic team at Emory as well as at Georgia Tech to really help the investigators to uh, carry out a optimal analytics on their projects. And then we also have the educational initiatives going on uh, where we have a full course uh, on single cell at Emory as well as at Georgia Tech. So I think uh, we, we are really excited about uh, how the community in Atlanta area is coming together under this initiative to really make a big uh, progress toward understanding complex diseases, finding new uh, biomarkers. And I'm also I'm very pleased with uh, the leadership at Emory, like they are really making a big push toward uh, AI, single cell genomics, uh, as well as data science um, as a part of uh, AI Humanity Initiative that is launched by our provost, uh, Professor Ravi Balamkonda. We have recruited now more than two dozen faculties who are working in the area of AI, single cell genomics, as well as uh, machine learning. And then we also launched um, Empathetic AI Institute under the leadership of uh, uh, Professor Anant Malabushi. So I think mm, we are making a great progress uh, into that area and I'm, I'm really excited about uh, this event every year because this is the event where I have like time uh, to discuss one-on-one -on -one with all the researchers like exciting single cell um, projects in their lab as well as thinking about what new we can do really to uh, help the researchers uh, in, in uh, this area. So I would like to welcome everyone on behalf of Emory School of Medicine, uh, Georgia Tech, and Morehouse School of Medicine. And um, I'm really excited about uh, the talks and discussions. Uh, and um, <clears throat> hopefully um, uh, this will be a big successful conference um, over next two years. And I look forward to big success for ESCOMA initiative. Yeah, thank you. John, do you want to set up? All right, um, time for the keynote talk. It's my distinct honor to introduce our keynote speaker uh, this morning, Professor John Ma from Carnegie Mellon University where he is the Ray and Stephanie Lane Professor of Computational Biology. Um, John and I were colleagues at the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, where he started his independent academic journey in 2009 before moving to CMU in 2016. And over the last many, many years, I've witnessed in awe the amazing contributions that John and his research group has made to the community. His lab develops machine learning algorithms to study the structure and function of human genome and cellular organization. Um, he has recently pioneered a series of new machine learning methods for 3D epigenomics, comparative genomics, spatial genomics, and single cell analysis, with publications in high profile venues, including Nature Genetics, Nature and Biotechnology, and Nature Communications. He's the recipient of several leading recognitions of the field, including the NSF Career Award, a Guggenheim Fellowship in Computer Science, Fellowship of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. 
He leads an NIH 4D nucleome center to develop machine learning algorithms to better understand the cell nucleus. And his service um, is also, uh, record is also exemplary, and he currently serves as the program chair of Recomb 2024. So uh, welcome, Jen. Looking forward to your talk. Thanks very much for um, being here. Thank you so much, Thora, for the uh, invitation and also for the very kind uh, introduction. And thank you all for uh, coming. It's uh, my uh, distinct pleasure and, and honor to um, uh, give this keynote uh, talk uh, in, in this great, awesome conference. Um, so the, talk of, the title of my talk is uh, rather generic, uh, but I will give you a very uh, quick overview of some of our recent work in uh, single cell 3D epigenomics. Um, um, you know, the, the, the problem, given, given the time limit, I'll uh, just go through the uh, problem uh, definition, the data types, and also some of the computational thinking behind um, uh, 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 um, uh, these projects, and, and um, you know, I'd be happy to elaborate uh, offline on some of the details. So we all know that there are many different, numerous different cell types in our body, in different organs and, 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 and tissues, and um, they all share the same, virtually the same genome, but they have very different genome functions. It's all due to the different gene regulations in these different cell types. And because, as we all know, because of the single cell technology, especially single cell RNA now, you can um, identify these different cell types and cell states using single cell very high throughput methods, all the way from normal development to disease progressions. And if you look at uh, the plot on the right-hand side, this is a recent paper from the Allen uh, Institute for Brain Sciences. This is a whole mouse brain. Uh, looks like the authors are running out of colors to un annotate different cell types. And this is certainly very important to characterize different cellular states, but there's also a lot of work to be done in order to understand why these cells having their distinct uh, uh, states and, and cell identities. So of course, one of the uh, main modulators or, 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 or differences among these different cell types is their epigenomes are different. And one important layer of the epigenome um, is actually uh, the in situ organization of biomolecules and in, in, in cells in their in their um, uh, spatial context, and that's that's something that I would like to uh, uh, talk about a little bit uh, today. It, so, as Sora mentioned, in the past uh, few years, we have been particularly interested in developing computational methods, especially uh, some machine learning learning architectures, to study uh, the spatial epigenome. And this spatial epigenome is indeed um, having multiple uh, scales. Um, if you look at the uh, top panel on the left-hand side, I'm showing you a spatial organization of uh, our chromosome. These chromosomes are uh, being folded and packaged in a small cell nucleus. Of course, in addition to chromosomes, there are DNAs, there are other biomolecules and RNAs and proteins within the cell nucleus. And they have their spatial uh, uh, organizations, and this, this type of spatial patterns are highly regulated. Any disruption, perturbation may lead to uh, 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 human diseases. So if you step back and then, you know, certainly the, the nucleus is only one component in the cell. There are other structures, organelles, and compartments uh, in, in the cell. On the, at the bottom left, I'm showing you this is a model from live cell imaging from Allen Institute for Cell Sciences they published last year, showing, you know, different colors indicating different cellular structures within the cell. Within, you know, the cell nucleus are in the middle, but there are other components. If you keep stepping back, of course, you now see that these cells are also spatially organized in complex tissues. And I saw the programs, there are a lot of talks that will be covering spatial transcriptome. It certainly is a very uh, emergent, uh, you know, interesting topic that a lot of people are um, uh, intrigued about. But ultimately, of course, the long, -time, long term goal is to have a very comprehensive understanding of this multi-scale spatial epigenome. And when, when, it, when it comes to this, this, this structure or all the, all the components that we want to cover, I think this um, Oscar-winning movie uh, last year nicely summarizes the goal, everything, everywhere, all at once. You know, when I saw this title, I was like, wow, this is single cell systems biology we're talking about, right? You wanted to cover every single component and understand their interconnections and their, um, the, the interwoven um, relationships among them. So just very briefly, um, this is a work that uh, we uh, 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 published last year and it actually made to the cover of uh, Nature Genetics. We developed this method called SpiceMix. This is specifically for a spatial transcriptome. So the reason we might name it SpiceMix is, I don't know if you, how many of you know SpiceMix, is that if you 
put different proportions of spices together, you get, you, 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 you get different flavors. So cells may, may work in similar ways. There are some underlying factors, just like these spices. If you put different proportions of them together, it may give, it may give rise to different cellular identities. But the challenge, of course, is that we don't know what are the underlying factors. Those are hidden, those are late, latent factors, and then we can design computational approaches to review them. And of course, you can um, um, uh, interpret these different factors. Some of them may be intrinsic gene programs. It's a composition of different genes. Some of them may reflect their spatial organization of the cells, right? These, these genes, they have spatial patterns, and they also have, you know, um, pairwise, you know, between different gene programs, different, different factors, they may have their spatial preferences. So without getting into the details, so we actually designed a method. It's a combination of two types of models. One is the conventional non-matrix, uh, um, uh, non-negative matrix factorization uh, to be embedded in, in a graphical model. And um, in the end, you will be able to review the cellular compositions and also the underlying factors, the cellular compositions that give rise to different cell types or cell identities in the spatial context. And of course, we specifically consider their uh, spatial organizations. So just show you one example. This is an old data set from uh, StarMap, uh, from Xiao Wang's lab at, at, at the Broad. And this is you know, a data set with a, a, about 1,000 a, a genes and 1,000 cells. And uh, the, uh, the panel on the top showing the different cell types. And then the UMAP at the bottom um, is a uh, embedding of the, um, uh, you know, derived from the spice mix that you can see that you can separate these different cell types nicely in, uh, by considering both the gene expression and also their spatial um, patterns. Perhaps more interesting outcome is this um, heat map that I show you on the right-hand side at, at the top. So this is these what we call metagenes. You can consider them as a combination uh, of genes. It's a direct outcome from the model. Essentially, it, it documents the uh, underlying gene programs, the, 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 the latent factors that I was referring to earlier. And um, you know, here I'm showing you 20 different uh, quote-unquote metagenes, and then they uh, all have their spatial uh, uh, patterns. And interesting, some of the metagenes, they like to hang out together. So they show distinct spatial patterns. For example, one highlight one with an arrow, this metagene between number five and number seven, it looks like they're more attractive to each other in a, in a spatial context. And certainly you can see that some of the pairs there are more repellent. They don't like to stay close to each other. And you can do the same types of analysis with cell types. I think this, you know, it's more, more traditional. But the, the metagene itself is certainly uh, intriguing to, uh, to us. And then we are also doing some follow-up uh, uh, studies uh, uh, on that in, in different kind of uh, uh, context to uh, try to model the dynamics of uh, the spatial, spatial uh, uh, transcriptome data set. But today, uh, for the rest of the uh, presentation, what I would really like to focus on is perhaps something is not quite um, uh, represented in, in, at least in this conference. I think this might be the only one to talk about um, how the genome is spatially organized in the cell nucleus, and especially in single cell resolution. So this is, so first of all, uh, 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 step back a little bit. So as I mentioned, we have, you know, the, the genome, we have 23 pairs of chromosomes, right? If you stitch, stitch them together, it's about six feet long, two meters long, but the cell nucleus is only five micrometer in size. So this long uh, chromosomes and DNA is being folded and packaged in the very small uh, uh, nucleus. And um, in the past 15 year, you know, 20 years or so, we have uh, accumulated uh, a lot of information and knowledge about how the chromosomes are organized at the population level, because there is this population level assay called high c where you can measure the contact frequency between any pair of genomic loci in the genome. So what I show you on the slide, this is a, a contact map where the colors are indicating the contact frequency. So you can look at any entry in this matrix, for example, a uh, IJ, this is a uh, interaction frequency between a genomic locus I and a genomic locus J in a particular cell uh, uh, population. And um, from this high C, you will be able to review different kind of structures in different scales. And we recently wrote a, uh, a review article showing, uh, discussing uh, some of the computational methods to derive these features. If you have interest, you can check it out. And all these features, you know, all the way from the highest resolution of the chromosomes are uh, forming these uh, chromosome loops were, were tremendously important for uh, gene regulations because they bring distal regulatory elements to 
uh, proximal promoters. And um, you also see that the, these, these chromosomes may form these um, so-called chromatin domains or topologically associated domains where the chromosomes are interacting with each other more frequently within the same domain compared to the neighboring uh, domains. And then the lowest resolution, the highest level, these chromosomes are also segregated in, in, in the cell nucleus into distinct discrete classes of the so-called uh, uh, compartments where, the, where there are um, largely two major compartments in the cell nucleus. One is called active A compartments and the other is uh, inactive B compartments. And all these features can be reflected by some analysis of that contact map that I showed you on, on the slide which I will get to uh, a little bit uh, uh, later on. Uh, AB compartment, topological associated domains, TADs, and also uh, the chromatin loops. Now, of course, all these are um, very important advances for us to um, um, understand how the genome is being organized in uh, three-dimensional space, but how actually this uh, organization um, looks like you know, what, what, what does it look like in uh, single cell resolution? That, that's something that we have been particularly interested in, but it has tremendous amount of challenges compared to some of the other single cell assays. The single cell high C, or, you know, as you can see in the, in the um, this uh, is the, the type of data you, you have to deal with. It's very sparse, but as compared to the uh, uh, population level contact map that I showed you earlier, and this is uh, uh, because of dimensionality is higher and then uh, more noise, it's actually harder to deal with compared to some of the other single cell assays, like single cell RNA, single cell TAD. And um, oftentimes, um, we are not uh, um, just um, happy with the embeddings. You can try to represent each single cell with this even very sparse contact map. You can do that, all right? And you, know, you can generate these um, two-dimensional embeddings to separate different cell types according to their features as being reflected in this high C contact maps. But one of the reasons to study spatial chromosome organizations is you also wanted to identify the types of features that I mentioned at the beginning, you know, compartments, loops, and domains at single cell resolution so you can look at their cell to cell variations and correlate with gene expression to see, you know, the interplay between transcription and genome structure, for instance. And if you Start with a sparse contact map like that, and that's, that's a non-starter, right? You, you will not be able to identify any interesting features from a sparse contact map like that. So what you want really is a more complete, a more, um, you wanted to impute those missing entries in that contact map. But the question, of course, how do you do that? So, uh, you know, of course, the analogy is that the bulk level high C I showed you is like the smoothie, but the single cell level analysis, we not only wanted to know what's in there, the, in, the ingredients, but also the relative proportions of these different ingredients in a particular cell type uh, 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 data sets that you are, you are handling. So we have our uh, uh, solution. This was uh, uh, published a bit over two years ago. Um, we have this method. This was done by a former graduate student, Roach, and now he's an independent fellow at the Broad Institute in Boston. So he came up with this idea to use a, a specific type of graph representation to model these data. And I will briefly go through uh, the underlying ideas um, of this. So the underlying idea is showing in this blow up version, and we model a set of, a set of single cell high C contact maps as a type of graph called hypergraph. So we all know graph, there are nodes and edges in the graph. In the hypergraph, uh, you also have nodes, um, but the edges may connect more than two uh, nodes. So you can have three, four, five, and so forth. In this case, this hypergraph is a specific type of hypergraph where each uh, hyperedge has the same number of nodes involved. So each hyperedge in this hypergraph has three nodes, two genomic bin nodes, so the red nodes are the genomic bin node, and then the blue node is the cell node. And then this triplet, this triangle that you're seeing here, represents a hyperedge. So this hyperedge connects, again, two genomic nodes and then cell node. What it means is that this hyperedge indicates these two genomic bins are interacting with each other in a given cell. So that triplet, this hyperedge itself, corresponds to an entry in this contact map. So essentially, for the entire single cell high C contact map data set, you turn that into a hypergraph. And initially, you have some of the hyperedges because you still have signals. 
from the original data, you have these hyper edges that are being measured. Your goal is to predict the ones that are you, you were not able to measure or you were not able to observe. And so essentially, as you're given a hypergraph like this, can you train a model where you, you can th then use the model to predict the unobserved triplets, unobserved hyper edges? So the way we do this is rely on a, um, you know, a, a, in, a train this model in a self-supervised manner. You hide some triplets and try to um, uh, recover them. And then once you have trained the neural net, you can use that to predict the existence of the other triplets. And one of the other outcomes, of course, is that you can generate embeddings for both the genomic nodes and then also the cell nodes. And once you have the cell node the embeddings, of course, you can enable follow-up analysis like clustering, right? So the outcome for this is one of the, I think one of the exciting part of this is that we kind of integrate both the um, imputation of the contact map and also the embedding of the cells into the same coherent framework. And, it, um, and what I show you in this diagram is that you can, you know, imputations and then also the embed uh, embeddings, you can uh, identify different cell types according to their three-dimensional chromosome architecture. And uh, with the imputation, of course, you can identify detailed structures and then look at their cell-to-cell -cell variations. Um, so give you one uh, a quick example. This is in a human iPS cell, WTSC11. The top panel is the original high C contact map. You can see there's a lot of noise and then uh, missing values. And then the, the, um, the, the contact map at the bottom, these are the imputed ones. And it, the signals are much enhanced and you can see some of the structures much more clearly. And why we wanted to do those imputations is also enhance the analysis of the cell-to-cell -cell variation of important cell, uh, uh, three, three dimensional chromatin structures. So on this plot uh, on the right-hand side, each row is a single cell. And then each column, this is this, uh, a type of score called insulation score, basically measures the intensity of the domain boundary. So the lower the score, the stronger the domain boundary. And you can see that uh, you know, certain regions, they show consistent um, lower scores across different single cells. And it's also being manifested in the, um, uh, the, the pseudo bulk uh, uh, contact map from uh, in, 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 in individual cells. But if you don't do the imputation, then it's extremely noisy in this type of analysis to look at cell to cell variation of these domain boundaries would not be possible. So uh, we apply this approach to uh, a, a single cell uh, high C data set at the time. Uh, uh, published by Joe Eckert's group at, at the Salk Institute uh, as part of their publication of this uh, single cell co-assay between uh, DNA methylation and uh, 3D genome um, organization, uh, single nuclear methyl 3C seq. Uh, the authors generated uh, a data set at, for uh, the human prefrontal cortex. And the authors argue that only using single cell high C, you were not able to separate very fine scale uh, neuronal cell types. Um, you need to use DNA methylation to do that. And we found that uh, with the more uh, advanced uh, uh, computational framework, we were actually able to uh, separate all the known uh, uh, accessory neurons and inhibitor neuron cell types, as I show you on, on, on this plot. And we also uh, use those derived features um, for marker genes and then compare with the marker genes for specific cell types. You can see that there is an enrichment and a correlation between um, these um, cell type specific uh, 3D genome features uh, uh, surrounding uh, the marker genes as, as you see that there, there's distinct patterns between the marker gene um, loci for both the single cell AB compromisation score and then also the single cell insulation scores. And this certainly motivates us to uh, look more into this connection between chromatin organization, the spatial organization of the genome and also uh, the genome function, in this case, uh, uh, gene transcriptions. Now, this is in single cell level, single cell AB compartment score, and also single cell insulation scores. And there's some other work from other groups are looking at specifically the chromatin loops in, uh, in, in, in specific cell types. So, of course, one of the, um, one of the things that always bothers me uh, when we, we started to look at these spatial organization of the genome is that this type of large-scale chromosome organization, the definition is extremely uh, simplistic and, and binary. So uh, the field is widely acknowledged that chromosomes are segregated into A and B compartments. But I feel like this A and B seems very 
you know, polarized and, and, and but there must be something in between. And that's actually the case, you know, uh, so very briefly, how to calculate these A and B compartments is very simple. You uh, derive a correlation matrix from the contact map that I showed you very early on in, in the presentation. And then um, you just take the, you know, do a simple PCA and first the principal component reflect the separation of the chromosomes into these two major compartments. And um, a few years later, this is actually in, in the first the high C uh, uh, paper published over 15 years ago. And a few years later, uh, there was a very high coverage, uh, high, uh, uh, population level high C data from uh, Lieberman and Aiden's group. Um, and in, in this data set, uh, the authors uh, generated a, 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 you know, 5 billion reads for uh, one uh, cell line. And once you have that much coverage, you see new things. And then one of the new things that the authors observed is that because the coverage is so high, you will be able to perform more reliable comparisons of the chromosomal interactions for interchromosomal interactions, not just for intrachromosomal interactions within the same chromosomes, but the, but the interactions between different chromosomes. And uh, as, as simple as a, a simple uh, a clustering will reveal that actually the AB compartment can be fine, can be further divided into these so-called subcompartments, A1, A2, mostly subdivide A compartment and B2, B3, B, you know, B1, B2, B3, mostly subdivide B compartment. There is a very small subcompartment B4 on chromosome 19. So what the authors did is that you can create these kind of interchromosomal contact maps. So how to read this, the rows are now, this is I think one of, yeah, so the rows are the odd number of chromosomes, the positions on the odd number of chromosomes, and then the columns are the positions on the even number of chromosomes. So this is an interchromosomal contact map. The reason you wanted to choose one is odd, the other even is you, want, you don't want to mix genomic bins in the same chromosome because they, may, they, they certainly have their interactions within the same chromosome. So this gives you a, a more unbiased view of interchromosomal contact map. And you just do a clustering. So the authors did, uh, I believe it's a uh, uh, Gaussian, Gaussian hit, hit the Markov model, but you can do, you can use other approaches to do clustering. And immediately you see that this contact map, there are some hidden patterns that you can uh, review by uh, uh, this type of uh, unsupervised learning approaches. And this is particularly useful because you now, you see that they actually correlate with distinct functional genomic signals and also known genome structure features like their distance to nuclear membrane, nu nuclear uh, uh, lamina, and they correlate with DNA replication timing. But the challenge, of course, at the time is that you only, this can only be done in one cell type with very high coverage. How about other high C data sets with moderate coverage? You don't see that much signal from interchromosomal contact map. And so if, uh, a graduate student, Kyle, uh, a few years ago, just had this you know, very simple approach. You can uh, actually train a, a denoising autoencoder using the high coverage of high C, and once you have trained a model, you can apply it to other low and moderate coverage high C for interchromosomal contact map, enhance the signals, and run this kind of subcompartment identifications. It was, it was very useful. You can look at the subcompartment and between different cell types using this approach. But of course, we want to ask, you know, can we also do this for single cells? In, in the single cell level, can you derive these structures? features, because these structure features are tremendously useful to quickly look at the spatial positioning of the chromosomes at the gen whole genome-wide level in different single cells, and also look at their cell-to-cell -cell variations and connect to uh, uh, gene expressions. So this is what uh, Kyle and working with Roche, so um, we developed a method called Single Cell Ghost. This paper actually just came online on Monday, so if you have interest, uh, uh, you can you know, to, to look further, you, uh, go, go, go check it out. I will quickly go through the underlying idea of, of, of this approach. It's embarrassingly simple in terms of the, the, the computational methods. Um, so here, the idea is that, so I introduced this notion of embedding and imputation, right, from Higashi, and we built upon the success of the Higashi framework. We rely, we use both the imputed contact map and also the embedding information, because the embedding information gives you information how the cells are, how similar the cells are in, you know, in, 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 in embedding space, I guess. And the imputed contact map will allow you to derive other information. In this case, is the um, uh, subcompartment uh, uh, contact map. Um, the, 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 
the most important uh, motivation here is that we cannot really use interchromosomal contact map anymore because even uh, as I showed you for the intrachromosomal contact map, the uh, coverage is so low, it's so sparse, and then if you look at the interchromosome contact map, it's practically nothing. There's no signal, so there's nothing to enhance if there's no signal. Um, so you have to work with the intrachromosomal contact map first, and then potentially you can also derive the um, uh, uh, to harmonize the differences between different chromosomes. That's what we did actually here. So first uh, you um, start from um, uh, single cell uh, contact map. You also, again, you view that as a graph where each genomic bin is a node and then some connections or correlations between these genomic bins are uh, the edges between uh, uh, the nodes. And the uh, cell embeddings from Higashi gives you this uh, key nearest neighbor types of information of how the cells are similar to, how, cell, how similar the cells are, and you can utilize or borrow information from the neighboring cells to further enhance the calculation of your, what we want to do in individual contact maps. And we use this um, random walk uh, approach for, to sample uh, the connections, considering that even in the enhanced imputed contact map, there's still a lot of noise. So here's a bit more. Uh, so you start from a contact map like that. You generate this type of correlations between the contact maps, and you sort them. You consider, we only consider the ones that are you know, really similar to each other, a strong correlation, or very different you know, in terms of their correlations. So you, and then those are more reliable. That's the first kind of filtering. The second is among all those, we also do a random walk to select the pairs or the walks that we want to focus on. So from that, you can generate two types of walks. One is relying on the really reliable edges, and you also do that for what we call the negative walks, basically between the genomic loci that are very different from each other. So from those two, and then you feed that, you know, of course we do this for both the uh, first order, that the immediate neighbor, and also the second order, so the neighbor's neighbor. Of course, you can further extend that, and then we did some experiment to show that uh, actually further extending that, you don't get that much of benefit by um, having, uh, just having the second order uh, random walks. And then when, once you have those walks, you can, um, you know, we just feed into a neural net to generate the uh, embeddings for uh, the genomic, no, uh, genomic bin node. And those genomic bin node with the embeddings, you'll be able to separate um, um, the contact map into subcompartments. I'm overly simplifying the process because there's some additional steps to ensure that different chromosomes, that different cells, that these clusters or these patterns that you're identifying can be, they're, they're coherent, right? In the end, we call five, again, five different subcompartments very well correspond to the population level subcompartment A, A1, A2, B1, B2, B3. I'm showing the advantage of uh, using, you know, uh, enhancing the signals in single cell high C Identifying a subcompartment, we show that you can pick up subcompartment patterns that single cell ghosts that were able to pick up, but at the population level, it's being ignored or overlooked, right? So here it's all gray or B3 subcompartment at the bulk high C level, but actually there are finer scale structures here that corresponds to a more active uh, subcompartment. This is reflected in pseudo bulk level single cell high C contact map and somewhat also reflected in the bulk level, but for some reason, the, um, the bulk level subcompartment didn't really re uh, uh, catch that. And um, you can also, at the single, at the uh, pseudo bulk level, you can compare with the uh, same type of analysis, right? You compare with, you know, histone modifications and DNA replication timing, and then they, you know, this is being uh, supported by this, 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 this type of stratification of, of these signals consistent with what we can observe from bulk level. And um, we again apply this to, to this data set in human free, prefrontal cortex. You may wonder, you know, if you use the original single cell AB compartment score, what you're gonna find. We found that, you know, you can still separate the cell types broadly. However, for various fine scale uh, uh, cell types like this in, in, in neurons, um, they're kind of still clustered together. But if you use the single cell ghost embeddings, you can uh, better separate these uh, 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 more detailed uh, uh, neuronal subtypes. And um, uh, we also look at, you know, the connections to transcription. There are single cell RNA-seq data for this uh, uh, region where um, for uh, the um, uh, marker genes in each one of these uh, cell types, uh, we found that there are 
this is kind of expected, they're all in active compartments surrounding the marker genes compared to the background. Now, this um, is useful, this type of comparisons, but you still sort of cannot do, uh, really do this in a single cell resolution. You can only aggregate the signals from single cells and you look at the cell type level comparison between these different modalities. It would be ideal if these, you know, both the genome structure and gene, gene expression function, they're from the same, exact the same cell, right? This is the, the you know, emergent technologies are, and many technologies are emergent, these sort of single cell co-assays, and then most widely used is the, the 10X uh, RNA and, and uh, chromatin uh, openness ataxy, but we also want to look at uh, chromosome organization, 3D genome organization that I demonstrate to you early on. So this is a uh, project in close collaboration with Zhijing Luan's group in University of Washington, led by uh, a PhD student in my group, Tiaming, and uh, the paper will come out in a few weeks. I quickly go through this because this is more on the technology and, and analysis side, and showing you how, you know, the high quality of the data. So on the left-hand side, this is the RNA part from GHC from this co-assay, and this is, again, in an adult mouse brain. We can separate these close to 30 different cell types using single cell RNA, perhaps not that surprising. But on the right-hand side, I'm showing you that if you use only the single cell high C part, you can also separate these different cell types. There's nothing surprising here, of course, but it does demonstrate the high quality of, of the data because they reflect the underlying different cell types in this complex tissue um, uh, uh, region. Of course, this will also enable us to um, really look at this multi-scale uh, spatial genome organization and their connections to gene expression. So on the left-hand side, I'm showing you the correlations between different kind of 3D genome features. In this case, um, um, AB compromisation score and insulation score, there are correlations with uh, gene expression. So there is a positive correlation between um, single cell AB compartment score and gene expression. And there is an anti-correlation between insulation score and uh, a, a gene expression, as I showed you at, at the bottom. And we select this, this, this gene ER, ER, ERBB4, which is a um, um, uh, inhibitor neuron specific gene. It's actually um, only in a, a type of uh, a cell type called P valve. So if you look at uh, you know, what I show you on the, uh, on the uh, right hand side, you can incorporate these features in different scales. On the leftmost side, we are looking at the single cell AB compartment. These are large scale compartmentalizations. So again, if the chromosome is more active, and of course, as expected, most of the genes on those uh, regions will be uh, highly expressed, no, not, not, not always. And uh, you can see that if you compare at the uh, cell type level, at the accessor neuron and inhibitor neuron, inhibitor neuron, this region is in, in more active regions, right? So, you know, as expected, the genes in those regions are more likely to be expressed highly. But that's just in the, um, you know, cell type level. Let's look at the subtype level. And if you look at the subtype level, among all the inhibitor neurons, you realize that the insulation score is lower in this P-valve subtype compared to other inhibitor neuron subtypes like SST and, and, and MICE2, because the score here is lower. As I mentioned, there's an anti-correlation between the insulation score and gene expressions. And we wonder what is going on here. So you can further bring up the loops, chromatin loops. So if you further zoom into this locus, this is the uh, transcription star side of the uh, ERBB4, this particular gene, you found that in this, um, these two uh, um, inhibitor neuron subtypes, you don't see a lot of activities in terms of chromatin interactions. However, if you look at the P-valve, this um, subtype, at the single cell level, there's, there seems to be some chromatin loops that are being formed in this particular subtype of inhibitor neuron. And so from some earlier annotations, uh, we saw that there is a, a correspondence between this particular loop and then an, an active enhancer that is being annotated using another technology called pair tag from Bing Ren's group at UC San Diego. So altogether, this data set allowed us to connect the various types of 3 genome features with gene expression directly because they're from the same uh, 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 cells at, at a single cell uh, resolution. So we may wonder, um, can we further utilize this type of data to 
uh, perform other types of analysis to look at the interplay and, and other components, especially the spatial temporal aspects. And in this mouse region, there was a earlier data set from Xiaowei Zhang's group. This is Murfish data in, in, the, in the mouse brain. So the idea here is that because we have this co-assay between single cell HiC and single cell RNA, we can use the RNA part as the bridge to um, integrate uh, spatial transcriptal Murfish and the uh, single cell co-assay uh, uh, gauge seek, you can overlay the gauge seek data on top of the spatial transcriptome such that we may be able to um, um, reveal some spatial variation of important 3D chromosome uh, organization features. And that's uh, uh, what we did. So, this on the top, I'm showing you the integration between gauge seek and then this earlier Murfish data looks um, good. And we focus on this layer, this. I believe it's L5IT, this layer in the middle. This is just the cell type layer annotations and then this green layer. So as expected, the gene expression from gauge seq is expressed highly in this middle layer for um, this, you know, for, for this region. And correspondingly, we saw that the single cell AB compartment score is also high in this middle layer. But perhaps a little surprising is that we don't see a, there's, a, there's, a, there's some differences. That's what I'm saying. There are some differences in terms of their correlations between gene expression and the expected 3D genome features. And that in this more in, in this more peripheral regions, you can see that this AB compartment score increases a little bit uh, for reasons we don't quite understand right now. And uh, that's something that we you know this is just an observation where if you plot different kind of features, if the x-axis axis is the distance to the surface, where the this this is the surface. And the y-axis is the you know, score and different kind of scores. And we're showing gene expression, single cell AB compartment scores, insulation score, gene body interactions. And you can do this kind of spatial stratification of your single cell assay data where initially it was not spatially resolved, but you can utilize some spatial transcriptome data using the RNA part as a bridge for this type of integrative analysis. So, um, um, so in the group now, as I, we, we, uh, I, I guess I, I uh, briefly went over um, several different um, ongoing development and interests in the group. Ultimately, of course, we want to put them all together. And, and um, there is, an, I believe there is a cohesive theme here because you're not just looking at by molecule, their spatial organizations. You're also looking at these cellular spatial organizations. And in a way, you're you're looking at these spatial organizations of both biomolecules and cells in different resolutions, all the way from highest resolution, how the chromosomes are being organized, forming these loops you know, in 10 nanometer, 20 nanometer scale, all the way to several microns as, as, as the cellular structures in, in, in tissues. And the in, intracellular epigenome, which I present mostly today, is how the genomes are spatially organized versus the intercellular organization, that level of um, spatial organization, and then how these two different components are informing each other. So if you consider sequence where DNA sequence, structure, the chromosome structure, and certainly structures of other biomolecules, and also their interactions, you can also consider them as a structure of property, and certainly ultimately we want to understand function, right? So the function in terms of cellular function, I'm showing you one example of gene transcription, but there are many other important cellular uh, uh, functions that eventually lead to differences in uh, phenotypes in, in, in cells and tissues. So I would like to end my uh, presentation with a story because I know there are a lot of um, uh, students in, in, in the audience and it resonates with the example that Saurabh uh, um, gave in his uh, opening. Um, I don't know how many of you know this person. So he's, his name is um, Levenhoek. So he was um, um, it's widely acknowledged that he was the first person who um, first observed a living cell over 350 years ago. He was actually a, a cloth merchant. So he sells fabrics and, 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 and cloths. And he likes to examine um, his items by developing these magnifying lenses, which I showed on the slide. And today, it, it is widely actually uh, 
acknowledge that this is a precursor of modern microscope. And uh, it uh, turned into some you know, very um, fancy and powerful microscopes that cell biologists use today. So this story, I think, at least tells us two things. Right? First of all, uh, the importance of being interdisciplinary. Just because you are a cloth merchant doesn't mean that you cannot be a cell biologist. And, um, and second is, I think, very important is the, is, is the, um, it is the tools are essential, right? So in this case, these magnifying lenses are essential for Leeuwenhoek to um, observe living cells. He's actually was pointing, is one day he was pointing his magnifying lenses to a droplet of water and he saw something moving. We now know that he saw bacteria cells. And you know, the importance of a tool, without this tool, you're not gonna be able to observe that. But of course, with the right tool, you also need to point to the right direction, right? You know, point to the right direction, ask the right question, and potentially you can uncover exciting uh, 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 science. So uh, with that, uh, I'd like to thank um, uh, uh, my group. You know, uh, some of them on this slide have already moved on, and, um, and uh, we work with this. None of this would be possible without the collaborations with many others in, in, in the field in both um, the computational side and certainly on the experimental technology development side. And uh, much of what I presented today is part of this uh, a couple of NIH consortium, uh, primarily for the nucleum, and there's also an ongoing consortium called Senate, which is trying to um, characterize features that we can um, identify senescent cells in various types of tissues in, in the human body. So uh, thank you very much. I'll be happy to take questions. Uh, John, awesome talk. Um, I wanted to ask whether you have played with any like oligo storm or oligo paint, you know, spatial um, spatial super resolution data where you can actually observe contacts and keep while well, keeping the cells alive, and then potentially after you get these data, you do your single cell high C um, on the same cells. Have you tried? you know, bridging modalities like that? Yeah, no, great question. So uh, we actually work with uh, one of the, you know, initial pioneers of Oligo Storm Ting Wu lab at Harvard Medical School as part of our uh, project. And that's actually one of the goals is to integrate that kind of imaging data with uh, genomic data. That's one uh, part, of the, uh, ans part of the answer that I can give you. The other is that we did, um, in some of those, I didn't present that. Like, for example, how you, how you can evaluate your imputation results. So one way we, we, we did is there are some, there are few very high resolution, um, these type of genome imaging uh, data. That one is from Xiaowei Zhuang's group. So what we did is that if you consider that's the ground truth in single cell, and we just downsample that, downsample the imaging contact maps, and then we throw that into this, you know, machine learning magic and see if it's gonna recover some of the missing Ones. And then we use that as an evaluation because you know, kind of know the ground truth from imaging. But of course it has its own limitations because we don't have that many um, um, uh, um, high resolution imaging data. And typically it's only one chromosome. I think there's chromosome for the whole genome is still challenging if you wanted to um, tackle the diffraction limit and then try to you know, f have very high resolution imaging data. Right now there are some lower resolution ones where the probes are skipping you know, a lot of chromosome regions, it's also very useful because it gives you the spatial contact. So short answer, yes, it's, it's tremendously useful for this kind of integrative analysis. Any additional questions? Hi, thanks, Jim, for the fantastic talk. So uh, in your um, gauge, gauge seek? Gauge seek. Or, yeah. Uh, in, so, so in, from your uh, co-essay, uh, where you have seen that there is this uh, difference, right? So between the gene expression or the spatial location uh, versus the three D genome uh, organization. So, uh, have you seen such kind of uh, difference between the two modalities uh, from your essay ghost work? So basically, there. It, so with the spatial data, it seems that 
you have seen some cell types that have similar gene expression pattern, but they differ in the 3D genome organization. Have you looked at that systematically? So maybe there's also uh, some cell types where uh, the uh, 3D genome organization are the same, but the gene expression is different. So basically the difference between the gene expression and the 3D genome organization, um, you know, the, the, between the two modalities, there can be some inconsistency. Have you looked at that? Um, uh, yeah, we looked at some of that. Uh, uh, I didn't present this today, but we, uh, you know, we looked at this one data set is in mouse brain, and we generated another one in, in uh, hematopoietic differentiation so that you can look at also their temporal orders of the changes in both the chromosome organization and gene expression, because the co-assay will allow you to do that in, the, in, a, in a finer uh, uh, resolution. And um, some of the intriguing or confusing observation, of course, is that the connections between the two also seems to be very much tissue specific, tissue type, like in mouse brain and what we saw in human hematopoietic differentiation. Those, some of them are different. Also, in the, in, the, in the differentiation process, you can look at their temporal order, what happens first, or what change happens first. The short answer is it's complicated. Uh, in general, there is, certainly dependencies, there's correlations, large scale correlations between these two modalities. But if you look at specific genes, and some of the genes that, you know, gene expression change first, and then followed by the chromatin organization changes, and some of them is more synchronous, but some of them is like the order is, is, is different. For, some, for reasons we don't know, I'm sure there are other factors that are involved in, in these type of uh, regulations. Great talk, Jen. Um, so towards the end, you showed uh, the MRFISH data in conjunction with the GAGE-seq analysis and said that you used RNA as a bridge um, and uh, to understand the spatial uh, spread of uh, the 3D genome yeah. information. So there, have you, um, also, could you also look at whether the th features of the 3D genome information uh, in, uh, uh, influence the expression, the spatial distribution of specific genes. Does that even make sense to ask if the a particular gene's expression spread in space is influenced oh, by I see. the? Oh, uh, no, we didn't do that. That's a good. That's a good. Right. That's a good one. Okay. <laughs> All right. Look at like gene centric kind of to. to that's right. Yeah, yeah. Because you have the genomic segment yeah, scores. Yeah, 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 right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, well, um, thanks very thanks. much again for Jen for a fantastic talk and let's thank you. I have a little token of appreciation for doing the trek over to us here. Is there someone who can take a photo? <laughs> take a picture. So, thank you, thanks very much. So this will be followed by two short talks, um, and uh, for this, uh, um, I have my colleague Peng Chu uh, chairing the session. Peng, take it over. Great, thank you. So next up, we'll have two talks. Uh, both are 20 minutes long, and the first one is going to be uh, from Emily Greenwood, uh, who's uh, a trainee at Georgia Tech, and she's going to talk, uh, talk to us about um, crop seek and how rare variants would affect gene expression data. Uh, observed in that platform. Right, thank so you. I think it's 17 minutes presentation, right? 20 minutes including the talk. Right. So we'll show you a flash card on the 16 minutes and then 17 minutes. Um, are the slides just up here? Oh. <laughs> no, it's okay. We have the presentation here. So Thank you. Okay, cool. 
Um, yes, so I'm Emily Greenwood. I am a fourth year PhD student at um, Georgia Tech in the Gibson Lab. And today I will be talking about evaluating the impact of rare variants on gene expression using expression crop sequencing, which is a combination of CRISPR-Cas9 and single cell RNA sequencing. So the focus of this talk and this project is rare variants. And as we know, and as the name implies, these are variants that are in low frequency in a population defined by a minor or low frequency less than 0.01. And because of that, these variants are understudied in comparison to common variants. Um, they are not often included in um, genotype arrays, so a lot of our association studies don't pick up on the impact of rare variants. And a lot of what we do know comes from imputation. But this is improving with the lowering cost of whole genome sequencing. And it is thought that rare variants likely explain additional disease risk and trait variability. And the evidence over the years shows that that is indeed the case. So rare variants impact genes that then impact disease. This review um, in 2021 does a really good job of highlighting four main areas in which rare variants contribute to human health. And this involves elucidating new disease mechanisms, potentially developing new areas for drug targets, and creating a way to have a really powerful biomarker that can stratify risk groups or treatment groups. So rare variants are really important. And there are models out there that take the information that we have and try to predict the function of these variants. And one of these models is Watershed, which came out in Science in 2020. And they take GTEx data, whole genome sequencing, and RNA-seq data from 838 individuals and detect gene expression outliers, and then look at rare variants nearby those genes, and based on functional annotation, predict if those variants are functional for causing those gene expression outliers. But as informative as this model is, at the end of the day, it is just a model. It is just prediction. And so we can get take this a step further by actually going in and experimentally testing the functionality of these predicted watershed variants. And so that is what we propose to do, and we do that with eCrop sequencing, which was developed previously in the Gibson lab and combines CRISPR-Cas9 to go in, knock out a specific SNP, in this case, rare variants, and then following single cell RNA sequencing, we're able to compare cells that received the specific perturbation to cells that did not for a target gene's expression. So we're actually able to test if a, a variant is functional. And so we do that for 501 rare variants that were predicted by Watershed to be functional with a posterior probability greater than 0.9. We also included 311 controls that were predicted by Watershed to not be functional with a posterior probability less than or equal to 0.001. We targeted our rare variants by two guide RNAs to just ensure proper knockout of our rare variants and our controls by one guide RNA. Um, we split these across two pools. So there are about 250 rare variants and 150 controls per pool. And Watershed predicts that a rare variant impacts a specific gene. So that gives us a list of 89 genes that are expressed in the cell line that we're doing these knockouts in, HL60. And you can see the feature plots for the genes in our pool one here. Again, we only have one cell type, so that's why the U map is just one cluster. Um, but you can see adequate expression for the genes of interest. After I designed the guide RNAs, um, my collaborator, Ming Ming Chow at Rice University, does gets, gets the guide RNAs into our cell, creates our knockout, and he does this through lentiviral transduction. And I won't bore you with the details, but after the knockouts have been created, and time has been given for these gene expression changes to occur. He ships the cells to me where I do single cell library prep and then our core at Georgia Tech does the sequencing. Um, just to note here, we used a, um, the Fluent Biosciences PIPSeq library prep technology, which instead of using microfluidics to barcode cells, actually just vortexes samples to encapsulate one cell and one barcode. And then after sequencing, I do standard single cell RNA-seq QC and data analysis in Surratt in our studio. 
And then we can start asking questions of if we can identify regulatory rare variants, how valid is this watershed model, and just verifying the accuracy and efficiency of the fluent biosciences PIPSEQ workflow. And so after doing this for our two pools, we ended up with, a, after QC, 110,000 cells in pool one in panel A and 190,000 cells in pool two in panel B. And because we only have one cell type, we should only have one cluster. We don't want our knockouts going to different clusters. The only thing that should be driving clustering should be cell cycle phase. And as you can see highlighted here, that is indeed the case. We also want to see even distribution of all of our cells that receive a specific guide RNA evenly distributed throughout each cell cycle phase. And as you can see here, cells in blue that received a specific knockout received a perturbation of a rare variant are in blue, and those that did not are in gray. And you can see that that is indeed evenly distributed. Um, and so you can think of our hypothesis test as all those blue cells are compared to all the gray cells for a specific target gene that's expression. And doing that for all of our guide RNA, we determined 145 rare variants to be nominally significant at a p-value less than 0 0.005. And this is just a stacked bar plot showing those results. So the y-axis is all the genes that we tested. The height of the bar is the total variants tested. Light blue are rare variants that were not significant. Light gray were controls that were not significant. Dark green are rare variants that we found to be significant. Dark purple are controls that we found to be significant. And so we do identify some controls, but there is a clear enrichment in the number of rare variants. There's 2.5 times as many rare variants as identified significant as there are controls. Um, we know that our analysis isn't perfect. We're going to identify some false positives. Watershed will identify some false negatives, potentially calling rare variants that are functional, not functional. So on both ends, there's some room for error. However, when we get an even more stringent p-value, this increases to four times the number of rare variants that were significant compared to controls. And actually diving into these results, um, these results are really compelling. So RS6030643 was predicted by Watershed to significantly alter TIM18 expression. And we observed that following eCropSeq to be true, to also be significant. And looking at eQTL gen for the location of cis eQTLs, we find that this rare variant overlaps with the reported region of the cis eQTL for TIM18, and you can see that here. So location, this is the cis eQTL from eQTL gen. Location is on the x-axis. Significance is on the y-axis. Each of these points is a common variant. Our rare variant is not included because it is very rare. And But you can see that highlighted in red, that is the location of where the rare variant would be. Um, so this just shows that how potentially rare variants can contribute to disease. And specifically, this gene is associated with type 2 diabetes and obesity. Um, another interesting example is RS1437380976. This variant was predicted by Watershed to um, be functional and change the expression of VPS13C. In eCropSeq, we observe that to be significant. Again, we see from eQTL gen that this rare variant overlaps the region of the reported cis eQTL. So it's in a region that is associated with regulating this gene. This gene also, from open targets, is reported to um, be associated with early onsets Parkinson's. So this is an example of how a rare variant could potentially be a really powerful biomarker for something like early onset disease. And then, of course, with any um, CRISPR experiment, you do worry about off-target effects. So we just wanted to make sure that the results we are seeing are driven by the expression changes to our target gene and not changing the expression for genes elsewhere in the genome. And so how we thought to do that was just classify the number of hits for our target gene, for our rare variants, and then our controls, which we've talked about earlier. We see a clear enrichment a clear significant trend. The blue diamonds here are just the number of variants that were significant out of all those that were tested. 
So we see a very significant relationship. And so, of course, these perturbations are happening nearby other genes, so we can check for the effect on those nearby genes. And if this relationship with our target gene is truly causal, then we should see clear enrichment in the number of hits for that target gene compared to outside genes. And so looking for the genes nearby these perturbations, we do indeed see um, a clear enrichment for our target rare group compared to these proximal genes. And we can take this a step further and just look at genes outside of the genome. And again, we see a clear enrichment compared to our target genes. So these variants are really impacting these target genes that were predicted by watershed to impact. Clear enrichment. Um, but of course, we know that this study is also limited by just the number of cells that receive a perturbation. And so highlighting out of all our guide RNAs tested, the number of cells that receive that perturbation, you can see that there is a shift in distribution based on significance. So that just means that as these studies get better and better and as we're able to get more cells that um, have more of that knockout, um, we have more power to detect a smaller effect size rare variant. And of course, we can't do talk about rare variants without also addressing a little bit of common variants. Um, so just some work that we've done with e-crop sequ e crop sequencing and common variants um, in IBD, EQTL. Um, over the past three years, we've been working on fine mapping 4,299 SNPs in cis EQTL for genes associated with IBD and we have determined 440 to be significant. And from doing that, we have, um, I noticed some clear trends in these EQTL. So for example, SNAP-C4, this is a cis EQTL for SNAP-C4. Um, SNAP-C4 is associated with IBD. And you can see in, these are all common variants that have some association with changing the expression of SNAP-C4. Each ORN point is, a variant that we tested in the green points are the variants that we found to be significant in e-crop sequencing. And so you can see that we observe multiple significant variants in EQTL, and those aren't always the, that lead variant, which um, kind of is the, we're getting away from it, but is the assumption. And then we also see a similar trend here. And then finally, future work, so we're taking those we currently just validated those 440 variants in HL60, and we see about a 30 to 40% validation rate. And um, we took those knockouts, differentiated the um, HL60 cells into two different lineages, neutrophils and macrophages, and then we're gonna compare across the three groups to address um, cell type specificity. So how are these rare variants, or common variants that were significant, are they the same across each groups, and what is that effect size? So in conclusion, we have functionally tested 812 rare variants across 89 genes and discovered 145 to significantly alter target gene expression that were predicted by Watershed to do so. And we've also have shown that e-crop sequencing is a really powerful tool to test regulatory function of rare variants as well as common variants. And then just on a secondary subpoint, we have seen that um, this watershed model is accurate in predicting functional rare variants as well as validated the fluent biosciences and PIP-seq workflow. Here's some references. And then um, just thank you to my first our funding, then IH, and then my PI, Dr. Gibson, Gibson lab members, especially Maggie Brown for her work on our cis EQTL isolation, um, the Molecular Evolution Sequencing Corps, as well as our collaborators at Rice University, especially Mi Ming Chao, who is the other half of all this work, his PI, Dr. Bao, um, Dr. Lee, Dr. Moyo, and other Bao lab members. And I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, thanks, Emily. Uh, great talk. <clears throat> so have you observed, Emily, like if you have two rare variants in the same gene and they have like a different kind of effect on the target gene, so what is the difference in their characteristics? Have you looked at that? 
Yeah, that's a really interesting question that we need to classify more. We do have some genes where they have multiple rare variants that are predicted to affect, and then we find that multiple rare variants are significant for those genes. And we do observe opposite effects. So that's something that um, is really cool. And yeah, we should take more time to classify. Great talk, Emily. Uh, did you really need the single cell uh, resolution for this study? And where was that used? Yeah, that may have not been clear, but the single cell just allows us to do this giant pooled screening. We have different cells with different knockouts, and we can do it in one big pool. And then once we do single cell RNA sequencing, we can the guides are read in as genes, so then we can group based on all these different guides. And how accurately you can capture the giant uh, single cell? That is, is yes, that is a good question, and. Um, we feel pretty confident at the sequencing depth that we sequence at that we can detect the guide pretty well. Um, most, most of the time we do detect one guide per cell. But yeah, that is one concern with this. All right, being a selfish person, I'll just insert one question. Okay. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned about potential errors, like watershed is not perfect. So your approach for detecting changes is also, well, may not be perfect. Mm -hmm. So after you examine all your data, do you have some rough feeling just in the book part, how accurate is watershed mm -hmm. and also uh, how accurate is your technique being able to detect uh, real changes? Yeah, so based on our common variant work, we do feel that like the things that we're detecting 30 to 40% of the time are indeed validated. So our end, watershed is tricky because they do do this across different tissue types. They, they um, detect gene expression outliers across different tissue types. So it really have to, you'd have to do something like this in multiple cell lines to get at that tissue specificity. But I feel like it does a pretty good job. Yeah. Great, wonderful, thank you. All right. So next up, William. All right, great. Next up, we have William Future, uh, who used to be a grad student at Georgia Tech, but now is with Emory, right? Um, okay, all right. So, uh, and he's gonna talk about inflammation-associated immune changes in the context of multiple myeloma. Hi, my name is William Pilcher. I'm a graduate student now at the Boston Systems Biomedicine Lab at Emory University. And here I'm gonna talk about how inflammation-associated immune impairment drives rapid progression in multiple myeloma. So multiple myeloma is a malignancy of the plasma cell population, sort of the end stage of B cells, which are the antibody-producing cells in the immune system. Uh, typically it's a malignancy that affects uh, elderly populations or above the age of 60. These malignant plasma cells, often referred to as myelomas, thrive in the bone marrow microenvironment in which its interactions with the local bone marrow promote their survival and expansion. Multiple myeloma is currently the second most common hematologic malignancy in the United States with approximately 35,000 or 36,000 um, diagnoses modeled in the last year. And this has been rising over the last few couple of years. So currently, the standard therapies in multiple myeloma uh, include a combination of three classes of drugs. These are proteasome inhibitors, uh, immunomodulatory drugs like lenalidomide and thalidomide, and glucocorticoids like dexamethasone. These drugs were selected based on either their direct anti or pro apoptotic effects on the myeloma cells or due to their immune stimulating effects, such as the case of lenalidomide, which promotes T and NK cell activation. The use of these triplet, uh, com triplet combination therapies have greatly improved outcomes in multiple myeloma patients. In more recent therapies, such as anti-CD38 antibodies, um, bispecific antibodies, or T-cell engagers, and uh, chimeric engine receptor T-cells, uh, 
generally continue the trend of trying to take advantage of the uh, patient's uh, original immune system to redirect that towards the uh, myeloma cell population. Uh, approximately 13 years ago, uh, the Baltimore Myeloma Research Foundation started the COMPASS trial relating clinical outcomes in multiple myeloma to personal assessment of genetic profiles. This was a longitudinal, longitudinal clinical trial that enrolled newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients who were eligible for either triplet or doublet therapy and had not yet begun therapy for disease. Following therapy, patients were to be observed every three months to assess their therapy response through a mixture of lab work and imaging. Uh, and this observation part of this trial was up to eight years, typically. Bone marrow aliquots were obtained for most of these patients prior to therapy, with some patients having also uh, provided uh, bone marrow aliquots at follow-ups if there was a notable change in their clin cl uh, clinical parameters. So these samples have previously been processed um, by separating to their malignant and uh, non-malignant fractions. The malignant fraction uh, has undergone whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing, and bulk RNA sequencing. And most of this data has already been published and is, previous, uh, is already available on the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation's research gateway. Analyses of these malignant fractions have identified various high-risk cytogenetic events, which can significantly predict outcomes. However, even with this additional, even with all this demographic and cytogenetic information, there are still gaps in our ability to predict outcomes among these patients, with many patients having no high-risk cytogenetic events, still having rapid regression following initial therapy. As previously mentioned, interaction with the bone marrow microenvironment can promote tumor growth and at the same time, therapies are primarily relying on the original uh, patient's immune environment to drive anti-cancer responses. These observations, along with multiple other studies on multiple myeloma, suggest that some of this gap in our understanding of patient outcomes may lie within the patient's own immune microenvironment. This is ultimately was the motivation behind the construction of the Immune Atlas of Multiple Myeloma, a uh, initiative funded and supported by the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. Uh, this expands upon the existing clinical and cytogenetic information available for many of these patients in the COMPASS trial by adding single-cell RNA sequencing data on the non-malignant fraction from these bone marrow aliquots. Construction of this atlas has been ongoing for the last few years, with sample processing analysis split across multiple medical centers and universities, including Emory University, Mount Sinai School of Medicine, Washington University, St. Louis, Mayo Clinic Rochester, and Beth Israel uh, Deaconess Medical Center. Previously, a smaller pilot study was performed to assess the feasibility of the project at this scale and to help harmonize the protocols between centers to minimize batch effects. Details from these pilot studies have been previously published and shown below. Now, the following describe our initial analysis of the first 361 bone marrow aliquots or 263 patients. Three prime single cell RNA sequencing on these 361 aliquots resulted in slightly over 1.1 million cells following empty droplet removal ambient RNA removal and standard QC filtering based on UMI counts of mitochondrial percentages. Data from the centers was integrated using Harmony, correcting for each individual combination of shipment, batch, and uh, processing center. Clustering manual, manual annotation resulted in 106 clusters split among various hematopoietic lineages, including T and natural killer cells, B cells, myeloid cells, and erythroid cells, along with a few plasma cells that made it past the uh, B, uh, magnetic bead isolation. The scale of the study gives us incredible resolution on the various immune compartments and allows us to characterize cell states that may be difficult to capture in smaller studies of the bone marrow. For example, we were able to identify a population of CD4 positive T cells with high expression of cytotoxic markers, a phenotype that more commonly associated with CD8 positive cells and was approximately 2.5% or of our T cells or 1% of all cells. And additionally, we were also able to identify multiple uh, CD56 bright natural killer cells, uh, a less cytotoxic, um, a immature and less cytotoxic uh, natural killer cell state, which is typically around 10% of circulating uh, natural killer cells. With our data set fully in integrated and annotated, um, we move back to the question of what factors in the immune microenvironment are associated with outcomes. To answer this question, patients were categorized based on their progression-free survival following first line of therapy. Continuing with our definition that was established in the pilot study, the groups that we focus on are the rapid progressors, patients that had a progression event within the first 18 months following first line of therapy, of which there are approximately 67 in this sub-cohort, and non-progressors, 
the patients who were observed for at least four years as part of the COMPASS trial and had no progression event during that time, which are approximately 83. An initial analysis of just the major non-malignant cell populations already indicated some alterations between the various cell groups. Namely, rat progressors showed enrichment of myeloid cells with depletion of the B lymphocytes. Further, diving further into the B cell compartment, in which we see the full developmental lineage for B cells from their immature uh, pro-B cell state to their naive memory state. Uh, on an individual cluster level, we did not seem to see any specific cluster standing out as just being the reason why we see B cell enrichment in non-progressors. Rather, most of the B cell population seem to trend towards uh, non-progression with the only clusters having a slight trend towards rapid progressors being the pre-B cells, though they only have a logical change about negative uh, 1.05 or 0.15. Um, because we see just this general depletion of B cell from, on both, from both the immature bone marrow native cell states to the mature cell states, this generally um, seems that B cells are just more generally depleted, which when combined with the fact that in rapid progressors we see a shift towards uh, granulocyte macrophage progenitors, a myeloid, a uh, proliferative bone marrow native myeloid, uh, partially committed myeloid uh, progenitor. Um, it may seem, it does seem that some of this may be a fact, or may be driven by a shift towards myelopoiesis in the bone marrow, where due to inflammation or stress, uh, hematopoietic stem cells will prefer to differentiate more towards their myeloid lineage as opposed to lymphoid. So now switching back over to the myeloid compartment, we did perform differential gene expression across CD14 classical monocytes between the rapid and non-progressors. What stood out the most was the presence of a few inflammatory markers, such as IL, uh, interleukin-8, interleukin-1-beta, CCL3, and CCL4, along with some stress markers and rapid progressors. Performing pathway analysis uh, using Reactome on this same set of markers uh, generally revealed that non-progressors showed more MHC class two antigen presentation signaling which would aid in antigen-mediated activation of T cells, while rapid progressors typically more inflammatory with pathways such as signaling by interleukins, tumor necrosis factor signaling, and chemokine receptors binding to chemokines. So generally, it appears that the myeloid compartment is more inflammatory in the rapid progressors. Moving over to the T cell compartment, though there were no differences in the baseline composition between rapid and non-progressors, or the baseline percentage of T cells between rapid and non-progressors, we did uh, identify large changes in the T cell composition between the two groups. Immediately looking at the differential expression between the rapid and non-progressors, we did observe that rapid progressors actually had multiple cytotoxic markers enriched in their, in, uh, their T cell compartment, whereas the non-progressors typically had more naive markers like LTB, TCF, and cell, along with multiple ribosomal markers, which we typically observe to be in higher uh, expression levels in the more naive T cell populations in our uh, studies. Similarly, looking at differential abundance, um, we find similar trends. The populations that stood out the most were the CD8, T naive, and T central memory clusters, which we found to be enriched in non-progressors, uh, less committed cell states, along with, uh, and then rat progressors, we actually found that the more differentiated antigen stimulate populations, uh, CD8, T effectors, and a late activated HLA DR positive CD8, T effector clusters um, were enriched in the rat progression group. Given that most of these changes in the T cell compartment appear to lie upon the differenti differentiation trajectory from the naive cell state to its uh, antigen-stimulated uh, cytotoxic state, we perform traje trajectory analysis to see if we can understand um, where these changes lie upon the T cell trajectory. Uh, trajectory analysis gives the expected result where we see just a general trend from the naive, uh, inexperienced cell state to more memory cell states to expanded effector populations prior to apoptosis. Um, focusing on the primary cytotoxicity tra trajectory highlighted in red, we see the naive and central memory populations associated with non-progressors appear very early on, early on this trajectory, um, whereas the HLA-DR positive effectors and this, the typical CD8 positive T effectors um, appear much later on in this uh, uh, differentiation trajectory. So this generally points towards rapid progressors having an accumulation of these more committed uh, T cell states as opposed to the more flexible, naive cell populations. And if we, instead of looking at a cluster basis, we just look at a continual density along this uh, trajectory, 
we see a clear peak in rapid progressors towards a point where we see high, um, high expression of these cell toxicity markers and very low expression of naive markers or co-stimulatory markers such as CD27, CD28. So with all these individual observations, the question naturally comes up on, are these just seen together in rapid progressors by coincidence? Or is there some common thread that seems to be connecting these changes uh, or driving these changes in these rapid progressors? Uh, it turns out that these findings have been observed together, not necessarily in the study of multiple myeloma, but actually in the study of uh, inflammatory changes seen in older populations or inflammation. Um, Inflammation refers to the accumulative effects of either chronic antigen pressure or just chronic infections like Epstein-Barr virus or cytomegavirus over years of, you know, over the years. And this has been found to lead to cause uh, these patients or patients with this inflammation phenotype to be kind of in a constant uh, low-grade state of inflammation. Some of these alterations can then make them less responsive to these therapies. Um, on a point-by-point -point basis, the, on the B-cell side, we mentioned that we saw that some of this may be myelopoiesis. Well, it is actually known that acute stress or chronic inflammation can promote what's sometimes referred to as emerging myelopoiesis, in which HSCs uh, stop developing to, into lymphocytes at the same rate and instead prefer myeloid development. This can lead to an increase in the myeloid populations in the bone marrow of, of uh, older patients, or in this case, the rapid progressors here. The inflammatory markers like interleukin-8, interleukin-1-beta, and so on are in, that we find in monocytic marmot are sometimes referred to as senescent associated secretory phenotype factors. These are factors that are seen in patients with this chronic low-grade inflammation. And some of these factors individually, like interleukin-8 and interleukin-1-beta, um, have been shown to have pro-tumor effects on the monolith population. Lastly, with the T-cell population, and the one that is most relevant to the therapies as they typically rely, uh, involved T-cell activation. Um, the accumulation of differentiated T-effector populations and the loss of naive populations is something that is thought to be due to a combination of factors, including the thymic involution, um, de degradation of the thymus, uh, impairing uh, naive T-cell development that's often seen in younger, uh, sorry, older populations, along with antigen pressure just generally pushing the T-cell to di di differentiate to a very committed state. This could be driven in part by myeloma, where its presence in the bone marrow um, stimulates this T-cell uh, differentiation to these more terminally differentiated factors. Though, it, as mentioned before, um, there is some, some people, some theorize that it could be driven by uh, chronic infections like cytomegavirus or Epstein-Barr virus. These T-cells are sometimes referred to as senescent, as they lack the co-stimulatory receptors, CD27, CD28, which would, which would help uh, which would typically be, or which in MHC, in MHC mediated act, uh, antigen presentation um, would help uh, uh, promote antigen mediated expansion um, in the T cell populations. Um, and typically, they, these are also in a state of repetitive senescence. Now, uh, given that we see these uh, accumulation of these more, I guess, inflamed. Uh, T cell populations. We did do cell uh, chat, and, or we did cell signaling analysis or communication analysis with cell chat to see if the T cell populations could be influencing some of the other departments. The one that stood out the most was interferon gamma, a marker that's you know, canonically associated, associated with these more cell toxic T cells, um, which we found to be primarily uh, received by the monocytes in which uh, canonically interferon gamma would promote inflammatory phenotype, like we are observing rapid progressors. We can see that on a suitable level that the rapid progressor patients tend to have higher average expression of interferon gamma across their entire T cell compartment, and that higher average expression of interferon gamma generally is associated with worse outcomes across the full cohort. Um, similarly, on the monocyte side, interferon gamma receptor 2, the target of interferon gamma uh, is also associated with worse outcomes and is higher in rapid progressors. So it is possible that interferon, that the you know, interferon gamma from these accumulated T cells could be driving some of these um, phenotypic, can be worsening some of these inflammatory uh, changes between other departments. So with these finds together, we were, we were able to build our initial model describing our understanding of the immune microenvironment associated with worse outcomes. 
namely how chronic inflammation ultimately drives the accumulation of these immunosenescent T cells that secrete interferon gamma that may lead to more inflammatory alterations of the myeloid compartment, which could produce multiple factors that then may promote tumor survival. So in conclusion, the initial analysis of the immune atlas of multiple myeloma reveals multiple alterations of rat progressors consistent with models of inflammation, the accumulation of immune alterations from chronic inflammatory activity. This less flexible immunosenescent phenotype may explain poor response to initial therapies, which depend on exist the existing immune environment. As more samples from the COMPASS study are processed and added to this atlas, we will be able to perf uh, perform more specific subset analyses, such as focusing on patients that have much earlier onset of multiple myeloma. Uh, and with that, I would like to acknowledge the numerous people that have been part of this effort to construct this immune atlas for multiple myeloma. You know, working on a project scale truly can't be done by one institute, let alone an individual. Um, and many people have contributed to uh, multiple parts of this project, ranging from data creation, uh, sample processing, cell annotation, data analysis, interpretation, and have been critical to building this resource and improving our understanding of the immunity, uh, role of immunity in multiple myeloma. And of course, I would like to thank the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation for funding this study. Um, so in terms of data, uh, a preprint describing this full analysis will, including further stratification by cytogenic risk and showing uh, improving patients for application by incorporating immune signatures will be on relative, will be available relatively soon. Um, data produced by these efforts will be managed by the Multiple Myeloma, Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. Um, I don't think the portal for accessing data is ready yet. However, uh, be sure to keep uh, check the research uh, gateway um, for from the MRF and also check their website for any other in initiatives. Um, so with that, any questions? We have time for two questions. Any takers? Well, if not, I'll again be the selfish person. Um, so uh, in your data analysis pipeline, you mentioned that um, you use Harmony to integrate data coming from different institutions. Um, I wonder, uh, you probably have tried other data integration approaches. Um, have you? Uh, are you referring specifically to embedding or like batch correction? At like batch correction. So for the differential gene expression, we're using Lima and also for like the survival curves, we're adjusting. Sorry. So for batch correction, generally we're treating the combination of shipment batch and uh, processing center as individual covariates. So the, ship, the processing samples happen in three batches for every site. So with four sites, there's you know, 12 different, there's basically 12 possible variables for that value. Um, when it comes to anything that involves linear modeling, like uh, differential gene expression or the survival curves, the Cytex batch or that batch covariate is typically adjusted for. Um, to ensure there's no batch effect from that. Um, in terms of like the clustering, I think we decided to go with Harmony pretty early on because Harmony uh, benchmarking typically has been shown to perform the best. Uh, for some analyses that we can't, you know, there's some analyses like Cell Chat and Scenic which don't have ways in for like some of the parts of the algorithm to control for a covariate externally. And for that, we did uh, run a combat seek for that case, those cases specifically, we did run a combat seat like algorithm. Um, it wasn't literally combat seat because that won't run when you have a count matrix this large. But um, you know, we we did we did actually test how the maps looked with combat seat correction as opposed to harmony, and it actually did give pretty similar results. So, um, so yeah, we we evaluated a few things for figuring out how we control for batch effect and. For progression, we did make sure that non-progression rat progressors were uh, relatively evenly, or there was no association between the distribution rat progressor and non-progressor within statistical uh, covariate combination. So, um. Maybe I can ask. Uh, so I think uh, I, I know this project very well. So <clears throat> I can ask a general question, basically, like so. Is this inflammaging phenotype is specifically associated with multiple myeloma or with any cancer? What, what do you think? Um, and, and, and you work on a lot of other studies related to that. So is, is this is a general phenomena or this is multiple myeloma specific? So with solid tumors, at least from my understanding, I haven't worked too much solid tumor myself, uh, besides a pancreatic project with a vascular. 
but um, you know, salt tumor typically the mode for T cell uh, dysfunction is usually through exhaustion, which usually refers to the cytotoxic cells upregulating, you know, uh, immune checkpoint inhibitors um, like PDC or PD one and so on, or no, they up they uh, upregulate the inhibitory receptors like uh, PDCD one and other and others, and you know, ligand binding those down regulate the T cell responses. Here, while we do see um, some association with exhaustion and rapid progression, this exhaustion signature is primarily occurring in sort of the GZMK positive compartment, um, which some studies may refer to as pre-exhaustion. So um, there, so this mechanism here appears to be senescence, and I think that would primarily affect tumors that are, I mean, tumors are typically more common in elderly populations, but specifically for tumors in populations above like 60 or 65 is when, you know, things like those age groups already typically have more impaired naive T cell development or replenishment. And I think those are the cases where um, these kind of phenotypical changes would be much more negative, um, especially given that, um, you know, therapies that uh, target the immune system like lenalidomide or these various antibodies, you know, those also are sources of stress on the immune environment. And there have been studies shown um, that, you know, you will see these kind of down regulation of naive cells and shift towards defectors um, and relapse um, following these therapies. And that then makes them subsequently less able to take on a, you know, if they relapse on that and now their immune system is more impaired, you know, any secondary therapy would be less effective. So, um, Yeah, I mean, if, if you have healthy T cell replenishment, I think, or naive T cell replenishment, then that would, I mean, some, I think some of the kind of runaway inflammation would still be bad, but I, you would be at least able to rebound, um, or at least I would hype, uh, assume that would be the case. Um, that'd be a study in itself. Great, thank you. Let's thank the speaker again. All right, so that concludes the first technical session in the morning, and we'll have a 10 minutes break and reconvene at 11 o'clock.
We are about to begin with the second session on multimodal single cell omics. So I request everyone to be back in the conference hall. Can you announce the name? Uh, Yonina? Is that Yonina Loscove? Our first speaker of the session is Yonina Loscove. Can the speaker please come up front? Yonina Loscove? Welcome everyone to the second session on multimodal single cell omics. My name is Swati Basin and I will be the session chair with Dr. Saurabh Sinha. Our first speaker of the session is Yonina Loskove. She will be talking about the single cell multiomic analysis of the role of ARID 1B in fetal brain development and neurodevelopmental disorders. Uh, you have uh, 17 minutes. And um, okay, thank you. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Yunina Laskov. Um, I am a fourth year in Dr. David Gorkin's lab from Emory University. And today I'm going to be telling you a little bit about my project using cell t single cell multiomic analyses to look at brain development in mice lacking ARID 1B. So in the nucleus, DNA is packaged around histone proteins to form nucleosomes, which is the basic structural unit of chromatin. Chromatin is found typically tightly packed, and so DNA is not accessible. In DNA, certain sequences in the DNA, such as promoters and enhancers, which are cis regulatory elements, are key regulators in gene expression. And so when these cis regulatory elements are accessible, Transcription factors can come and bind to their transcription factor binding sequence motifs, which then can promote other co-activators to come bind and promote targeted gene expression. And to gain accessibility at these key regions throughout the genome requires chromatin remodeling complexes, such as the berg one berm associated factor, or BAF complex for short. These BAF complexes are able to reposition nucleosomes at these cis regulatory elements, which then again allows for targeted gene expression. It has actually been seen that when you have mutations in multiple of the BAF chromatin remodeling complex subunits, it can lead to neurodevelopmental disorders such as intellectual disability, developmental delay, autism spectrum disorder, and other rare Mendelian syndromes. And in fact, it has been shown that ARID1B, which encodes for the BAF subunit that is highlighted on the right, is one of the most frequently mutated single genes causative of these neurodevelopmental disorders. And to showcase this, the Deciphering Developmental Disorder Consortium conducted a study on about 1,000 trios with intellectual disability and developmental delays and performed an enrichment analysis to see what genes were enriched for de novo mutations within their cohort. And when they performed this enrichment analysis, which you can see on the left, ARID1B, which is on the top right in the red box, was found to be the most enriched gene for de novo mutations and accounted for about 1% of diagnosed cases within their cohort. And while it is well known that mutations in ARID1B are causative of neurodevelopmental disorders, the molecular mechanisms that link ARID1B to neurodevelopmental disorders are not well defined. And it has been seen using other model systems, such as the mouse, that when you have mutations in ARID1B, they present with phenotypes that are seen in this population. And so, for example, when you have an ARID1B haploinsufficient adult mouse, they're seen to have certain social and behavioral defects, some communication skill impairments, and reduced brain region volumes, which are also seen in neurodevelopmental disorder patients. Even at embryonic time points, it has been seen in this ARID1B haploinsufficient mouse model that we see asynchronous development of certain neuronal cell populations, such as fewer GABAergic interneurons and interneuron progenitors, leading us to believe that neuronal dysregulation likely arises even in your utero. But what still is not fully defined is what cell type specific defects to chromatin remodeling and gene regulation occur in these mice when ARID1B is mutated. And so what my lab is interested in doing is trying to identify what cell types in gene regulatory networks are dysregulated during brain development that lead to these neurodevelopmental disorders. 
And to do that, my lab with uh, Jackson Laboratory have collaborated to um, create a ARAG1B mouse line by intercrossing two heterozygous ARAG1B mice to produce our meat and embryos and our wild type litter mate match controls. We are collecting samples from two different time points, E9.5 whole embryos and E15.5 microdissected uh, forebrain tissue. With these, we have we collect males and females per genotype, and then they go through the 10x single nuclear multiome analysis pipeline. And so the first thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to first confirm that we have high quality single nuclear multiome data um, and also create a reference data set at E9.5 to see that we have specific uh, cell lineages that we would expect to see at this developmental time point. And the current data we have to look into this is our nine wild type whole embryos, five males and four females. And so what I'm showing you here is um, our UMAP visualization of our nine embryos assayed individually and analyzed jointly, both RNA and ATAC-seq modalities combined. Here what you can see is we have um, been able to annotate a total of 31 different cell type clusters based off of single cell RNA atlases and well annotated marker genes from literature curation and have been able to divide them into five main categories, mainly neuronal cell populations, epithelial cells, erythroids, mesodermal cells, and endothelial cells. We can also confirm that we are able to co-cluster our nine different embryos within this joint embedded space, where when you look on the right, where we have each of the different wild types, the green dots there are the cells, or in my case, the nuclei of each of the embryos, and you can see they're all co-clustering nicely within that UMAP visualization. And so what we wanted to do, since I'm interested specifically in the neuronal cell populations, since we know that mutations in ARAG1B do lead to neurodevelopmental disorders, we wanted to confirm that we are seeing expected neuronal cell populations at this time point. And so what you have here on the right is still the same UMAP visualization of all the cell clusters, but what we're looking at is the level of gene expression of certain marker genes and in which clusters you see them highlighting. And the higher the gene expression is indicated in the purple. And so what you can see here, if you look at the two bottom ones, we're able to already start picking out certain expected neuronal cell populations like neuron progenitors in cluster eight based off of the marker gene LHX4. But even if we look at the top two, we can see that we're starting to identify clusters that have marker genes for specific brain regions, such as the mesencephalon based off of the marker gene DMBX1 in cluster three and diantelencephalon in cluster one. And so too, we can also confirm this by not only looking at our own marker gene expression, but also if we look at mRNA and C2 hybridization data from the image mouse atlas, and we look at these marker genes, we can see that their expression is localized to the developing brain in E9.5 embryos. And because we have single nuclear multiome data, we also have single cell attack seq data, which is um, our ability to get chromatin accessibility and transcription factor motif enrichment from these individual cells. And this data provides insights into the regulatory mechanisms that might be underlying the gene expression patterns that we see at the single cell level. And for my project, this is of key importance for us, given that BAF is what helps regulate chromatin accessibility and of which ARID1B, again, encodes a subunit of the BAF complex. And so just to show you a little bit of our data, um, for example, when we look at the top right are the two examples of the marker genes for the different brain regions, the mesencephalon and the diantelencephalon. And we are able to also look in the bottom at the enrichment of the transcription factor motifs for these genes, which also happen to be transcription factors. And so where you see red indicates a high enrichment of the motif for that transcription factor in the nuclei in those cell clusters. And as you can see, we're seeing nice enrichment of those specific motifs within those same uh, clusters, indicating that we're able to identify both the motif enrichment as well as the transcription factor gene expression. Not only that, but we also wanted to make sure that we could see peaks of accessibility at validated enhancers within our own data. And so we took some validated enhancers from the VISTA enhancer database 
um, and look to see uh, if at the single cell level we can see peaks of accessibility in certain, in certain clusters. So what I have here for you today is looking at a few different clusters from our main categories where we have two neuronal cell populations on top, epithelial cells, and so on and so forth. And so if we take a look at the first one here, we can see that at the single cell level in both our neuronal cell clusters, when we look at the genomic region of where this enhancer can be found, we do see peaks of accessibilities within those neurons. And so too, when we look at the reporter assay data, we can see that the enhancer activity is localized within the brain. So too, you can see with the other two enhancers there as well, where we see peaks of accessibility in certain neuronal cell clusters or our cardiac progenitor clusters, we again see that the activity of these enhancers uh, using the reporter assay are localized in those tissues as well. And so, so far I've shown you that with our data, we are able to accurately define specific cell type populations at E9.5 to build this reference data set for ourselves. And I will say we do currently have mutant data for our E9.5 embryos, which are still currently being assessed and ongoing. But what we also have is we have data from our E15.5 microdissected forebrain tissue. We currently have six E15.5 forebrains, one male and one female per genotype. And so the first thing we want to do is do the same kind of analysis and try to identify if we see the expected neuronal cell populations that would be assumed to see in the E15.5 mouse. And so again, using these single cell RNA atlases and these uh, marker genes from literature curation, we're able to define a total of 21 different uh, neuronal cell populations within the forebrain that can be uh, grouped into three main categories, namely GABAergic neurons, glutamatergic neurons, and neuron progenitors. And so again, here, as we can see, using certain marker genes, uh, we can again start to delineate the different types of cell types that we have here from certain progenitors, like the intermediate progenitors in cluster 19, versus more differentiated neurons, like cortical interneurons in cluster 3 and 9, using these marker genes. And so too, again, using in situ hybridization data, looking at the forebrain of an E15.5 embryo, we can confirm that we do see these genes being expressed and localized within the forebrain. And while we are currently underpowered given the current sample size that we have for our E15.5 microdissected forebrain samples, we were wondering if there are possibly any initial observations that we can see between our different conditions. And so we pseudo the data and performed a principal component analysis to try to explore the underlying structure of our data and see if we can gain insight in what the variance in our data uh, what the different variances in our data is looking at the different principal components. And so I don't have it here for you on this slide, but for example, when we look at principal component one and two, we see that the variance highly correlates with sex. And so since this is an exploratory analysis, I wanted to look at the different uh, principal components and see if maybe any of them might correlate with genotype. And so when we look at PC4 and PC5 here, it looks like we're starting to see that the different genotypes might start clustering away from each other and co-clustering together. And so we wanted to get a better understanding of what biological processes might be associated with these principal components. And so to do that, we extracted the top 1,000 genes from PC4 and PC5 and performed gene ontology analysis on this. And so when I extract these top 1,000 genes from principal component four and perform this analysis, we can see that we have a couple of different overrepresented gene ontology terms in our data. Interestingly enough, all seem to have to do something in regards to translation. And when I perform the same analysis on this doing the top 1,000 genes for principal component five, we see that there are actually three gene ontology terms that are overrepresented in both of the gene sets from each of the principal components, namely cytoplasmic translation, translation at the postsynapse, and translation at the presynapse. And so since we know that BAF is able to regulate networks of genes since it's able to modulate chromatin accessibility, it is possible that if BAF is perturbed, like a mutation in ARAD1B, perhaps you have uh, some sort of dysregulation to networks of genes that is occurring, which then causes this neuronal developmental issue, which leads to these neuronal developmental disorders. 
And so we were interested to see if we look at these three gene ontology terms that are overrepresented in both of our principal components, perhaps there's a different enrichment of these gene sets in our different conditions. And so I performed a gene set enrichment analysis on the gene ontology uh, gene set of the term uh, translation at synapse for each cluster within our E15.54 brain. And so you doing this analysis, you get an enrichment score per nuclei within each individual cluster based off of the enriched, based off the expression of the genes within a gene set relative to the total expression of genes within that each individual nuclei. And so what I'm showing you here today is three examples of three different clusters from our three main categories, namely our GABAergic neurons, glutamatergic neurons, and neuron progenitor cells. And so when we extract the enrichment scores, you can further subset it based off of the different genotypes within that cluster and look at the differences in distribution of the enrichment score of the gene set. And so interestingly, when we do this, we see that you actually have higher enrichment scores for the synapse at translation gene set in our homozygotes relative to our wild types. And so too, when you perform a Wilcox and Ransom test, you see that there is a statistically significant difference between the samples. And not only do we see this in just the three examples I've listed here today, but we actually see that we have this observed trend in all of the different clusters in our E15.54 brain. So too, when I perform the same kind of analysis, using the gene set for cytoplasmic translation, we're still seeing this same trend where you have a higher enrichment scores for these gene sets in our homozygotes in all clusters relative to the wild type. And so while this is still very much an exploratory analysis, it does give us some initial evidence that it's possible that when you have a loss of ARID1B, it leads to dysregulation of functionally related gene sets. And so I showed you here today that we in our lab are able to successfully integrate uh, multiple singles uh, nucleus modalities, and with that, identify expected cell populations that would, you would see at E9.5 and E15.5. And some preliminary observations that we currently have is that there might be some difference in gene set enrichment of functionally related gene sets when you have loss of ARID1B. And so to further go into this, some of the next steps our lab is planning on doing is to assay additional mutant embryos so we can gain statistical power for these kinds of analyses and also look at additional gene sets between our wild types and embryos. And since we have the single cell ataxic data, to look at the differences in chromatin accessibility within each cluster to see if there's maybe perturbations to the chromatin landscape that is causing this regulation. Uh, so with that, I just want to say thank you to my lab. Um, and my funding sources, and I'm happy to take any questions. Wonderful talk and a great work. So given the importance of the BFF, uh, are these animals are viable, and uh, if they are, what is the, like, uh, do you see any phenotype? Yeah. So the, if you have, uh, yeah. So if you have uh, haploinsufficient mice, they, uh, some of them do grow to later stages, like the adult mouse shows. If you have a complete uh, knockout, they are embryonic lethal. So it's a very, BAF in itself is very important to development when you have a haploinsufficient form of the Baird 1B, it can, you can grow and proliferate, but you usually end up having an earlier lifespan and then it causes these neurodevelopmental disorders. Any other questions? Well, okay, then thank you very much, uh, Yonina. And we are ready for the next speaker. Our next speaker is Christian Park. She will be, he will be talking about arterial cell reprogramming induced by disturbed flow and hypercholesterolemia during arthrogenesis. All right, hello everyone. Um, today I'll present.
Hello, uh, out today, um, I'll present our single cell RNA sequencing study on flow and cholesterol induced reprogramming of endothelial cells in mouse. I'll just present. So I'll present our single cell RNA sequencing study on flow and cholesterol induced reprogramming of endothelial cells in mouse atherosclerosis model and its validation. A brief background, atherosclerosis is the major underlying cause of heart attack, uh, stroke, and peripheral artery disease, which are the leading causes of death worldwide. Uh, its risk factors include hypercholesterolemia, hypertension, and um, diabetes, just to name a few. And uh, despite the success of uh, blood cholesterol lowering drugs, um, atherosclerosis remains a leading cause of death, which suggests the importance of developing novel uh, therapies that target non-lipid aspects. Also, um, interestingly, atherosclerosis preferentially occurs in flow disturbed um, regions that are um, exposed to disturbed flow by mechanisms that are still incompletely understood. And therefore, our overarching goal is to identify novel flow sensitive genes comprehensively uh, so that they could be targeted for atherosclerosis therapy. And before I jump into the specific experiments and results, here's a brief introduction of what we know about the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. And it begins when risk factors such as disturbed flow and um, LDL high LDL cholesterol induced endothelial dysfunction, where healthy atheroprotective endothelial cells become dysfunctional and attain proatherogenic phenotype. Uh, including inflammation. And these inflamed endothelial cells that you see here um, recruit circulating immune cells such as monocytes. And these monocytes differentiate into macrophages um, in the subendothelial space um, that begin to engulf LDL cholesterol um, that have oxidized. And some of these macrophages um, transform into what we call foam cells that form the atherosclerotic plaque. Furthermore, um, some contractile um, smooth muscle cells that are healthy migrate to the intimal space as they differentiate into the diseased or synthetic smooth muscle cell phenotype. And these cells can also transdifferentiate into foam cells, further contributing to the plaque buildup. As mentioned previously, um, atherosclerosis uh, preferentially develop in curved or branched arterial regions, such as the carotid artery branch that are exposed to disturbed flow, as you can see um, here. Um, however, it was unknown if uh, disturbed flow can cause atherosclerosis. And to this end, our lab developed the mouse partial carotid ligation model. For this model, we ligate three out of four downstream small branches of the left side, the left common carotid artery, exposing it to disturbed flow. And as you can see on the right, um, the left side develops robust plaque within two to three weeks under hypercholesterolemic condition. And this demonstrates that disturbed flow indeed causes atherosclerosis in the presence of hypercholesterolemia. And this actually resembles what happens in human patients. The right side um, acts as a contralateral control with stable flow. And we and others have been using this model uh, to study the mechanisms by which disturbed flow and hypercholesterolemia together cause atherosclerosis. And this is where we're applying single cell RNA sequencing. And here's our previous our results. Uh, Here's our previous cell reports paper, and partial carotid ligation surgery was performed on the uh, left side, the left carotid artery of C57 wild type mice without hypercholesterolemia to see the effects of disturbed flow alone. And two days, two weeks post PCL, the partial carotid ligation surgery, the carotid arteries were luminally digested to collect the intimal cells enriched with endothelial cells, and single cell RNA sequencing and ATAC sequencing were carried out. And here are the results. On the left, we have the UMAP split by, sorry, you split by time and flow conditions. And flow-specific endothelial cells were identified from this analysis. More importantly, we performed trajectory analysis shown on the right, which further demonstrated that disturbed flow alone was enough to induce a complete reprogramming of these healthy um, atherotective endothelial cells into smooth muscle cells and fibroblasts via endothelial to mesenchymal transition, or endo-MT. And this is well known to occur. 
We also, for the first time, showed that it induces them to begin transitioning towards these immune cells, which we coined the term endothelial to immune cell transition, or endo-IT. It should be noted, though, that endothelial cells have only partially um, reached the immune cells with this drip flow alone, and hence the label uh, partial endo-IT. So these results demonstrated that the stir flow alone is able to induce inflammation, endo-MT, and partial endo-IT, which we collectively called uh, flow-induced reprogramming of endothelial cells, or FIRE. Now, while the stir flow alone could induce uh, significant genome-wide changes in the endothelial cell um, genes and their uh, phenotype via FIRE, it's not sufficient to cause atherosclerosis by itself as we require additional risk factors such as hypercholesterolemia. So we hypothesized that endothelial cells will undergo complete fire under the combination of disturb flow and hypercarcelemia that actually corresponds to plaque development. And to test this hypothesis, um, we recently conducted additional single cell RNA sequencing studies using the partial carotid ligation model to compare the transcriptomite effects of disturb flow alone, hypercarcelemia alone, and the combination. Hypercholesterolemia was induced by a combination of PCSK9 injection and feeding them with high-fat diet, while the stir flow was induced in the left side, again with um, partial carotid ligation. Now, as expected, we see that mice develop robust plaques only in the left side of the, the stir flow and hypercholesterolemia group at two or four weeks post-surgery, but not in any of the other groups. Like the previous single cell study, carotid arteries were processed by luminal digestion to collect the intimal cells. However, we also added the leftover containing medial adventitial cells, um, and they were further collagenase digested to um, more comprehensively understand the changes that all the arterial cell types are going through during atherogenesis. And here's the result. So on the left, we have UMAP composed of nearly a total of um, 100,000 cells from about 100 mice, and we have 25 unique clusters, namely five endothelial cell clusters at the top, uh, smooth muscle cell clusters in the middle, fibroblasts at the bottom, and all the immune cells, including um, five macrophage clusters. And they were all manually annotated using the canonical cell markers that are displayed on the right. For a better comprehensive analysis of our single cell data, what we have here is the result of integrating our previous um, cell reports single cell data with our new data sets. And due to time constraints, I'll focus my talk on the analysis of the endothelial cell clusters, but I'll be more than happy to talk about the other um, cell types if needed. And here we have identified five endothelial cell clusters, and based on the predictive functions of gene expression profile um, of each cluster, we have um, labeled them accordingly. On the right, we have separated the UMAP into 10 treatment groups that we have. And in all the control groups, as you can see, atheroprotective EC1 um, cells dominate, and these are the cell types in uh, pink. With hypercholesterolemia alone, uh, we see a transient appearance of these green um, endo-MT EC2 cells with contractile smooth muscle cell markers at two weeks um, in panel four. With this stir flow alone, um, we see an acute increase in pro-inflammatory angiogenic EC3 cells at two-day two time point in panel six, as well as an increase in uh, endo-MT EC4 cells with synthetic smooth muscle cell uh, markers at two and four week time points, so panels seven and eight. With the stir flow and hypercholesterolemia at four weeks, um, shown in panel 10, there is an explosion of these yellow um, EC5 cells undergoing endo-IT towards immune cells, and furthermore, most interestingly, we have noted that these cells also highly express foam cell markers, suggesting the presence of endothelial cell-derived foam cells via endothelial to foam cell transition, or what we're calling endo-FT, and we're recording this for the very first time. Now we're back to the UMAP of all the cells on the left and um, split by the experimental conditions on the right. So what we have noted is that we see endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, and macrophages actually share common borders. Um, and this so-called convergence um, occurs at the intersection of uh, these respective foam cell clusters, which are EC5, SMC3, and macrophages um, 3 and 4. This is also most evident under um, the stir flow and hypercarcelemia at four-week time point, and it indicates that their transcriptomic profiles are highly similar at chronic stages of atherosclerosis development. Now, we wanted to look at this convergence, um, evident from UMAP further in more detail by performing trajectory analysis. And what we have here is diffusion map. 
And as you can see from the projections in the 2D um, diffusion map space on the left, endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, and macrophages all transition from three distinct nodes towards the foam cell phenotype in the middle. And on the right, we have the projections of the three cell types onto diffusion component one, which is the x-axis, and diffusion component two, the y-axis. And these, uh, the high degree of overlap um, of these four forms, four form cell clusters in both axes further highlights the convergence of these three cell types, which is in accordance with what we have observed in our UMAP. And to more clearly observe this convergence, um, here is the 3D diffusion map embedding of all three cell type clusters on the left. And while that of only the four form cell clusters that are seemingly converging are shown on the right. And from our single cell um, study, approximately 30% of um, foam cells are non-leukocyte derived. And of those, about one third or 11% of entire foam cell population is derived from endothelial cells. Next, we now wanted to validate the conclusion of our single cell RNA-seq study by an independent genetic lineage tracing approach. And for this, we perform, we use the EC specific confetti mice that genetically marks endothelial cells with fluorescent signals. So what happens upon um, tamoxifen treatment is that these confetti mice express nuclear GFP, cytosolic YFP, or cytosolic um, RFP only in the endothelial cells. And this is an image of a um, uh, section that we have from um, the EC confetti mice. To recapitulate fire identified in our single cell RNA-seq study, um, these mice were exposed to disturbed flow and hypercarcinolemia and sacrificed our four week time point, which is the time point that we actually saw the convergence. And um, the timeline is shown on the top. Here is a representative image of the gross um, carotid arteries that were used for the study. And as expected, the left side, the left carotid artery robustly developed plaque and it's marked with a uh, white arrow in response to the surflow and hypercholesterolemia. And for the lineage tracing uh, validation study, we hypothesized that endothelial cells will co-express um, confetti and fire markers under the surflow and hypercholesterolemia, similar, similar to what we have seen with um, a single cell RNA-seq. And below are the list of um, fire markers that were selected for each of the um, trend, uh, reprogramming processes. So for fluorescence imaging, both the left carotid artery and right carotid arteries were longitudinally sectioned to reveal a large number of endothelial cells in the lumen compared to medial adventitial cells. So we have the 10x image here on the left where we have um, the right carotid artery with clean lumen, as you can see on the left without any plaque, and two sections of the left carotid artery on the right um, with varying levels of plaque. We also have magnified images of the left side in um, 40X um, on, on here. And in terms of color, DAPI blue um, shows individual cell nuclei. Green you see here represents autofluorescence of internal LESC lamina, as well as confetti signals, which are nuclear GFP and uh, cytosolic YFP. Red also shows uh, cytosolic RFP, and white here shows um, the fire markers, and in this case, we see endothelial inflammation markers, um, VCHEM1 and ICHEM1. And uh, looking at this image, we have the lumen as represented here. And here are the endothelial cells that are sitting right on top of the internal elastic lamina. And we see that with their white arrows, um, confetti positive endothelial cells are co-expressing uh, white VCHEM1 or ICHEM1 um, in each of these images. And these demonstrate that um, confetti positive endothelial cells are undergoing inflammation. Moving on, we have um, confetti positive um, endothelial cells that are co-expressing markers of endo-MT that we have selected, which are SNE1, ACTA2, and CNN1 that are shown in white. And all of these images demonstrate that um, confetti positive endothelial cells are indeed undergoing endo-MT. We also checked whether um, endothelial cells, confetti positive endothelial cells co-express markers of immune cells, which are CD68, C1QA, C1QB, and LYZ2. And we do um, see that um, uh, endothelial cells that are co-expressing confetti positive are also undergoing endo-IT. And finally, um, here are the uh, foam cell markers. 
and we do see that um, competi positive endothelial cells are co-expressing um, markers of foam cells, so SPP1, LGALS3, and TREM2 um, throughout um, these images. And BODIP on the right is a fluorescent dye that um, stains lipid droplets accumulating inside the cells. And these are shown in green dots um, inside the cells. And white arrows mark um, confetti positive endothelial cells expressing BODIP indicating lipid droplet accumulation. And these results demonstrate that confetti positive cells, endothelial cells are also undergoing endo FT. So in summary, we conducted a comprehensive single cell RNA-seq study using our mouse partial cardiac ligation model to determine and compare the roles of disturbed flow and or hypercarcinolemia. And our data shows that arterial cells, uh, especially endothelial cells, are very plastic and heterogeneous. And regarding endothelial cells, they undergo reprogramming from healthy to pro-inflammatory endo-MT, endo-IT, and the novel endo-FT um, during atherogenesis. And our data showed that mouse carotid arteries um, contain 25 unique uh, clusters during atherogenesis. And regarding foam cells, about 11% of them are derived from endothelial cells. And they show remarkably similar transcriptomic profiles with those derived from small muscle cells and macrophages um, during atherogenesis. And in conclusion, our single cell RNA sequencing study identified while our lineage tracing study validated that endothelial cells undergo high cholesterol and disturbed flow induced reprogramming of endothelial cells. So we're calling this C fire now during atherogenesis. Our single cell RNA-seq also provides comprehensive single cell atlas of arterial cells during atherogenesis in mice and schematic on the right uh, dis, uh, captures uh, those reprogramming processes. And we also, um, saw potential mechanisms of endothelial reprogramming in response to disturbed flow and hypercholesterolemia. And finally, we were able to identify genes um, regulating CFIRE that are potential novel candidate targets for atherosclerosis treatment. And with that, I would like to thank our lab members and open the floor for questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you for a very nice talk, Christian. Um, the floor is open for questions. Yes. Hi, awesome talk. Uh, just the, you know, when you're working in the interface between clusters, um, you know, in the UMAP or um, in the trajectory analysis, when you're adding different cell types in the same pseudo time analysis, you're bound to get a lot of fire from the reviewers because these are the cells that are enriched, you know, in technical artifacts, in doublets, um, and they could, or they're stressed, and that's what they share usually as phenotypes. And and and, and in how pseudo time analysis are supposed to be done, you have to do um, like a pre-selection of what to include there. And I wanted to ask, what, how has been, what has been your strategy, obviously very successful, to avoid all this fire you know, from the reviewers and point them that this indeed is a finding and it's not you know, of technical origin. Uh, congratulations for, for um, you know, getting this, word, oh, this, this work out. So um, in terms of which, uh, in terms of filtering or cleaning up our data, what we have done is, um, so we have noticed that endothelial cells, smooth muscle cells, and macrophages all share the common um, foam cell phenotype, both in terms of what we have seen in the UMAP, but also with respect to each of their own subtypes and their um, differential gene expression patterns. So we started out by um, subsetting those cells first, and then seeing um, indeed if they are seemingly um, undergoing transition from their um, respective origin, points of origin. And we have performed many different um, integration processes as well as um, different forms of trajectory analysis. Diffusion map being one of the most successful, but we do have performed um, many different trajectory analyses and tools, and then we have seen that um, from those analyses, 
um, along with diffusion map, we have seen um, that they were pretty consistent with each other. So I guess it was mostly our focus on the similar uh, similar cell clusters with similar um, foam cells, uh, foam cell phenotypes. Yep. Just one more question. Uh, wonderful work and uh, great presentation. So given the SMC3, you are representing them as a foam cells. It's known that uh, accumulation of lipids happen in skeletal muscle too, Ske skeletal muscles also. But uh, so did you like a uh, check their other characteristics like uh, stickiness or how, how you can like a uh, just uh, label them as foam cells like uh, is it just because they accumulated lipids or do they have any separate characteristics just like a foam cells so we haven't checked at uh, um, functional aspects of uh, smooth muscle cells themselves per se but we have from literature the markers that were used to identify and annotate these cells as um, SMC derived foam cells. But that was also an important point for our um, endothelial cells as well, because um, just because you're expressing markers of foam cells, people will ask, is it because of just lipid accumulating or is it because they actually become foam cell? So one approach that we've taken is um, uh, staining for BODP, which is very widely used, uh, lipid accumulation markers to see if they are having at least some sort of um, um, morphological characteristics reminiscent of foam cells. Yep. Thank you. One last question. Yeah, I, my question is <coughs> very similar to Kamlesh's question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have the last speaker of the session. It's my pleasure to announce uh, Marina Michard from the Basin Lab. She will be talking about integrated single nuclei and spatial transcriptomic approach reveals acute endothelial injury during vein grafting procedures validated by RNA scope. We have one more speaker after that, sorry, my bad. All right, thank you. My name is Marina Mashad, and I'm a PhD student in the Basin Lab here at Emory University. And today I'm gonna to be sharing with you our work on integrating single nuclei in spatial transcriptomics in order to investigate vein grafting procedures and the validation of this approach using RNA scope. So I'd like to begin with a brief overview of my presentation where I will give an introduction into coronary artery bypass graft procedures as well as an overview of our study design. Then I'll delve into the integration approach that we use to integrate our single nuclei and spatial transcriptomic data sets in order to provide a high resolution investigation of these vascular architectures following the grafting procedures. And lastly, I'll move into the validation studies that we performed using RNA scope and IHC to validate the findings that we um, elucidated through our integrated analyses. So as many of you know, already heart disease remains the leading cause of mortality in the United States, accounting for approximately one in every five deaths, which is the equivalent of one death every 33 seconds. The most common forms of cardiovascular disease are coronary artery and peripheral artery diseases, which are characterized by the buildup of plaque within the artery that occludes critical blood flow to the heart. The standard of care for occluded arteries is an, called an ar coronary artery bypass graft procedure or cabbage procedure, where a segment of healthy vein is removed from the patient and used as a graft to bypass the occluded artery. 
these cabbage procedures have become the most commonly performed cardiac procedures across the globe. But despite this widespread use of these procedures, they still remain severely limited in their success rates. In fact, nearly half of grafts will fail within a decade post-implantation. And the putative causes for this graft failure include a variety of factors, including intrinsic factors, such as the quality of the vein that's used for the grafting, as well as technical factors, including how the vein is harvested and then grafted into the artery. And then lastly, extrinsic or biological factors, which include maladaptive remodeling of the vascular wall, and then dysregulated growth of the inner lining of the blood vessel known as intimal hyperplasia, and then acute thrombosis or blood clotting. So in light of these factors, we wanted to test whether these uh, vein graft harvesting techniques may contribute to the upregulation of these maladaptive pathways that lead to the early onset of graft failure. And during harvesting specifically, what's performed is um, a technique called distension where a saline solution is used to expand the vascular wall of the vein, and this expansion causes a significant amount of endothelial stress on the vascular wall, which we hypothesize leads to the upregulation of these maladaptive pathways in the onset of graft failure. So collaborating with a team of surgeon scientists, we isolated samples of veins that were taken out after bypass, or sorry, after distension, and then also samples that were taken out after bypass at the 24-hour time point, and we performed analysis on these alongside untouched control veins. We specifically performed single nuclei transcriptomic analysis, which uniquely enables us to investigate frozen and difficult to dissociate tissues, such as vascular tissues. And in parallel, we perform spatial transcriptomic analysis in order to ultimately integrate these together and get this high resolution image of the, vas of the vascular landscape following the procedures. And finally, we validated these approaches using RNA scope and IHC, highlighting the uh, use of an integrated transcriptomic approach in order to um, investigate the molecular pathophysiology of various diseases. So moving into some of our results, I'll start off with the h &E images that were derived in the first steps of the spatial analysis. So here we have h &E images of the control, distended, and grafted veins. And you can see within the distended veins, the lumen becomes very elongated, and then the cells start to take on this activated morphology. And then following graftment, we see the lumen becomes restored, but there's an increased infiltration of cells within the vascular wall. So following sequencing, we then obtain the spatial plot that's shown here on the right. And notably within the vascular wall, there are three layers of the vein. The first one being the intima, the innermost layer, followed by the media and adventitia. So we developed a method for annotating the spatial voxels of the vein in order to perform differential analysis between these layers of the vascular wall. And we made this approach publicly available so that way others in the cardiovascular field studying spatial um, transcriptomics can also apply a similar approach to studying the different layers of the vein wall. So with our differential um, analysis, we observed that within distended veins relative to control veins, there's a significant upregulation of genes associated with cellular activation, including fibronectin, CFOS, fomentin, for example, and inputting all of these differentially expressed genes into pathway enrichment, we observed that within the intima and media of the vein, we see um, ECM organization associated pathways as well as cellular motility pathways. And then within the media, we also see an upregulation of pathways associated with platelet activation and degranulation. And lastly, within the um, adventitia, we see an upregulation of pathways associated with inflammation, including interleukin signaling and TGF-beta signaling. 
Next, to corroborate these findings, we performed an unbiased spatial transcriptomic analysis by clustering based on this, the transcriptomic profiles of the spatial voxels, which resulted in clusters that were non-uniformly distribu distributed between control and distended veins, where notably within the distended veins, we see this increase in adventitial and medial clusters, A1 and M1, which were associated with UCM remodeling, inflammation and fibroblast activation, and SMC activation and migration, respectively. So collectively, these results um, show that distension alters the transcriptomic uh, landscape of the vein, coordinating a distinct response among each layer of the vein wall. Specifically within the intima, we see these markers of endothelial cell activation and cell migration, while in the media, we see these markers of SMC activation and migration in addition to the platelet activation. And within the adventitia, we observe ECM remodeling and inflammatory pathways. Importantly, these pathways become dysregulated in graft failure, suggesting that distension initiates this response. So with our spatial transcriptomic analysis complete, we then turn to our single nuclei analysis, which revealed that there's different subpopulations of fibroblasts and endothelial cells within the, dis vein, within the vein following distension. Um, specifically within the distended vein, we see a decrease in the overall proportion of endothelial cells and a concomitant increase in the proportion of fibroblasts. This loss of endothelial cells is congruent with endothelial injury, where the damage to the endothelium results in endothelial cell apoptosis. And then this increase in fibroblasts is suggestive of fibroblast activation in response to that endothelial injury. So we next sought to then profile them using differential gene expression and pathway enrichment analyses. And what we found was the predominant fibroblast and endothelial populations within control veins are related to homeostasis and illustrated by the upregulation of factors that are pro-homeostatic. And then in contrast, within the distended veins, we see the upregulation of subpopulations or enrichment of subpopulations, upregulating genes associated with injury response, endothelial cell and fibroblast activation, as well as ECM remodeling. Notably, we see a differentiation of endothelial cells to a mesenchymal phenotype and fibroblast to a myofibroblast phenotype. And this is only at a 30-minute time point following distension. So this is very interesting to already see cells beginning to transition at this early stage. And we know that these cell types play a very important role in the pathogenesis of graft failure. So with these cell types identified, we then turn to the integration of our two data sets using a complementary or two complementary approaches. So the first approach that we employed is a module-based scoring approach, where we assigned a module score um, to each voxel within the intima, media, and adventitia of the vein, and then took the difference between the distended veins and the control veins to generate the differential matrix shown here. And then in our complementary approach, we employed cell two location in order to predict the predominant cell type within each spatial voxel. And the results of our analysis together show that within the intima of the control vein, there's this enrichment of the blue population, as well as over here on the right on our differential enrichment score matrix, you see this increase in endothelial populations within the intima of control veins. And these endothelial populations are associated with homeostasis and injury response. And then in contrast, within the distended veins, we see an increase in activated endothelial cells as well as endothelial to mesenchymal transitioning cells. And you can see that those are not only present in the intima, but also have started to migrate to the media within the distended veins. And most notably within the um, intima and media of distended veins, we see an increase in fibroblast populations overall. And we know that the migration of fibroblasts to the intima is um, often observed in response to endothelial injury. But more importantly, it also contributes to the development of intimal hyperplasia, which is one of the main mechanisms underlying graft failure. So next, we moved on to the validation of our approach using RNA scope. 
So for RNA scope, we took representative marker genes, namely LMCD1 and um, fibrillin, which correspond to our endothelial B and fibroblast D populations that were differentially abundant between our control and distended veins. So what we observed was the LMCD1 enrichment in the intima of our control veins, which was predicted by our integrated approaches. And then within our distended veins, we predicted an enrichment of a fibroblast D population within the adventitia, which was again validated using RNA scope by the enrichment of this fibrillin in the adventitia of our distended vein relative to our control vein. Then lastly, we sought to extend our findings to the implantation of the graft um, by obtaining a grafted sample that was retrieved 24 hours post bypass and profiled it using single nuclei in spatial transcriptomics. And we observed an increase in myelin cell populations, uh, myofibroblast populations, and endothelial injury response populations, which are all congruent with a response to the increased cellular activation pro-inflammatory pathways and immune signaling following distension. Then, in order to examine the genomic response over time, we constructed a temporally resolved multilayer gene network that illustrates the trajectory of genes from distended veins to grafted veins, and we observed several upregulated genes at the time of distension, including fibrillin and versicin, which subsequently drove the upregulation of many genes implicated in graft failure, such as IL-6, SMAD4, TGF beta receptor 1. And we also notably identified GLIS3 and other novel genes of interest that were identified through our single, or first identified through our single nuclei studies um, as one of the potent regulators driving expression in the grafted vein. And GLIS3 specifically drives expression of WWTR1, a gene that encodes the protein TAS, a master regulator of the HIPPO signaling pathway, which underlies the endothelial to mesenchymal transition. <coughs> then to validate the expression of these genes at the protein level, we performed IHC analysis on controlled distended and grafted vein samples, staining for fibrillin, GLIS3, and versican. And mirroring the results of our transcriptomic analysis, we see that these, the levels of these proteins increase following distension and then following engraftment. And the validation of these genes by IHC highlights them as potential targets for gene-based therapies that we hope to explore in the future and also underscores the utility of this approach for studying um, the molecular underpinnings of diseases and identifying potential targets. So with that, that brings me to the conclusion of this talk. And in summary, we have leveraged integrated single nuclei and spatial transcriptomics to provide novel insights into the molecular and cellular effects of harvesting, distension, and graft implantation. And through our single nuclei transcriptomics approach, we identified distinct endothelial and fibroblast subpopulations mediating the acute response to endothelial injury. And then through our spatial transcriptomic approach, we illustrated the different distributions of enriched pathways and cellular subpopulation following graft harvesting and implantation. And together, these results indicate that there's an acute injury to the vascular endothelium initiated by distension that ultimately leads to cellular activation of endothelial cells, fibroblasts, and um, smooth muscle cells which ultimately leads to vascular remodeling and the upregulation of genes that are implicated in graft failure. And collectively, through this work, we highlight the utility of an integrated single nuclei and spatial transcriptomic approach, identifying key genes that can be therapeutically targeted. And I'd like to thank all the team of surgeon scientists and researchers that have been a part of this project, and I'd be happy to take any questions that you have at this time. Marina for a very nice presentation. Any questions? Well, congratulations for really uh, exciting work. <clears throat> I was curious how you determined the cell shape transition or cell shape, uh, cell population change. 
uh, because I think especially in this type of ex vivo conditions, uh, you don't have an infiltration of circulating cells coming in, right? It's, it's just a change, change in internal, whatever you had, you are just changing either cell transition or transformation or proliferation. So how did you determine how a certain number of cells in endothelial cells versus fibroblast, uh, smooth muscle cells, and uh, the leukocytes change and shifted? That's a great question. Um, so I would say for the differences in our endothelial cell populations, we hypothesize that that's due to apoptosis of the endothelial cells following distension. So we have our control veins that, um, I think I could possibly scroll back, but um, our control veins, maybe not. <laughs> um, our control veins that have a very thick um, intima and intact intima, and then you can even see by H&E staining that that intima is no longer being, the endothelial cells of the intima are no longer being stained, and so we predict that that's just simply apoptosis of the endothelial populations, and then that's why we're seeing complete loss of those. Unlike a lot of other spatial analyses, we don't, we are able to capture the entire lumen of the vein, and so we do think that the loss of the endothelial cells um, is, congruent or the comparison is congruent between the control and the distended and grafted vein samples. And then with the infiltration of leukocytes, um, we, they would be derived from resident cells because this is such an early time point. I think the later time points such as the 24 hour grafting where we actually saw a significant increase in the myeloid population, that is due to the um, circulation and recruitment of the leukocytes due to the endothelial injury. Um, but at the 30 minute time point, the, there's a subtle change in the myeloid population, which we do think is just recruitment of uh, myeloid cells towards the uh, lumen. Thank you, great talk, Marina. Um, the, you mentioned that the integration of the spatial transcriptomics and the single nucleus was based on cell to location, at least one of the two approaches. Did you, um, in, in playing or in using the, that tool, did you get a sense of what's the error rate of that of the approach in your data set? I mean, the authors publish it and then show that it's good for whatever data sets, but every user has to then uh, test for themselves if it's doing anything meaningful at all. Absolutely, yes, and using the cell to location, um, you develop the Bayesian model based on your single nuclei, and definitely how you train that model and the hyperparameters that are selected for your model can greatly influence the predicted cell types. And uh, I did train several different models and then looked at them from a biological point standpoint to see which ones um, made the most sense, and s such as you know, are there endothelial cells in the endothelium in this model? Um, and tried to increase the accuracy that much, the most that way. I think it would be possible that there, I would think that there are probably better tools that will be come available at the time that we conducted this study. Cell two location was benchmarked as the best tool for integrating these approaches. And that's also why we employed two different integration approaches to see if they would validate one another. Um, but yeah, there's definitely some challenges and a lot of bias that can arise from the integration approaches. Thank you, Marina. And in the interest of time, we will move on to the next talk. Our next speaker is Brittany Baumert, and she's, she will be talking about PFHPA alters lipid metabolism and increases the risk of MESLD in youth, a translational research framework.
Hi, everyone. My name is Brittany Baumert, um, and I am a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Southern California Keck School of Medicine. Um, by training, I'm an environmental epidemiologist, so this is a bit out of my comfort zone, but I'm learning so much. Um, and I, I really appreciated Dr. Ma's closing notes um, in the keynote talk today about the importance of interdisciplinary work. Um, and, I, and my talk really highlights the power of, of such work when you get out of your little bubble and talk to your friends in a lab down, down the street. <laughs> Um, so let's start, I know this is not an environmental conference, so let's start with a little um, background on, um, on per and polyalkyl uh, substances, also known as uh, PFAS. So PFAS are a large class of synthetic fluorinated organic chemicals that have been used in industrial applications in consumer products, including water repellent textiles, non-stick coatings, and food packaging products for more than 60 years. Um, due to the strong carbon fluorine bonds, PFAS resists metabolic and environmental degradation. Um, that's why they've been named forever chemicals. And recent human biomonitoring studies have shown widespread exposure as they can be detected in the blood of almost everyone in the United States per N. Haynes study. And you've probably seen them in the news. Um, in January 2023, so last year, the EPA proposed dramatically reducing the maximum contaminant levels for PFAS. Um, and as of yesterday, um, I saw that the EPA finalized these new limits on PFAS in drinking water, um, which is a, a big success. Um, so as of now, drinking water remains the main source of exposure. And as you see in this graph reported by the Environmental Working Group, as of July, 2022, nearly 3,000 locations in all states in the United States are known to have PFAS contamination, including military bases and community water systems. After exposure, PFAS can accumulate and persist in the human body for many years and have been, like I said, detected in the blood of um, almost everyone in the United States, greater than 99% of people in the US. PFAS affect almost every organ in the human body and can impair immune function, disrupt the endocrine system, increase the risk of metabolic diseases, cancer, and also decrease fetal growth. One critical public health and clinical issue and an emerging concern is the escalating prevalence of a metabolic dysfunction associated cytotic liver disease known as MASLD um, and its relationship with PFOS. And some of you may know this as NAFLD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, recently renamed to MASLD. So MASLD is a liver disease characterized by excess fat accumulation in the liver, and it's a fast-growing epidemic. MASLD refers to a wide spectrum of diseases from mere steatosis without inflammation or um, MASL to metabolic dysfunction associated hepatitis, or known as MASH. Um, uh, and currently it's estimated to affect approximately 30 million people in the U.S., and one in every 10 US children. The traditional risk factors for Massel D, such as excess energy intake, sedentary lifestyle, and genetics don't fully explain um, the Massel D epidemic in children. However, emerging evidence indicates that exposure to endocrine disrupting chemicals have the ability to promote metabolic changes in, um, that result to fatty liver disease, a hypothesis that's referred to as the toxicant fatty liver fatty liver disease. So there's a number of existing studies in both humans and animals that show PFAS partition preferably to the liver. And animal studies have shown hepatotoxic effects even at very low levels of exposure. So in the next few slides, I'll present preliminary results from uh, this translational approach that we've been working on. Um, and I'll show you how PFAS alter lipid metabolism and increase the risk of fatty liver disease in youth. For this study, we focused on one PFAS replacement congener, um, PFHPA, or perfluorohepatonic acid, um, which is a short chain carboxylic PFAS that's um, known to have a high accumulation in the liver relative to the plasma. Here's my study overview. So um, we had three main aims of our, of our project. 
The first was to examine the effects of uh, PFOS concentrations on muscle D and severity of hepatic steatosis in a, a bariatric surgery cohort of obese adolescents. Then we transitioned um, to AIM-2, which we were interested in investigating potential mechanisms of PFHPA-associated metabolic liver disease development and progression by integrating transcriptomics from a liver organoid experiment of PFHPA and muscle D with metabolomics and proteomics measured in our human um, cohort. And then AIM-3, so you can think of AIM-2 as a sort of uh, data dimensionality reduction step for AIM-3 in which um, I integrated multiomic signatures of um, proteomics and metabolomics to identify high-risk profiles of um, adolescents um, at higher risk for mass D based on their exposure to PFHPA um, metabolites and um, proteins. So let's start with AIM-1. So um, in this study, it's based on, like I said, the teen lab study, which is a prospective multi-center observational study of adolescents less than or equal to 19 years of age. Um, and these adolescents underwent bariatric surgery from 2007 through 2012 and enrolled in participating clinical centers throughout the United States. That's something that's quite unique about this study is that it features gold standard diagnosis of muscle D based on um, liver biopsy samples collected at the time of bariatric surgery. I felt quite fortunate to have those samples. Among participants, we observed a positive association of PFHPA plasma concentrations with muscle and MASH, so disease severity. Um, specifically, the odds of developing MASH was approximately double with each increase in PFHPA concentrations by one unit. And the odds of MASL was 1.68. We observed a significant dose response relationship between PFHPA concentrations and MASL D risk, with a slight increased risk of higher levels of PFHPA, indicating um, a potential graded exposure effect. We are next interested in looking at disease progression. So among those with MASLD, PFHPA was significantly associated with multiple um, features of MASLD, um, including hepatocellular ballooning, grade of cytosis, fibrosis, and the mass activity score. And what's most interesting here is that the strength of association increasing, increased with disease severity. And that was consistent for all features. So then um, to elucidate the functional implications of metabolite and protein alterations um, resulting from PFHP exposure, we conducted uh, Ingenuity Pathway Analysis, or the IPA, for the metabolome-wide association study, MWAS, and for the proteome-wide association study, PWAS. Um, in both analyses, we pinpointed pathways associated with inflammation and lipid dysregulation as a consequence of PFHP exposure. So next um, was AIM-2, and this was led by my collaborators. Um, the PIs, Lucy, Gold, and Mason, and then Anna uh, Marietti. Um, and uh, we were interested in invest investigating the potential mechanisms further of PHPA-associated metabolic liver disease and disease progression using um, the liver organoids. So or, the liver steroids are three-dimensional cellular aggregates composed primarily of liver cells or hepatocytes, along with other cell types such as endothelial cells, cellulite cells, and Kepler cells. And these steroids are typically cultured in vitro under conditions that mimic the microenvironment of the liver. Um, overall, the use of liver steroids offers significant advantages, advantages in terms of replicating liver physiology, improving hepatocyte functionality and providing a more clinical relevant model for studying liver biology and related applications. So here I'm showing the new approach that we used for using, um, for, uh, that we used for PFOS risk assessment. Once we identified the PFOS associated with liver disease, we tested non-cytotoxic concentrations of PFOS on liver steroids and evaluated PFOS impact using state-of-the-art omics techniques to identify the um, metabolic pathways disturbed by PFOS exposure. We're able to establish a framework that can be applied to other hepatotoxic environmental pollutants. We use 
multi-donor 3D insight human liver micro tissues to identify um, or to study PFOS impacts on liver metabolism. This model of the liver spheroid is composed of hepatocytes, NPCs, and it's typically used for toxicological studies. So we expose the liver spheroids um, to PFHPA for seven days at a non-cytotoxic dose and cultural media was changed every two to three days to ensure const, um, constant PFHPA presence in these uh, cultural media. Spheroids were then evaluated for lipid accumulation um, and single cell transcriptomics. So the image on the left shows the um, confocal imaging of spheroid stains with Nile red, suggests an increase in lipid accumulation, the red, and cells from liver steroids exposed to PFHPA. And then the second image that I'm showing on the right is the digital quantification of the confocal imaging um, and shows a significant increase in lipid accumulation due to PFHPA. Here I'm showing the integrated UMAP of control and PFHPA exposed spheroids and the differentially expressed um, genes detected in whole liver spheroids and individual cell clusters. And we observe the presence of hepatocytes, copper cells, T cells, NK cells, endothelial cells, and B cells. So the conical um, pathways upregulated by PFHPA and whole liver spheroids revealed around 48% of the pathways upregulated by PFHPA were related to lipid metabolism, and 20% were related to amino acid metabolism. And then the um, canonical pathways related to PFHP exposure in the hepatocytes showed almost 45% of the pathways upregulated in the hepatocytes were related to lipid metabolism, and 18% were related to amino acids. Um, here are the lipid metabolism pathways in hepatocytes. So PFHPA stimulated an increase in lipid anabolism in comparison to catabolism. And PFHPA triggered multiple lipid oxidation and cholesterol biosynthesis pathways, um, suggesting that PFHPA is a potential um, cytogenic chemical. So next was our integration aim um, across um, from the spheroid to the human study. So differentially expressed gene data set from the spheroids stimulated with PFHPA were integrated with the MWAS and PFWAS data sets from our human study using OMICS net platform. And we selected the most significant pathways and identified 19 metabolites um, in the gene metabolite overlap pathways and six proteins from the gene protein um, overlapped pathway. Pathways commonly found in the in vitro component, um, the transcriptomics, and the MWAS and the in vivo data sets. Um, are shown here, and um, the shown pathways are composed of genes, both genes and metabolites. Um, the majority of the pathways are related to, again, the lipid metabolism and amino acids, and then I'm also showing the uh, pathways related to the genes and proteins um, here. Um, and the most significant pathways are related to lipid metabolism, again, specifically fatty acid degradation. And in this figure, you can see the overlapping pathways of the multi-omics associated with PFHPA exposures. And we see, again, alterations in lipid metabolism, amino acid metabolism, and activation of oxidative stress, and um, as well as some of the pathways related to cancer. And then in the final step of our analysis, we use something called latent unknown clustering integrating multi-omics data, or LUCID. And um, this is one of my mentors, um, David Conti, at USC, and he is responsible for the LUCID package in, in R. Um, and as the name suggests, it's a latent clustering um, package that identifies high-risk profiles for MASL-D based on proteins and metabolites and PFHPA exposure. And so in this figure, you can see the overlapping pathways of the multi-omics associated with PFHPA exposure. And again, we see the lipid metabolism, amino acid metabolism, and activation of oxidative stress are some of the um, important pathways that are driving this. And for this analysis, we did, really did see that the proteins um, were what mattered most in identifying these high-risk clusters. 
Um, so this is the first study showing that high PFHPA exposure during childhood was associated with muscle D. PFHPA primarily affected lipid metabolism, hepatocytes in the liver, spheroids, um, supporting the omics risk profiles generated by the metabolomics and proteomics uh, data set integration. And with that last slide, I would like to thank my many collaborators at USC and other universities. Um, this was definitely a team science approach, and of course our funding sources. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Brittany, for a very interesting talk. We have a few questions. Thank you. Very interesting talk. Uh, quick question. So if I remember correctly, um, the Insphero livers, the spheroids usually don't have cellid cells. They, they only do that if you do the experiment, um, you know, in the Netherlands, the ones that they ship only have immune cells. Uh, do you think, uh, because you're discussing about the NFLD and potentially how would that affect the cell-cell communication and exposure and how much more benefit would be if you strong arm them and push them a little bit to work with um, the more advanced model? Thank you for that. Um, I am not a cell biologist. I will not pretend to be a cell biologist. I appreciate your comment. Um, and I, I think you're, I mean, uh, I agree. <laughs> and if, if you, I mean, I can also connect you with our uh, team at USC too, but I do agree with that. Yeah. So you don't have to run back and forth. I can. Hi, beautiful talk. Um, I have a question regarding if you have to make a decision tree for kind of multi-omics. So, uh, you know, we always put our favorite picture of, um, you know, mouse into human, metabolomics into proteomics, but kind of large population studies, where would you put your hat based on these findings? Oh, yeah, like what's driving? Like how much is actually overlapped? We show these like nice yeah, yeah, yeah. river plots, but really how much is overlapped and where would you move forward with it? I really appreciate that question. Um, I gave a lot of thought to this, actually. Um, and it was something that I, I leaned on our um, bench scientists a bit because this was kind of where this came from. So I started with this study just looking purely from an epi standpoint and then diving into our PWAS and MWAS and wanted to figure out how to connect all the pieces, right? And then we had this beautiful liver spheroid experiment that was happening and they were interested in the same question but just in a, um, from a different angle. And so I would say that, so for us we did the O-Link proteomics um, targeted packages, so it's both the cardio, metabolic, and inflammation. Um, and um, the proteins seem to matter, like I said, a lot. They're really driving, and, and, and I modeled it multiple ways, but using our latent clustering modeling, the, the proteins drove, the, it, it, actually the metabolites really didn't matter. Um, it was, and, and also I will say we did, and we used, um, uh, Emory actually did the metabolomics analysis, but it was an untargeted um, analysis for the metabolomics, and then we had 400 metabolites that had um, level one annotations. So uh, yeah, I would say the proteins. <laughs> Yeah. Great work, congratulations. And uh, I have a small question. So given, if I remember correctly, you mentioned you collected uh, liver tissues, yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, what is the reason you have to use uh, um, spheroids, especially given extracellular matrix is going to play a major role in um, some of these functions, and that part is like really coming out uh, recently. So, uh, why uh, you would have like a use directly the hepatocytes or something like that, right? Yeah. So it was after the fact, right? So we had PFOS. So this, we utilized the Teen Lab study, which started as a clinical trial, um, led by Tom Ings, who's at Lori now. Um, 
But so we had limited samples, right? So it, the original R01 looked at um, PFAS and uh, liver disease, um, and then we later on added in. Um, so we didn't have tissue, uh, liver specific omics. Um, we only had plasma, um, which was our interest in the liver spheroid. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, how how do you think they're biologically relevant in terms of like exposure that uh, an average American, for instance, might have? Um, yeah, that's also a great question. So we, um, our group, used population relevant doses. Um, so we made sure that it wasn't a sort of toxic level that would um, be uh, like never seen in the in human populations. So. Yeah, so I believe we exposed for seven days, um, and I can tell you the relevant doses. Um, I did have it in my notes. I want to say we did 20 micro yeah. I'm just yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's, I mean, I, I, the, for specifically for PFHPA, um, we did a relatively lower dose in uh, exposure to liver spheroids compared to what humans are exposed to just from drinking water or um, other exposures, not sick pans. Um, uh, yeah. 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 All right. Thank you very much, Brittany. And with that, we conclude this session. Uh, we are ready to break for lunch. Um, in the MNB atrium, and the next session, number three, will start at 1.30 p.m.
asked me to pick up <coughs> your introduction from the left hand side. Oh, that's fine. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Hopefully, everyone enjoyed the lunch. And uh, now we have another treat. Uh, we have here uh, Dr. Jasmine Plummer. Uh, she is the founding director for Center for Spatial Omics and member of Comprehensive Cancer Center at St. Jude's Children Research Hospital. She's an associate professor and a cross pointed in Department of Developmental Neurobiology and Department of Cellular and Molecular Biology. <clears throat> Before moving to St. Jude's, she was director of uh, Genomics Core at Mount Sinai in California, and her group focuses on generating multiomics data and spatial data related to mainly cancer and neurodegenerative uh, or neurological diseases more, uh, most of the time. And uh, she uh, uses integration of multiomics data, spatial data to really understand uh, what are the key factors which are driving uh, different outcomes in different diseases. So I look forward uh, to hearing her. Yeah, thank you, Jasmine, uh, for accepting our invite and coming over. Yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me. Can you hear this? Are we good? Is that good? Okay. Um, so we're going to give you a little bit of a flavor. I know it's a single cell workshop. I am a PI in the Human Cell Atlas, so I have a lot of single cell data. Ooh, that seemed really tweaky. Maybe if I hold it like this. Um, and so what I really want to get everybody kind of excited about is pretty pictures first. Um, so how are we in a single cell workshop even thinking about spatial omics and how did someone like me um, as a geneticist get all the way from single cell into spatial? So I'm going to walk you through a few of the different questions that we're interested in. But primarily my lab is interested in this very simple concept which can kind of go across many diseases so I'll give you a flavor for that in the talk. Um, so as a geneticist I was always really interested in the cells of origin. So why does a certain mutation set you up for cancer or other people have that mutation and nothing happens to them. Um, and one of the case studies that I'm going to talk about today, is this really like feedbacky to anybody? No or is it just me? Okay, maybe I don't like my own voice so I apologize. Um, so you can see beautiful pictures of the brain um, and we're going to walk you through a very specific example of how we use multi-omics in neurodevelopmental disease. So somebody already gave a talk about Airborne B. Um, and the idea of the neural pathology of a lot of the neurodevelopmental disorders, you can have a syndromic disorder, but over time, a lot of these diseases, a lot of the risk genes that we found associated, 25% of the world is affected by a mental health disorder, albeit that could be depression, ADHD, autism, schizophrenia, bipolar. And you'll see in subsequent slides that it seems to run in a family. So we don't have a heavy hitter like a BRCA1 mutation, um, but we do have kind of this hint that these risk genes are involved across mutations. And so I love this study. It isn't that long ago. It's very simplistic. Um, it's not single cell by any means. But the main difference that we found in autistic patients when we took up parts of their brains that we know are affected by autism, which is the prefrontal cortex and the temporal cortex, on the left-hand side is typical development. So there are genes that go up and genes that go down that define, this graph is just supposed to show you, these heat maps are just supposed to show you, that there are def genes that are up and down regulated to define what a prefrontal cortex is and what a temporal cortex is. And to the entire field, I don't think we expected this. We didn't expect, you know, we're going to see our favorite gene go up and down. But there's this general disorganization. The genes that are typically defining what a prefrontal cortex is are now lost and static and all over the map. And so this goes back to shared genetic risks. So all the yellows are just kind of um, some of the disease. Um, so in the purples are the syndromic. Those are things like MECP2, RET, ARB1B would be there. But maybe ARB1B might be in the middle of the now zone. So this hasn't been updated for a while. Um, the it, autism are in the blue. But in the yellows are the actual hubs of the disease. And what you can see, go check out the publication, is that a lot of these genes now if I were to put them in now, would probably be in the middle. They have a lot of shared risks, so they go across the disorders, as I kind of hinted at in the first slide. So nearly half of these 208 dis uh, neurodevelopmental disorder genes are actually associated with more than two categories. So we took a very simplistic approach. We were really interested in the idea of how can a receptor tyrosine kinase, that's an oncogene, be implicated in autism the same way as 
MEPP2, which could be a chromatin gene or a chromatin modifier. So what we really wanted to know is how does that network come together? How do these genes that end up being hits? It must be the way by which they're being regulated both in time and space to that disorganization that we see in the brain. So it's a simple math problem. It's not a simple experiment to do, but it's a simple math problem, right? So if gene number one is MEPP2 and gene number two is a proto-oncogene like MET receptor, maybe it's the gene regulatory network that binds them throughout development that is actually giving them their kind of shared risk. And so what you can see, the math problem is we take a transcription factor library of 1,100, I think it's 1,200 transcription factors. We do a lot of molecular cool tricks. This is done with UMass Med. Um, and we just tested in a, and I'll show you how we do it. And we literally asked the question, what can physically, so not ATAC, not ChIP-seq, what can physically bind you and turn you on? What is your true transcription factor that regulates you? And then you can build the map. So one connects to eight, connects to seven. Those are transcription factors that can bind it. And you can see that from the left-hand side, you start to get to the middle. And that really is what those gene regulatory networks look like in a systems biology approach. But as you can see to the right-hand side, it looks very much similar to kind of how those risk genes are interconnected. And so we did, I don't think this is working. Um, so there's supposed to be a movie on the left-hand side. Obviously, this is not easy to do. Um, so you do it in yeast, you put an activation, use the molecular tools, and you physically take all those neurodevelopmental disorder genes and you, you put them in one yeast, you mate them against each other, against the entire transcription factor library, as well as any DNA binding, predicted DNA binding protein, and from that, we established this gene regulatory network of neural developmental disorders. Um, so what you can see is all the yellow is all the genes, and all the blue are the things that bind to them. So that interconnectivity we saw very earlier, just in terms of what the genes themselves were, you can see now by transcription factor really highlights how interconnected these genes that are very different, right? MECPT is a chromatin modifier, is very different than MET, which is a proto gene. So, Really, when we go and look at, and I, I'm showing you, I'm going to show you the world of genomics. So this is bulk RNA-seq data from Allen Brain. I always think it's really important, especially because there's a lot of computational people in the room, use public data sets where you can to derive the best experimental design. So on the left-hand side, what you should be able to see is the genome-wide expression. So in a brain, every single, you'll see then in spatial data that they always use a mouse brain as a control, because every single gene is expressed in some part of your brain throughout development. And what you can see is those neural, uh, the 42 promoters are the neural development disorder genes. What you can see is they start to get defined into subcellular kind of subcortical regions. So again, it's bulk data, right? You're not going to be able to get into the further refined regions, but neural development disorder genes help to refine it more. I mean, we'd expect that. That's kind of a positive control. But when you actually look at the gene regulatory network, what you can, I hope you can see is those genes goes from the cerebellum, which is this thing that's hanging out the outside, to even more deeper subcortical structures. So this gene regulatory network is actually giving us information as about subcortical structures in terms of how we're able to kind of regulate these neurodevelopmental disorder risk genes. So I gave you bulk data on kind of why is my approach to spatial given I've been a geneticist for a long time. And um, we had a beautiful talk with the smoothie this morning, and I'm sick of the smoothie, so if anybody's been in spatial talks, this is my new smoothie. That bulk RNA-seq data I showed you for the Allen brain are the Legos on the left-hand side, right? And single cell data, I'm guilty of this, so please learn from my very expensive mistakes. All we've done with bulk data is literally put them in red piles, blue piles, or in piles. And I'm also guilty of this. We arbitrarily name them what we want them to be named based on the markers we already know them to be. So keep that in your brain. And then the brain is very different. The organization of where the red and the blue are is physically a different part of your cortex. A part of your cortex that's logic and reasoning versus your cerebellum that makes your arms and legs move. Yet in the single cell data, we're just assigning them by the blue, the red, and the orange. So we're not really learning at how they're interconnected for the biology. And then this is the space that I live in. So I'm guilty of this, right? I show you Lego, but really all you did was take an entire piece of tissue, mush it up, and do bulk RNA-seq on it. But did you really do any better with single cell? Um, again, PI, human cell atlas, guilty of the middle. I just made a cloud of cells. But what I hope you can see, I don't know if there's many, very many cancer people, but in this H&E stain, so it costs you 20 cents to do, on the top part of this is breast cancer. 
So an untrained eye, even my husband who thinks protein is chicken and tuna and he's not wrong, is very different than the bottom part, right? The bottom part is normal. You don't need to know any of that, but by eye, there are very different structures that we need to learn from. So this is real data. On the left-hand side, single cell data. On the right-hand side, those are 44 cells no one in this room computationally would ever define. It would just be noise in the data. On the right-hand side is actually a lobule of keratin in breast cancer, which is very important to outcome. So that's why we got into spatial. I hope I don't have to prove anything to you, but given this is a single cell workshop, I wanted to kind of just give a broad view of the field. It's very similar to single cell in some of the talks we heard about. There'll be people that can do it in genome. We can't do it as well in DNA now. It's really expensive to do. There's very few techniques. Um, DBIT-C can be done in epigenomes now, so there are some techniques. Um, and most of it right now is in transcriptomics, right? Much like single cell. So much of my talk will be transcriptomics and proteomics. And the proteomics I'm gonna be talking about today is gonna be the antibody base. So this is really just the idea of kind of the single cell. We're taking the single cell tools of having barcodes, UMIs, those kind of things, and now being able to plex them within a cell um, to have some spatial data. This is what the field looked like, I think, in the end of 2022. Um, this is a nice review by Chris Mason's lab. And you can see that the explosion of this field has finally let the technologies come up. Um, we're in a place where everybody always wanted to see it, but now um, we can actually see it. And then the target types are shown in the green and the orange. You can see that most of it is an RNA. So this is one people have already talked about it, so I'm not going to go through it. This is Visium HD. But this is a real experiment that we started with in single cell. So we have um, punches in the human developing brain. What we really wanted to know is if these neural developmental disorders are connected, how do they look like? How do these genes look like as they're being expressed as the brain's developing? So we made these maps, and I'm guilty of it. In the middle is our Surat objects of all these beautiful clusters where I literally have things labeled, I hope you can see them, in GLUT N to GLUT7. And now it's, this is on just cell by gene by very many groups. It just means that glutenomeric cells are different by seven cell types, and they give you no data as to what they are. But this is what it looks like even in Visium data. So I hope you can appreciate that the brain looks very differently when neighboring cells are against each other. So we've taken this, um, and these are all those single cell projections, so cell annotations that were mapped by many other people. And it really matters, right? So what I hope you can appreciate is that glue N3 is that red one on the edge, second row to the right. Um, and those are differentiated cells. They're literally at the edge. And the grouping beside them is the subventricular zone. Those are so, that's a zone that is going to be cells. So it really matters where you are. Single cell data is not lost, and we can still use it into Visium. So now what it, when we go back to the genetics, what does it look like? So remembering we have this shared genetic risk, we essentially took a subdivision of this, so just the autism genes, it's called Safari, public data set, where it rank orders genes, and we mapped it into our, into our Visium data and our single cell data. On the left hand what I, side, what I can appreciate is that we can group all those single cells, say cell proportion clusters, what it should tell you in the prefrontal cortex is the orange and the yellow is our neuroprogenitor zone. Those end up coming out and differentiating into the subventricular zone where you have the green and the pink. Um, and when it gets to the edge where the blue, now you're differentiated neurons. What's really interesting is when we do enrichment tests is that they all live in the subventricular zone. So they're literally the birth, but they're not the early progenitors. When we start to look at these disorders, they get enriched in areas by which they have the potential to be, become their own fate for, um, differentiated neurons. So we took one of these genes, um, and it's called TCF4. In the field, it's a master transcription factor. When you knock it out, it literally gives you the syndrome Pitt-Hopkins. Um, it's come up in GWASs now, and it's come up in GWASs of schizophrenia and autism. It's come up in autism exome sequencing. And also mutant mice, it has a very unique phenotype um, by which, which is a lot of these disorders, they can be substratified based on you can imagine that this gene is not just expressed in the brain, it's also expressed in other parts, and so it has a respiratory disorder, which is what this mouse also exhibits. So again, back to bulk data. Um, it's a workshop, so I want people to really understand how to mine things. And so when you look at TCF4 expression over time, these are areas of the brain that we know are involved in um, things like autism and Pitt-Hopkins. And across developmental time, you'll see this really beautiful striation where TCF4 goes up, 
And if I hadn't seen the Allen brain data, I would never have seen this data point, which is that every time TCF4 is up, SOX9 is down, and vice versa. And this is back to the single cell data I showed you earlier. TCF4 is everywhere. We just call it the master transcription factor. And then we make a little story about how it's in a little cell type. But it's only when these two things have been combined that we actually see the difference. So in SOX9, we wouldn't have even called it another cell type. There's just not enough of it there, right? It doesn't really define cluster red versus cluster blue. Um, but look at it spatially. TCF4 is everywhere, just like how we see in the single cell data. But every place, and I'm not showing the statistics, but we have an exclusion test, every place that TCF4 is high, SOX9 is gone. And every place SOX9 is, it's there. It's, um, TCF4 is gone. So I have this beautiful reciprocal expression in the spatial data that we've seen alone. So another quick study, it's not just a neural development story. This is published. Um, so the idea is to take um, control brains, autism brains. We've done it in single cells, so that's the Surratt object. So I want you to see, even in Visium data, you can see that the control looks very different than the Alzheimer's. So even for the same cell proportion, so all we're seeing in single cell data is really cell proportional changes between literally a control brain and autism brain. But what you can see is that, that we've known for a long time the middle um, kind of green is the um, gray matter. But you can see different kind of projections of a lot of the glial cells, and I'll show you kind of how we see that, we see it layer dependently, so we can mark these layers much similar to what somebody showed with RNA scope, this is with ish. And then what we actually see when we mine it across all data sets is that it really matters where in the brain you are, and that we only did it only through the spatial data where we're actually able to localize the signal, um, or we see kind of this astrocyte specific signal um, just, in the, uh, and just in the brain data, uh, in, the, in the Alzheimer's data. So we knew that kind of from a phenotype, we write stories about glial cells and how they may be protective or they're an immune response for Alzheimer's, but now we can actually start to localize them and see where they are in the brain. So how do, shifting gears a lot um, back to cells of origin, and so I'm still a geneticist by training and this is where my hat lives for a lot of times. This is the graph that keeps me up at night and if you remember anything of my talk, you'll probably remember pretty pictures. Um, which is why spatial is kind of fun. But this is the graph, not super interesting to most people, but is the thing that keeps me up at night. So we're all here because there's been an explosion of genomics. Since 2016, there has been an 86% increase in genomics, but 81% of that has been in European ancestry. So when you look at the global population on the right-hand side, the red denotes European, and the other colors is everybody else. So we've literally missed out everybody in our single cell data sets, um, our global data sets, which is how this is funded. So we missed out every ancestry um, in, the, the, in the, this beautiful human cell atlas map. We have 32 sites. We're really interested in um, cells of origin. So the cells of origin for ovarian cancer, the fallopian tube, prostate, and normal breast. And we're profiling this using traditional single cell methods. Um, through a large initiative called the African Caribbean Cancer Consortium. So we're doing an African ancestry um, both in Africa and the Caribbean and in, this, um, in the Americas. But why I'm showing you this is because it really, um, this method has developed and because it's a single cell workshop, I want to highlight it to many people. Um, and this is a collaboration um, with others in Australia and elsewhere. Um, and so what we made available is to be able to do single cell technologies in FFP. Um, so you can take open an FFP. We did it across many different tissue types, both in cancer and normal. We've put it through snap frozen, so we've had the same tissue. We snap froze at, we put an FFP, and we show that the data looks the same. So now you can see FFP data. Um, you can call red cells red. You can call, um, so the pink cells are hematocytes, the red cells are epithelial cells. But back to the Visium data, it matters. It totally matters that we smushed up tissue um, and on the right side, these are H&Es, where you can see very high density um, epithelial cell populations and now have vasculature that could be feeding them. So imagine how much your biological interpretation is going to be based on the map of the top versus the bottom. Because you're not driving any new cell types. Breast is still a breast. You're just driving different cell proportions and who they're talking to. So this kind of leads me to my... Um, 
why we're even doing this. Um, so this is the spatial atlas and breast cancer and African ancestry. Um, and so it really came from this idea that we have different rates. So remember I said we haven't profiled all these different people. Um, but we know based on their genetics, so a lot of this also reflects their genetics, but again, there's also social economic determinants. And it was always thought that in the blue, the blue are kind of our US population. We know even within the US population, black women do worse than white women. But we always knew that in Africa, Africa's the green, we used to try and get this funded and never got funded. And the green um, is that they don't have as high an incidence, but they die. So I was always kind of reviewers would say back that that had everything to do with access, that you know, poor hospitals, larger tumors, et cetera. And it was only, it only really started to get funded when we added the um, pink points. So the pink points are really that the Caribbean population, which has an admixed population, remembering they, they have genetics that have an African ancestry in them, but they have Latino, they have other Asian populations, and they are very similar in terms of quality of care as the Africans, which says that they have poor hospitals, they have more severe disease, yet they die, and they have the most aggressive disease even when we age match and stage match based on one site in Miami. So they're all in Miami, first ancestry within three months of treatment, and they still do worse. That's true for ovarian and prostate cancer. So in ovarian cancer, they actually have a different type of ovarian cancer. They have germ cell, which is very common in the Americas to have high-grade serous. So just concentrating on just the breast, um, this is a collaboration again with the African Caribbean Cancer Consortium and Dr. George and Dr. Githikia um, is the main site in Africa and Dr. George is the main site in America. And so we took that same infrastructure that was funded by single cell um, and we used it to start to investigate tumors. So what we're really trying to do is empower um, the sites themselves to try to get into better technologies and better diagnosis. Um, so we try and pair their clinical information. Again, these things are usually on paper. So what is the level of metadata and clinical information that we can match? Um, so we try and match it as best as possible and fill in the loops and the holes. Um, we collect the tissue both in the US and both in Africa and the Caribbean. We're really trying to make sure that it gets pathology reviewed across pathologists across the globe. So we have six pathologists usually on a call for every um, section that we look at. Um, but unfortunately, when we talk about capacity building, it doesn't extend to these very expensive technologies. And so most of the data acquisition is primarily done by myself in the US. Um, so this has been a long um, love affair. Um, it's taken us working with Akoya, the company themselves. 80% um, of this panel is custom, and it's a 66 pa custom panel that it was mainly derived. And if you start these studies, um, please work with pathologists because these are clinically actionable targets. So we wanted to make sure that whatever we were including in our panel, we based it off our single cell data, um, but we also wanted to include what was clinically a diagnostic, right? Not just what Jasmine thought was very cool biology. Um, so those are all padded in. We also have like different kind of immune markers, et cetera. Um, so the way that Akoya works is nothing super fancy. The, it's the same technology of what everybody knows as IHC, but now we use genomics and barcode it. So you can plex up to 100 now. I can say we would be too to do this in my lab. Um, and so you have your antibody conjugates, you put on your sample, and all the machine does is cycle it, take the barcodes off, cycle again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the caveat test that we'll talk about this later is the data analysis. So I show this pretty diagram, but I will tell you everybody's bottleneck will be that. Um, and so I use this as a way to gauge people's ideas about single cell into spatial. So if I told you in the single cell data, you barely saw a calf. You'd have to peek really closely, subcluster that based on a marker, because it's usually only less than 1% to 10, not even 10% of your population, I'm lying, maybe 4 to 5% of, of the population. Because remembering when you're disassociating a tumor, you could have 10 million cells by which most people are only profiling about 5,000. So you have 5,000 cells to represent that entire tumor. I can have over 100,000 cells on every single slide. Some slides have 400,000 cells. So what you can see here is the yellow is the calf. The calf would not have been seen in single cell data. Imagine how informative it is to see the yellow around with the red that's the vasculature feeding the tissue. And I'll tell you that because these are the tumors that do very poorly. 
How do you do this um, from a computational way? All we do is those are the cells. This is actually off MRFish, so we've done RNA in them as well. Um, and so it's the same kind of tumors. You just physically put those UMIs into the cell themselves, and you have like a circle around it to tell you it's a cell segment. We're actually at 8 million cells, so this slide has not been updated. Um, so on the top, that's the human cell atlas that got published with 1 million cells. Um, the lovely lung one, which got published last year, was 2.4. And just in our cohort alone, we're almost to 8 million cells, which tells you the power of actually being able to see those small differences in those rare cell types. Um, so it doesn't matter. Remembering the US black women, they still do worse than the um, US white women, but they actually are the best outcome. So you can see here is we do have a lot of epithelial cells. So they're all tumor, right? What we wanted to prove first, too, is that these are biopsies. So I'm showing you that on purpose, is we wanted to prove this because we're, act we're actively trying to do clinical trials, which we were successfully doing, so that we could biopsy them. And as women are going through trials, we can actually see how their tumor microenvironments are changing. And what you can see is that the Caribbean black women look very different. They have the same cell types, but they're in different proportions. What you can also deduce is this looks like a regular kind of single cell map. On the bottom right-hand side are the epithelial cells. The epithelial cells, you'll see like two little heat maps. You can see myeloid cells, T cells, et cetera. You can find your favorite things. But the epithelial cells, we can actually start to designate out normals um, versus tumors based on their locations too, right? Because now we don't just have the markers, we have the locations. And what does that look like? So this is very basic cell neighborhood analysis. I took off all, I deducted all of the neighborhoods. So the neighborhood really just means that you can say, if I'm an epithelial cell, who do I live by? Do I live by on a fibroblast? Do I live around a, um, vasculature? And so those are all broken down. You can find these 11 random neighborhoods. I hate these plots because they tell me nothing. Because what you really want to see is this plot. These are all the same na cell neighborhoods called across all the tumors that we have. And I hope you can appreciate the biopsy on the left-hand side looks nothing, again, same cell types. Now we're saying, if you are an epithelial cell, who do you live around? They are completely different. And we actually see a neighborhood in the purple that almost does not exist in the Caribbean black. So can we do better? This is really not really cell agnostic. I have to call a CD4 cell a CD4 cell um, based on its staining. I have to call an epithelial cell based on EPCAM and five other markers. So we really want to be able to do this agnostically and do that better. Um, and again, the data is really large. Uh, so I give these didacted versions. But if you're getting into spatial, it's um, way more Goliath than in single cell. So I should never be talking about ML and AI, but that is where the field's going. Um, and the way I think about this, given there are people in my lab doing this, is we all know that ChatGPT is doing very good for language models, right? We all use it. I use it to change my presentation titles, just FYI. It's a good hint. Um, but the only thing I know about ML and AI is like, it's very good for spatial. It can open up your phone, right? You take a pic, if it, you train it enough, then you can start to learn where eyes are and mouths are and noses are. Can you imagine what you could do with it, the tumor or a heart or a, an appendix? So that's my basis of getting into this. Luckily, I have smarter people than myself, and we're working with a group in Brazil who have this beautiful model, which is very well known in, in cancer biology, where you start, you have on the left-hand side some kind of tumor. It resists therapy. And the, that it reverts back to a stem-like phenotype, right? Because it's able to like escape therapy, revert to something dedifferentiated so it can escape and become something else. So she's a model, published in Cell. And what you should see in the middle of the model is that across all of them, it relates very well and performs very well. It's linked to clinical outcomes based on subtypes. So on the right-hand side is TP53. We know P53 tumors and ER negative tumors do the worst. So it's very good at predicting. You can go look at it. She's done it across every single tumor in the, human, in the cancer genome atlas. So I knew nothing, but I said single cell data has a lot. In order to train that model, she needed the entire cancer genome atlas to train it. Because in ML and AI, you need lots and lots of data. So my, me naively said single cell has a lot of data. So we downloaded every single single cell breast cancer data set, and we trained the model. So what you can see is you have all your cell types. You know, you can call it whatever you want. Cancer epithelial cells are um, cancer epithelial cells. You can call regular endothelial cells, et cetera. What our stemness does very well at is being able to cell agnostically. I don't care what you annotated it. 
I don't care if it's an endothelial cell. I don't care if it's an epithelial cell. Tell me which tumors and which cells are doing the worst. And that's the top right-hand side. That's our stemness index. When it's red, it's more stem and they're doing worse. What's quite amazing about this is agnostically, it links to the clinical subtypes. So if you see where it's most red, um, it's really, that's triple negative breast cancer. Um, so that's in the green. And that's literally the most lethal cell types. So I don't care where you are in the single cell map. I can physically tell you without knowing what your cell type is if your tumor is going to be worse. And now, this is for the rest of the group, if anybody else is doing uh, spatial, we've done it across every single assay. It does very well. So you can see even within certain tumors, which parts of the tumor um, are going to be more stem-like. So go back to that, I showed you the actual data, right, where I could show you there's different neighborhoods, blah, blah, blah. Remembering I said I hated that because I had to tell you what an epithelial cell is and maybe it was epithelial cell one versus epithelial cell two. Now what you can see is the US black women, right? So remembering these women did better have very little stem pockets. But in the biopsies of the Caribbean black, these are age match, stage match. They're going through treatment. The Caribbean black women get these pockets of high stem. That correlates to epithelial cells, which is, makes sense biologically, but we don't need to know which epithelial cells. You can actually identify kind of outcomes of what these women are gonna do. Because remembering that whole ML was derived against clinical outcomes. We see other phenotypes. So this is a really interesting phenotype that we think might be actionable by drugs. Um, and so we kind of, these tumors don't really express PARP that well. Um, but in the sw small cells that they do, and the women that don't do well, they have this protective macrophage, like don't eat me, and they're protecting PARP. So these might be kind of tumors that we normally wouldn't give PARP inhibitors to that we might are thinking about doing that. And that's work being done with UT Southwest. So where are we headed? So for sake of time, where am I at? Okay, good. Um, I really kind of, I'm giving you a big, huge, like a live tour through many diseases from single cell to biology, so spatial biology. So kind of, I showed you the very curated data. You'll see beautiful talks from Ionis tomorrow. Um, but we've probably been in it longer than most people. And it isn't always so smooth. So while I show you a lot of these data sets, I can tell you that some sections are one terabytes of data. That could be whole genome runs, right? So remembering kind of most of your single cell experiments are in the 200 million read zones, one terabyte of data. Um, and so we, um, this is why I moved to St. Jude, that they made a strategic plan specifically just for this so that we could do um, really a center approach. We have all technologies. Um, and really, we're ending, and I hope other people pick this up, and I really like the proteomics talk. Our proteomics, right back to that there's three things in the field, sequencing-based, RNA-based, and protein-based. I honestly had a meeting discussion at lunch that we really want sequencing-based to win. Um, but the field hasn't really caught up it yet. Um, Imaging-based seems to be the thing that people are really getting excited about. Um, but I'd love to see, and especially given a lot of the work that we're working in, is the clinically actionable things are in proteomics, right? Antibodies are literally still the thing, even for Crohn's disease, that we use. Um, H&E costs $10, in some places, $0.20. Cents. Um, and so really being able to kind of link back to the protein. So um, future directions is these things are not cheap. It's usually, on average, about $3,000 a slide. Um, but we're doing it in a much more high throughput way. We're doing it in clinical trials. Um, and so we're really trying to go after a large cohorts to kind of learn and train the data from an um, ML and AI approach. So what you can see this is an active clinical trial. Again, we're using proteomics here because it's more stable. So remembering across sites, RNA isn't as stable. I showed you that Murfish one. We've done it in Xenium, we've done it in other things, but really the one thing, no matter what your sample type is that can do well, is kind of these antibody things. The limitation before was that we were plexing five things, um, but the idea that we can start to plex up to 100 now starts to make it a level by which we can understand it the way genomics people do. And uh, to end on a high note, and uh, he's your keynote speaker tomorrow, um, is we started, uh, we started kind of, um, I won't tell you the specifics, but it's called Gestalt, and it's really to address some of these things that I've been talking about where computation has been the biggest hindrance in the field. Understanding what is true um, noise and what's signal. We are not there yet in the way that we were with single cell. But remembering, I've been in single cell a while. 
is we didn't even throw out mitochondrial reads before. We just took everything off a sequencer. We didn't do site seek and select some. We didn't have fact sorting in the beginning. So, you know, I know we're gonna get there, but really this community has arisen to address that. Um, and where do I think we're heading from a multi-omics approach? I think less atlasing and more biology. I think we're getting there in single cell, and I think a lot of you, some of the presenters today showed that, but we do need some atlases to kind of train and understand the metrics in the field, especially for the imaging base. Um, I really love the idea and why I put so many examples in of taking single cell. So not to say that if this is your first time into single cell in this workshop, please come back. It's not spatial right away. Um, there's so much value in still being able to train these data sets with single cell and use what we've established for a long time of things we know well. More mechanistic, kind of a paired approach to um, these mechanisms. Uh, broadening the teams, always think about putting a pathologist or somebody that's looked at tissue. I spent a lot of time in a uh, room with a pathologist. And the computational bottleneck, so this is for the trainees. Think about computational training. Um, the nice thing about spatial is as you're computing, and I can say this for my team, you get to see something. And so when you've deduced that I have a red blob and a, and a blue blob, sometimes when you're computing, you'll actually be able to see it now. Um, and I just want to acknowledge the work and thank the organizers for um, inviting me. So I have collaborators at CHLA, UMass, Seattle, uh, UW, and the Alzheimer's work was at OSHU. Um, and this is a Goliath, so there's consortiums here, um, ma mainly being led out of U Miami. Um, my other collaborators in kind of the FFP single cell world, which are Dr. Martelletto and Dr. Malta in Sao Paulo, Brazil, my funding, and then my team. And I'm happy to take questions. And I love this. This is real data, I heart spatial. Thank you, Jasmine, for a beautiful talk. Uh, questions? So maybe I'll start with a question. So um, in your talk, you compared data from African, uh, American black and Caribbean black. Um, so is that, um, is that just one individual that you showed in your talk? Oh no, I, that's the cohort. So cohort. I was just, the data's so big, right? So I didacted it. So when you saw the neighborhoods mm -hmm. and the whole TCNA plot, so you guys have TCNA plots, I have a TCNA plot of four million cells there. So that's the whole cohort. Um, but I just wanted to show when you do the cell, cell neighborhood clustering, it's very hard to show each individual one. So we kind of put them into bar plots, but it doesn't really show you the true representation of kind of how those cell neighborhoods look. So how, how many individuals uh, do you have? We are at, I say a cohort of 20 across, 20 something across all three. Okay. So that tells you how many cells. As you mentioned, it's a, a very beautiful and colorful presentation in all aspects, scientifically as well as like a presentation wise. But uh, when it comes to some of the data you presented, like uh, you mentioned the US blacks. So is it like self-reported or uh, are you looking at uh, Yeah, so we have also? ancestry on that. We have um, genotyping and pheno and we have, so we see genetically, I'm not telling you about the genetic talk because it's not a genetic talk. Um, so interestingly, black Caribbean women have a different, even just from regular cancer, cancer screening, they have a different representation of things like BRCA1. So US black women look more like US white women with BRCA1, BRCA2 primarily as their risk mutations. Interestingly, in the Caribbean black population, they tend to have other things like RIP1. It's published in like JAMA. Um, in Africa, we don't have as many. Um, in terms of how, how we think that fallout's gonna go, but there are people working on it. But if you start looking in closer uh, regarding the admixture, do you think the US black woman data is going to like uh, even sort out, tease out uh, I mean, we'd more have mechanisms? To put, yeah, we'd have to put lots of data, right? So that's why we're trying to get into, even the clinical trial data, I just, I, when, for sake of time, I didn't have time to talk about all that. Those are not, mixed cohorts, right? They tended primarily, and this is 
this is getting into kind of social determinants, but most of the clinical data we have out is for most cancers are across white people here too. Um, there are active funding, and I'm participating in one of those with Kaiser, by which we're trying to do Latino, um, so Hispanic and black and white within America. But we don't know, I mean, we don't know. This is probably one of the first, right? So there are more to come. There was a few talks at AACR um, using things like uh, mass spec to try and find out, tease out different proteomics for them. Hi. Hi. Yeah, so uh, thank, it was an amazing talk. Thank you. Uh, I had a question on ML uh, model on where you were showing the stemness of different cells. Yeah. So what's the training data? Is this attendee stain? Stem, it's stem cell data. So it got trained on stem cell data. And so was it also like you had this for all different kind of races or was it against? No, no, no. That is, that. so that's actually interesting because that data, we don't know what it is, right? So back to like most of the data we have, we don't actually know ancestry. Um, so that would have gotten trained against like just stem. You know, it's not trained against, and it's trained against TCGA and methylation markers and clinical outcomes, so it's not trained into ancestry. We just don't have numbers yet, but that would be interesting to see. And so all those, these great data sets, are this publicly available? So that paper is published in BMC Genomics. It got published this okay. year or last year. Okay, thank you. But the African, no, that's still, we're still filling it out. I actually presenting a lot of unpublished work because it's a workshop. So even the neurodevelopmental disorders are um, getting written up right now. I, I, I give you new stuff. That's why you come to workshops. Or you could read about it. Yeah. Thanks, Jasmine. So I think you've shown the data from multiple spatial platform and you've shown the data from Akoya and you said like it's for FFP, but what we see in multiple studies is you can do maybe few cycles of codex and then because it needs stripping of the antibody. Oh, no, we use the new, we need, sorry, we use the new machine, the phenocyclic fusion. And, and that. Yeah. Uh, we can get, I mean, these are coming from Africa. So uh -huh. I'm going to be very clear. The reason that FFP thing was like a method problem so we have funding to do Chan Zuckerberg in Africa to do fresh frozen, but it'll get stuck in FedEx, right? Mm -hmm. So um, we've really reverted, and I showed some Merscope data, but the reason those have all reverted to Codex, is be, it's not Codex, it's the phenocyclic fusion, mm -hmm. is because they're way more robust. We very rarely get lifting or we get staining for sure. Not a, PD-1 always is a little bit difficult, but it's difficult anyway. Um, but yeah, we'll get, it's pretty robust. And, and <clears throat> how many targets you're doing in total? 60, 67. But I would reduce that now. So now, like, now that we have a big learning cohort, even for the single cell stuff, right? Like you don't need every probe. Um, so that's our new approach and why we're doing the clinical trials because what actually happens is we see more interpatient patient variability than within the tumor. So my goal eventually, like if you ask me, my future dream is to say, five antibodies in H&E, have so much data that I never have to do omics again. Um, and I think the more we have, the more we'll be able to tease out cell types within five or eight antibodies. Um, but right now we just need people to load as much data sets as possible. But we use 66 plex. In the future, I probably would do 30, because now yeah. I have enough data to make that decision. Thank you. But I'm happy to talk about it um, yeah. method-wise, because we've really worked it out. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, thank you to Jasmine again. So our next speaker is uh, Shanta Murthy. Do we have Shanta?
So welcome to Shantan Murthy from Emory, Emory University. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, uh, my name is Shanta Murthy. Um, I'm a member of the Kukudasan Lab. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk here today. Um, I'm excited to show some of our work uh, doing a single cell transcriptomics analysis comparing mucosal epithelial cells and patient derived organoids from patients with perianal fistulizing Crohn's disease. So first, I want to discuss a little bit about uh, the disease. Um, Crohn's disease is a highly prevalent disease that is characterized by chronic impl uh, inflammation, and it impacts over a million children and adults worldwide. And perianal fistulizing Crohn's disease is a subtype of this disease that is uh, a very aggressive and often has a poor quality of life. Uh, patients often have uh, pus and anal discharge in the uh, perianal fistula tract. It often has more extensive mucosal damage and generally patients have a poor quality of life with worse outcomes. Uh, in terms of therapeutics, uh, treatments, uh, patients often respond poorly to currently available treatments that primarily target the immune system and surgery has also not been very successful for patients. So. Um, some studies, particularly in single cell, have suggested that there may be other cell types that may be involved in, in the pathogenesis. And in our lab, we are particularly interested in investigating the role of the epithelial compartment in this disease. And we are exploring how organoids, um, which is an epithelial cell model, can be used to uncover some of the mechanisms by which these epithelial cell types may implicate. Uh, perianal fistulizing Crohn's disease. So in this study, we investigated how patient-derived intestinal organoids maintain the disease characteristics that we see from patients in vivo and evaluate whether these disease characteristics are maintained. So our hypothesis is that the organoids do uh, retain the uh, disease characteristics that we see um, in vivo. Um, and we can use single cell transcriptomics to see those signatures retained in culture. So in order to test this hypothesis, we obtained rectal mucosal biopsies from patients, consenting patients from Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. We obtained two biopsies from the same location and one was immediately processed for single cell transcriptomics and another, from, again, from the same location was uh, grown in culture to generate uh, paired patient-derived organoids. So here um, we're showing a little bit more about how these organoids were generated. So from these rectal mucosal tissue biopsies, we isolated the crypts and grew these cells in culture. These organoids have been grown in high winter or intestinal media, and these are the findings that I'll be showing today. Uh, we have in the lab also done some studies using different types of media, including differentiating media, and we've come across some consistent results to what um, I'm showing in the upcoming slides. And on the figure at the bottom right is the immunofluorescence, which is stained for a particular cell type marker, markers that appear to suggest the presence of epithelial subtypes um, in the culture. So for the analytical workflow, um, we compared rectal mucosal samples and rectal organoids, and the phenotypes that they corresponded to were from perianal fistulizing Crohn's disease patients, as well as uh, non-IBD controls. And then uh, the quality control that we did for uh, both were similar, where we only used them from the mucosal data, the epithelial cells, and we also 
performed similar quality control in terms of removing extreme features from both the rectal mucosal epithelial cells and the organoids, and also removed high, uh, cells with high mitochondrial transcripts. We also excluded the influence of mitochondrial and ribosomal genes from the downstream analysis. A standard SURA workflow was performed where we conducted RPCA integration and clustering. And then as you see on the right, um, the, the UMAPs for the mucosal epithelium and organoids have relatively um, comparable number of cells. So first in this uh, PCA, PCA plot here, we did a pseudobulk of the mucosal epithelial cells and the organoids. And from this PC1 versus PC2 plot, we see that uh, already we can distinguish which um, correspond to the mucosal epithelium versus the organoids. Um, and this PC1 corresponds to 76% of the variance. And then we further looked at the top 10 principal components shown on the right. And we see that disease phenotypic characteristics such as the status of whether this patient had perianal fistulizing Crohn's disease as well as whether there was also presence of rectal inflammation was in PC2, which corresponded to about 6% of the variance. And if you see on the graph on the left, you can see that separation more clearly in the, oh, sorry, in the mucosal epithelium as compared to the organoids. And so when we looked at the pseudobulk organoids on its own, we saw that gender and ancestry primarily corresponded to the primary variants within the data with disease phenotypic categories such as the presence of perianal fistulizing Crohn's disease and rectal inflammation only being weakly uh, correlated or with limited correlation. And we further parsed this at the single cell level um, looking at uh, particular quality metrics between the mucosal epithelium and organoids and those distributions. And so we saw that there were differences in the features per cell shown here, simplified as like median features per sample, as well as the uh, transcripts per cell where we see far more in the organoids as compared to the epithelial cells from the mucosa. We also uh, calculated a complexity score which can be simplified as a ratio between these features to the counts, and those were also significantly different between the mucosal epithelial cells and the organoids. Integrating the mucosal epithelial cells and the organoids together, we were able to also annotate the lineages that these uh, epithelial cells corresponded to based on known um, marker genes, and are, they, those are colored here in the UMAP. And on the right, we see this UMAP split by the mucosal epithelial cells and the organoids. And so from this, we can see that there is some overlap between the epithelial cells from the mucosa and the organoids, particularly those that correspond to more undifferentiated or early, uh, early uh, profiles of particular epithelial lineages. And on the, in the mucosa, you also see that there are some distinct subtypes that are present that are not found in the organoids. And those seem to primarily correspond to some more secretory-like clusters. So to further understand what cell, cell clusters are present within the mucosal epithelium and organoids, we conducted an independent analysis of these uh, mucosal epithelial cells and organoids, and we annotated the cell clusters we observed. And we identified 18 distinct clusters within the mucosal epithelium and 10 distinct clusters within the organoids. And then on the bar graph on the right, we were able to map these cell clusters to their corresponding epithelial lineage. And we found that the majority of the cells within the organoids seem to map to the undifferentiated cells, which is shown in blue. So in the schematic on the left, we can better understand where these undifferentiated cells map to the base of the intestinal crypt. And then with cues from the mesenchyme, these epithelial cells can crawl up this crypt axis and um, those epithelial cell types are more mature or more differentiated. And so we can look at the positioning or the genes that correspond to the positioning of these epithelial cells um, by calculating a crypt axis score 
which is shown on the distribution on the right, where we see uh, distributions of organoids in yellow and mucosa in purple. And from these distributions, you see that there is a, a certain cell profiles that are found in the mucosal epithelial cells that are not observed in the organoids. And so we further broke this down based on the cell clusters within the organoids. And we saw that the, in terms of this cryptaxis score distribution, the larger distributions and higher values localized to absorptive progenitor and microfold-like cells shown in the reds and pinks, whereas the other cell clusters were virtually near zero. So we wanted to better understand what are some of the sources of these differences between the transcriptional profiles in the mucosal epithelium and the organoids. So we were interested in investigating transcription factors that are involved in these uh, differentiation pathways. And so we first examined uh, HES1, which is a transcription factor that is um, often localized to undifferentiated and absorptive leaning uh, epithelial cell types, which appears consistent with what we see in the mucosal epithelium. And it's also a notched target gene. Um, and we saw that the organoids had a constitutive expression of this HES1 gene across the cell clusters, regardless of regardless of the type. We further looked at secretory uh, lineage transcription factors, such as those involved in committing epithelial cells to the goblet lineage, as well as enteroendocrine lineage. And in the mucosal epithelium, they clearly localized to particular clusters, whereas in the organoids, those, uh, the expression of those transcription factors were absent. We found one cluster within the organoids that appear to be very similar to the microfold cells we see in the mucosal epithelium based on the expression of CCL20. However, we noticed that this particular cluster within the organoids lacked the expression of the transcription factor SPIB. And this transcription factor is involved with um, uh, committing these cells to this microfold lineage, suggesting that these organoid cells are not fully mature in this microfold um, state. We further performed differential gene expression and pathway analysis from the patient paired mucosal epithelial cells and organoids. And we found that ma the majority of the pathways that were altered corresponded to inflammatory and epigenetic pathways. As you can see here, there are some alterations based on like toll-like receptor pathways as well as antigen processing presentation and other also epigenetic pathways such as chromatin modifying enzymes and HDEX also being affected. These organoids were classified based on their, uh, the patient's uh, phenotypic category, whether they had uh, rectal inflammation with perianal fistulizing disease and also whether they were a non-IBD control. So we similarly performed differential gene expression and pathway analysis to evaluate if there was still some presence of disease activity in these patient-derived organoids. And we see, do see some alterations, particularly impacting metabolic pathways, such as changes in lipid biosynthesis. And we also see some maintenance of inflammatory pathways being altered, including inflammasomes between perianal uh, disease samples with inflammation versus control. And we see also alterations of rho GTPA signaling, which is involved with epithelial cell remodeling. So from this study, we've noticed that the primary variance within the uh, organoid samples mainly corresponds to ancestry and gender. And there's actually minimal correlation to disease phenotypic characteristics. And we were able to understand this more, uh, unravel this further with single cell to see that the patient-derived organoids actually express significantly more genes per cell. And there's also aberrant expression of major transcription factors, including HES1, which was broadly expressed, as well as minimal expression of transcription factors promoting epithelial cell differentiation. We have done subsequent experiments in the lab, uh, growing organoids in differentiating media and evaluating whether there were changes of uh, the levels of transcription factors involved in uh, committing cells to the secretory lineage. 
where we did not see changes through RT-PCR experiments. So that has um, it made us interested in exploring how uh, in incorporating cues from the mesenchyme that are involved in this cryptaxis gradient can help to recapitulate the epithelial cells that we see in the mucosa. And we're currently working on doing co-culturing experiments from autologous mesenchymal stem cells and organoids to hopefully recapitulate these um, cell characteristics and um, have a better approach for MSC therapies, which are currently being considered as uh, possible treatments for this disease. Um, I'd like to thank everyone in my lab as well as our collaborators. And thank you so much for the opportunity to speak today. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much. That was a beautiful talk, thank you. I have a technical question because mm -hmm. we're working with organoids right now and we see kind of a similar situation with uh, transcripts, but I don't know if that's like organoid dependent. So have you kind of cross-checked it against other organoid models? And do we think it's like, you know, the way it was with uh, cell culture, like things growing on a dish, are there ways by which we're perpetuating more transcripts to keep you alive as an organoid? Yeah, thank you, for, thank you for your question. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, so we have seen, at least from my knowledge, um, also increased expression of features in uh, mesenchymal stem cells or other cells that are grown in culture as well. And so it, particularly that question about there just being much more features uh, per cell. And we have, ex I think there is some variation that I've seen from some studies that I've compared with, perhaps including ones that were grown in more differentiating media where that distribution may vary, but from, from those results, it did seem like it was higher compared to mucosal epithelial cells, but that would be something that would be good to investigate further. Thank you, yeah. Any other question? Yes. Hi, great talk. Um, so, you know, you see the markers and they, they seem to be capturing a cell type you know, um, but, you know, the transcriptional level from cell type to cell type, your organoid, just because it's such a different thing, might be recapitulating some cell populations differently. So I was wondering, there are some, some very nice metrics. Let me try to, like, shield it. Okay, so th there are some, some metrics about transcriptional distances that you could be using to compare those that you match to see, for instance, which populations are might be closer and which populations might be further. Um, there are two, three papers I have in mind, happy to share. They're, they're, you know, we'll not find them in nature. These are like bioinformatics uh, kind of level papers that it's a, it's a method to identify transcriptional distance between single cells or, or single cell in bulk. And you could use these metrics to, to identify which of the populations are more similar and more different or something like, have you, have you tried something like that? I'm, I'm not familiar with that, so I'd be happy to, uh, yeah, if you have certain papers that you willing to share, yeah, I'd love to incorporate that. Thank you, yeah. Any other question? <coughs> Susanta, I, <coughs> I have a question. Mm -hmm. So in your organoid data, it looked like to be cells are kind of, if you look at your uh, fresh data and your organoid data, it looked like to be like cells are kind of becoming similar. They're losing their identity kind of. So have you looked at like stress genes, like is the cells are stressed basically that's making them like lose their phenotype or something like that? Um. Yeah, that's a great question. I think we do see a, a lot of abundance of more like proliferative genes actually. I don't I know that I've seen much stress genes particularly, but um, yeah, I think, yeah, I, there is, I, I agree with the idea. It does appear more uniform or homogenous, 
based on like the profiles across the clusters are much more similar as compared to comparing cluster to cluster in the mucosal epithelium. So yeah. 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 But <coughs> great talk. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So you know, the last speaker for this session is Stephen Morton. Uh, he's from Morehouse School of uh, Medicine. And um, uh, he's going to talk about a single cell RNA seq approach in assessing P311 impact on brown adipocytes heterogeneity in brown adipose tissue. So, and I remember, I think, meeting uh, him in first conference. Uh, when he don't have any single cell data, I'm really happy to report that now he has single cell data. So we are making progress. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. My name is Stephen Morton, and I work under Dr. Baudry in the Department of Physiology and Toxicology at the Cardiovascular Research Institute at Morehouse School of Medicine. And today, I'll be presenting my research on p 311s influence in brown adipocyte plasticity using a single-cell RNA sequencing approach. So have you ever wondered what is obesity? Obesity is a complex chronic disease that is defined by excessive fat. Obesity drives numerous diseases and disorders which negatively impact human health. And so one of the measures to, um, one of the measurements for obesity is BMI. So here we have a scale of BMI going from underweight to extremely obese. As I said before, obesity drives numerous complications including diabetes, heart disease, strokes and cancer. It also negatively impacts our mental health um, and it also, um, is in, it also causes societal discrimination. So obesity is a global pandemic and its effects are really acute here in the United States. Currently 42% of the U.S. population is obese and is estimated to rise to 50% by 2030. And this is important because there are very limited treatment options for obesity. So here are the treatment options based on BMI and absence of presence of a comorbidity. And so exercise has not been effective. The drugs which address obesity causes neurological addictions as well as gastrointestinal problems. And surgery is not an end all be all because many relapse at the surgery. There's a huge financial cost associated with obesity with an estimated costing $1.7 trillion in 2018. So it's a, it's a big problem. Um, so now we'll go on to discuss the types of um, the cell type and the types of fat which drive obesity. So within our bodies, we have white fat, we have brown fat, and we have beige fat. So the difference between the fats is that white fat stores, stores lipids where brown and beige fat are thermogenic and they catabolize um, molecules releasing heat. So beige fat forms a part of the brown fat depot and these types of fats are anatomically dis distributed throughout the body and they, there's many different subtypes, and they, all, they also show variation depending on developmental stage. So one of the drivers behind obesity is this um, idea of energy intake versus energy expenditure. 
So when we take in more energy uh, in the form of glucose and fat, our white adipose tissue stores this, causing weight gain. Where conversely, if we take in these same molecules, our brown fat, through the presence of mitochondria, um, releases, um, uses, uses it and releases heat, causing weight loss. So now we're going to discuss the protein that I work with, P311. So P311 has been shown to, has been shown to be induced during adipogenesis and present in white adipose tissue. So we work with um, a cell culture model using 3C31L um, cells. So here are the immature adipocytes, which are fibroblasts, and upon giving the adipogenic cocktail, they differentiate into mature adipocytes. And here is um, pan and panel A, and panel B shows mRNA and protein evidence of P31's increased expression during adipogenesis. So you see here from day zero to day five, we see an increase and P3 run expression shown here on panel A and panel B. And below are positive markers for, um, for this process because P3, P, PPR gamma 2 is the master regulator of adipogenesis and FABP4 is a terminal differentiation, differentiation marker. And as we can see here, they follow the same trajectory as P311. And to, in this image to the right shows um, immunohistochemistry staining of an antibody against P311, and we show P311 is indeed present in white adipose tissue. And so moving on, we show that P311 has been expressed in other adipose depots. So, we sh so again, we show P311's expression in brown adipose tissue and beige adipose tissue. And to the right, we see um, immunohistochemistry staining of, of, of UCP1. So UCP1 is a marker for thermogenic adipocytes and upon the knockdown of P311 in these tissues, we see a decrease in UCP1 expression, indicating that these cells are becoming, in a sense, less brown and more white. But we hypothesize that this is not a, this is not a simple situation of white versus brown fat. And so in order to assess the adipocyte heterogen, the brown phenotype heterogeneity within brown adipose tissue, we use novel single cell sequencing. So here is a workflow of our, here is a schematic of our workflow. And so we took brown, we collected brown adipose tissue from wild type and P3 on knockout mice. We isolated the single cell and then we gave the, our, the single cell solution to, Georgia, to the molecular evolution core at Georgia Tech where the cells were sequenced. And then we used bioinformatic pathways, including um, primarily Surat in order to analyze our data. And so we found some amazing results with our, after sequencing. And so um, we found two, 22 clusters um, between the two phenotypes, I mean, within the two phenotypes. And so um, we found 75,000 cells per, roughly 75,000 cells per phenotype. And so we know that in brown adipose tissue, the majority of the cells are brown adipocytes. And so with, with, a few, with a few immune cells as well as progenitor cells. And so I wanna bring your attention to this cluster here in wild type. So in cluster, cluster zero and cluster three. So cluster zero and cluster three has about 59,000 cells. And we believe that these cells are brown adipocytes. However, when we look in P31 knockout um, data, we see that these, these cluster populations disappear. And we see the appearance of these new clusters, uh, primarily cluster one, cluster two, cluster five, cluster eight, and cluster 14, and with roughly the same number of cells. And so we believe that these cells that were present in P31 knockout somehow differentiated into these new clusters and new cells which appear in P31 knockouts. So the first thing that we, so the first thing that we did in order to um, address, address our concerns or questions is that we, we performed cluster identification. So here is a violin plot of uh, marketing expression within, the, within, our, within our clusters. And so yes, we, we, found, we found the clusters to be mostly brown adipocytes as well as immune cells, including B cell, T cells, macrophages, um, neutrophils and lipid filled, lipid associated macrophages, as well as cluster, as well as progenitor cells. 
So here is an integrated UMAP of our data um, showing the annotated clusters. And so now our next step was to identify, okay, what are, what are the differences between these clusters, these brown adipocyte clusters? And so our first step was to look at UCP1 expression. So UCP1 expression is a marker for thermogenic adipocytes. And so I want to bring your attention to cluster zero and cluster, um, and cluster three. And as we can see in clusters, in the majority of UCP1 expression is found in wild type where there is scant um, UCP1 expression in, in P3-1 knockouts. But we see the inverse relationship in cluster one and cluster five, in which we see the majority of UCP1 expression is in, is in um, P3-1 knockouts versus wild type. And so this helps to, um, this helps to give credence that the clusters that we found were indeed brown adipocytes and they are somehow related. So next we looked at adipogenic pathways and the first, path that, the first pathway that we looked at was uh, lipogenesis. So here's a heat map of different lipogenic marker expression within the clusters. And as you can see here, the trend is very clear that P31 knockouts have an increase in lipogenic marker expression compared to that wild type control indicated by the increase in red color. Next, we looked at lipolysis markers and we found that there was more heterogeneity and expression of lipolytic marker genes within the clusters. However, we found that P31 knockouts have a decrease in lipolytic marker gene expression compared to their wild type controls. Next, we, formed, next we um, conducted pseudotime analysis. So pseudotime analysis is an analysis um, that shows the relatedness of these clusters to one another. And as we can see here, that the clusters which appear in P31 knockouts um, had a, have a greater distance in relation to those which appear in wild type. So the knockdown of P31-1 bears new brown adipocyte clusters. So here is a Here's a panel of, here are a panel of pseudotimes with brown adipocyte markers. And so, yes, looking at UCP1 and COX-8B, we see that cluster zero and cluster three, which appear in wild type, are indeed related to the clusters which appear in P3-1 knockout. However, looking at other brown adipocyte markers, particularly Sedea, uh, we see that these clusters are the same, but somehow they're, they are, they are related, but somehow they're different. And looking at androgen beta receptor three, we see that the majority expression is in wild type versus, um, versus other clusters. So next we looked at lipo, lipogenic transcriptomic heterogeneity. And so looking at fatty acid synthase, synthesis um, using the marker FSAN, we see that the clusters which appear in P3-1 knockouts have a greater expression of FSAN indicating greater endogenous lipid production. When we looked at fatty acid transport through expression of FABP4, we see that um, the, 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 the brown adipocytes that we have yet to characterize have greater expression of FABP, greater, fatty, greater intake of lipids from their environment. And so this indicates that, again, that yes, these are brown adipocytes, but their transcriptomic heterogeneity makes them different. So we feel that P311 um, is potentially required for this brown adipogenesis, and it could be potentially stopping brown adip adipogenesis at certain developmental stages, or it could be inducing uh, a more whitish brown phenotype, changing gene expression, ch changing the gene expression from typical brown adipocyte to a more whitish like phenotype. So here's work, here's mitochondrial work um, um, done by a postdoc in my lab, Dr. Paulna. And so here she shows that P311 has been indu induces mitochondrial biogenesis in our cell in our 3T3L1 cell culture model. So upon um, so upon transfection with P311, 
We see using a stain for mitochondria, mitochondria deep red. We see that P31 significantly induces the um, indu induces the production of mitochondria, and we and looking at and staining in green for the presence of P31, we see that P31 co-localizes with the mitochondria, indicated by the yellow color in our composite compared to the PCV um, empty control. And so I conclude that P311 is, uh, leads, the lack of P311 leads to dramatic changes in brown adipocyte phenotypes of uh, brown adipocyte tissue, and that this change in gene expression of a shift from more brown adipocytes to more whitish adipocyte phenotype is done through the enhancement of these lipogenous markers and a decrease in the lipolytic markers. And the, this phenotype shift from more metabolically healthier brown adipocyte phenotype to a less metabolically healthier whitish adipocyte phenotype could have implications for glucose homeostasis, metabolism, and obesity. And so our future directions is to assess how P311 expression influences adipogenic and lipogenic processes and other fat depots. And we want to investigate this phenomenon of phenotype switching and other models such as high and low fat diet feeding. And so I would like to give a special thank you to all who helped my, my advisor, Dr. Baudry, those at the Molecular Evolution Corps, uh, 10X, um, those at Georgia Tech. And I would like to give a special thank you to our funding sources the NIH and RISE, Morehouse School of Medicine, and I'm open for any questions. Thank you, Stephen. Any questions? Okay, so. If there are no questions, uh, I think we have a short break. Um, we have a short break, and then we'll come back at 3 o'clock for the next session. So come back at 3.
So it's on my computer. <laughs> oh, <good. laughs> so, I can always change it over too. No, no, it's fine. Okay. So here. USB C. Okay, that works. Okay. Yeah. Should just be able to plug it in. Let me see. Projector all. HDMI. That worked. No, 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 it didn't. Did <laughs> uh, mm. briefly work? Let's call somebody. We need an IT. IT. Oh, what about this? I got it. Maybe. Hold on. Maybe if I try this. Let me exit out of that. Is it this? No. I'm trying a new oh, one. That's okay. You got it? Maybe. Maybe. All right. Let me see. There you go. Perfect. And you have a clicker right there? It turns out I have a future in IT. Well, I'm not for you. <laughs> If this Success doesn't work, yours. I know what will. I definitely don't. Yeah, no. Uh, what do you need? I'm trying to turn the microphone off. Is it this one? Yeah, because you're live, right?
Good afternoon, everyone. We'll begin the last session of the day. Um, I'm Manisha Aluru from Georgia Tech, and I'll be co-chairing this session with Dr. Badri from Morehouse. Uh, this session is uh, slightly different. We have two industry speakers and one from Research Foundation. Uh, I would like to remind the speakers that they have 20 minutes talk time, including Q&A, okay? So with that, let's welcome our first speaker, Dr. Ryan Mout. Uh, Dr. Ryan Mout is, <laughs> is a science and technology advisor at 10X Genomics, and uh, he'll be talking on accelerating breakthroughs using single cell and spatial tools. Yeah, this will work. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thanks to the organizers for inviting us to, to give a, a, a brief talk today. Um, you know, we're excited to be here, part of an amazing day full of awesome science, so to speak. So uh, we're incredibly excited to be here to talk about some of the new things we have at 10X and we're, how we're trying to really accelerate some of the breakthroughs that y'all are able to make. And really, as we think about, you know, at 10X Genomics, we're a life science tools company. And as we think about building out these tools, we think about building them in a way that can help you unravel the complexity of biology, because this complexity is really what limits our understanding of disease and our abilities to improve both human and other species health. And so, you know, we've done this in sort of three different ways, and we've built out three complementary platforms. And when I say complementary, I mean complementary in terms of the sample types that you can put into these platforms, the data types that you get out, and the analyses that you can run after this. And so it started with our Chromium platform back in 2016, uh, which really is the gold standard for understanding the heterogeneity of dissociated samples at single cell resolution with multiomic readouts. And we think of this as an unbiased cellular discovery type of tool. But as we heard in Dr. Plummer's talk, uh, we heard a lot of feedback from the field that spatial context was incredibly important. And so we're always trying to help our, our customers be able to ask the biological questions they want to be able to ask. And so we, we said the second platform that we came out with is our Visium platform, where we're able to retain that morphological context, but still get whole transcriptome readouts. So now we can not only ask questions like what is changing in a sample of interest, but where within a tissue are those changes occurring? Because this is incredibly important as we heard today. And the most recent one that we came out with is our Zinium platform. So it's a little different in nature from our Chromium or Visium. Uh, but what Zinium does is our in situ platform, it gives you subcellular resolution of RNA and later this year protein as well on the same tissue section. But it's really designed to be you know, precise single cell insights. It's more of a focused type of tool, hypothesis, test, uh, hypothesis testing, kind of validation type of platform. And so I'm gonna briefly touch on all three today. Uh, but what I'm going to start with is our Chromium platform. And you know, really with this particular slide, what we're showing you is what we try to do is not only come out with a platform that helps you, but really iterate and expand the breadth of analytes that you can analyze from the individual cells in this particular case. And so we, you know, we started with the ability to do whole transcriptome profiling, then profile the adaptive immune system. And our most recent release is one that you heard about with the ability to profile single cells dissociated from FFPE tissue is our flex chemistry, uh, which is a probe-based assay to detect RNAs and proteins as well. And so as I mentioned, we are trying to, continue to continually build this platform out to be able to expand the breadth of analytes that you're able to detect from the same cells, but we're also always trying to iterate to make these assays better because we can always improve. And so on the topic of flex, we, in, you know, this year we're trying to expand the capabilities of the flex assay. So we partnered with Protein Tech and BioLegend to be able to profile intracellular proteins at the same time of the whole transcriptome. Both our R&D and a, a group that I work with at the University of North Carolina have been able to do CRISPR screening with our probe-based chemistry. And then we also recently came out with a pr protocol to do whole blood fixation, so fix the blood at the site of collection, and then later on isolate leukocytes or PBMCs of interest. But we're not just focused on you know, coming out with new assays. As I mentioned, we're always trying to iterate on the assays that are available. And so we've done this most recently back in February when we announced our GEMX platform. And so GEMX is sort of new conceptualization of our reverse transcription-based assays, uh, a lot of what you heard about today. 
And so with GEMX, it's kind of a, a new development of the microfluidic platform uh, that goes into the, the Chromium system, but it's also a, re a revision of the chemistry. So new buffers, new reverse transcription enzymes, new partitioning oils, et cetera. And we're incredibly excited about this for a number of reasons. You know, one is we do see substantially increased gene sensitivity. Uh, so essentially what this means is, you know, we get more genes per sequencing read, as I'll show you. And it's built to scale, so you can put, you know, double the amount of cells through a single channel within the microfluidic chip. But for me, as the scientist, you know, the most exciting thing is it's more efficient. Uh, and so essentially what this means is that you're going to get more data back from those precious samples that you put the effort in to dissociating and generating to run in your single cell platform. So we see, you know, reduced multiple rates and better cell recovery efficiency. And to me and a lot of the folks that I've spoken with thus far, uh, this is the most exciting part. But we are trying to keep this to be able to be a multi-omics type of platform because we, we understand that this helps us really get true resolution of the cellular profile. And so with the GEMX platform for 3' prime, we can still do cell surface proteins alongside the whole transcriptome profiling. And with the 5' prime assay, these are the two available right now on GEMX. Uh, we can still do whole transcriptome poly-A based uh, profiling alongside that adaptive immune system profiling cell surface proteins and in our functional genomics CRISPR screening. As I mentioned, we do see substantially improved gene sensitivity. So in, in these graphs, uh, what we're looking at here on the left is our three prime assay. On the right graph, it's our five prime assay. On the x-axis, this is sort of the number of sequencing reads per cell that we've done. And then on the y-axis is how many genes we've detected per sequencing read. And the dark blue is the GEMX and the lighter blue uh, is the previous version, the next gem version of these chemistries. And what we see for both the three prime and the five prime assays in these graphs are we do get substantially increased number of genes sort of per sequencing read. So we're getting substantially improved sensitivity. We see this as well from a UMI counts graphs. I just have 15 minutes, so I don't have time to show you everything, but we do see this uh, for the number of transcripts per cell we're detecting per sequencing read as well. And you can see we're about doubling this um, for some of the sample types that we've tested. But as I've mentioned, you know, it's also more efficient. So we can double the throughput, but I think the, the, the most exciting part is we're seeing lower doublet rates. And you can see this, we're seeing this really across the board, across the scale of the number of cells people want to profile. In this case, this is internal R&D testing. And you know, this is incredibly exciting, especially for those cell types that might be rare. Uh, for those rare cells that you're going to put into the platform, you're going to get more data back. And so that's exciting. And then we also see better cell recovery efficiency. So for both the three prime and the five prime Gym X versions of the chemistries, we're hovering around 75% on average, uh, but we have seen higher cell recovery. Uh, but this, just this increase in cell recovery is incredibly exciting because you're gonna get more data back from those precious samples that you put that time in for, which is incredibly important. And you know, one of the th other things about the GMX chemistry, as I mentioned, it's a new redesign to the microfluidic chips. And so we do have a quicker runtime on the, the GMX chemistry. So these are six minute run times. And this really allows for better profiling of fragile cell types. In this particular example, uh, we're showing you the case of neutrophils, which are incredibly fragile. And so in this particular case, what we've done is we've taken PBMC sample, ran it on the previous version of the three prime chemistry and the GMX version of the three prime chemistry. And just from a visual perspective, you can appreciate that with the GMX, we're capturing more of these neutrophils partly due to the, to the more efficient runtime. Uh, but also, part of that is also due to the ability to more sensitively detect these lowly expressed neutrophil marker genes, as you can appreciate here by more uh, purple colored dots, I guess, uh, on the bottom half of this particular graph. And so this is exciting. But it's not just with our three prime. As I mentioned, you know, for those of you who are interested in profiling the adaptive immune system, this holds true for our five prime assay as well. And you know we see both similar sample types or similar cell types uh, being captured in both of the chemistries. But I think what's important here is we're able to profile more cells with GMX uh, based on the cell recovery efficiency. But also, you know, these VDJ transcripts can be lowly expressed. And so, uh, what's incredibly exciting is we also see a better an increase in the number of cells that have these VDJ transcripts and the number of unique clonotypes that we see within these populations of cells. And so we can more robustly profile uh, the T cell and B cell repertoires from these precious samples that you're putting into the platform. And so I've talked about, and you, you may have heard about our probe-based and poly-A-based uh, assays. And so one question that I get a lot now 
is you know which one is going to be a best fit for my particular study. And so I kind of adapted this slide to try to address that question very broadly. Uh, but really, a lot of it, what it comes down to is the sample type that you have and the research question that you're trying to ask. And so our reverse transcription-based assays are, you know, they're species agnostic. And if you've got, you know, low number of cells, they're really good because they have lower cell input requirements. Um, and then, you know, there, there are also sort of more true discovery by nature in the sense that we're profiling the polyadenylated RNAs. And so we can do things in a more broad setting uh, like look for isoforms, SNPs, uh, you know, you can do RNA velocity analyses, things like these that we can't do with probe-based assays. But the, the flex kit, uh, which works with fixed and cells dissociated, fixed samples and cells dissociated from FFP tissue, it does, an easy, it does enable easier sample batching. So you could fix a sample upon collection, you know, store it for up to six months. So if you've got a you know, longitudinal study or sort of an inter-institutional study, um, this can be a really powerful tool. And if you were to max out the scale, uh, at this point in time, the, the flex kit is the lowest cost at scale. And then if you've got FFP tissue, really the flex probe-based chemistry is the way to go. Uh, and so we're not solely focused on our chromium platform. We're also trying to expand upon our spatial platforms. And again, as, as we've seen, spatial is an incredibly powerful tool to more broadly profile uh, these different biological questions that we need to be able to ask to understand health and disease. And so I'll briefly just share some uh, updates to our whole transcriptome Visium platform, which is our spatial platform. And so, you know, I'm only going to talk about one thing, but it, it lives on the Visium Site Assist, which is an instrument that we developed that sort of bridges the gap between your standard histology workflows, so your sectioning and your staining, and your standard molecular biology workflows, which will be your library prep, cDNA, um, et cetera, sequencing, and then data, vi data visualization as well. So, so really what the Cytosys does is, is it sort of facilitates the transfer of these probe sets onto a capture slide that we can then take through downstream library prep and sequencing. And having the, the Cytosys is an incredibly powerful asset because it enables the highest data quality and because we get the highest data quality on the site assist, we recently launched our Visium HD tool uh, on the site assist only. And so Visium HD, uh, it's similar in function to our standard Visium workflow, uh, where we have a barcoded array. Uh, it's just now in higher definition. Um, and so essentially, it's still whole transcriptome, and we've got probe sets for human and mouse uh, samples. But we've got two capture areas that are six and a half millimeters squared. Uh, but the barcoded, these, these uh, molecular features are two microns now versus the previous version of Visium. Uh, those molecular features or spots were 55 microns in diameter. And I'll show you an example of the slide in just a second. And so, you know, it was designed for FFP, but we plan to come out with protocols for fresh frozen tissue and fixed frozen tissue as well, as well as poly A based approaches. Uh, you can still stain with HE or immunofluorescence to align that morphology with the sequencing information that you're going to get at the end of the day. And really, the power of Visium, I, you know, I don't have to go into this too much. Jazz, uh, Dr. Plummer did a good job with this earlier. But we can retain this morphological context, get the whole transcriptome information, and do a whole bunch of things with the data. Here, we're just looking at unbiased clustering. Uh, this is the version 2 of the Visium chemistry, so the most recent version of what you, I guess you could call the standard definition Visium, where we're looking at 55 micron spots, and there's a small gap between these spots. And this is a colorectal cancer sample. And you can see just the difference in sort of the resolution we're getting. This is still unbiased clustering with, with Visium HD. It's just now for, for these you know, different parts of the tissue that are more oblong, uh, or even cell types that aren't in a perfect circle, <laughs> it's going to be a good fit uh, for those types of discovery-based uh, research projects. And you can really finally see the resolution difference here in this particular enlargement. And just a quick overview of the difference in the slides. Um, and so the, the Visium uh, HD slides still have two 6.5 by 6.5 millimeter capture areas. But instead of being you know, 5,000 barcoded spots, we've actually got these 2 by 2 micron squares that are contiguous. So it's an entire array of 2 by 2 micron squares. So we're going from 5,000 molecular features or uniquely, uniquely spatially barcoded sort of circles to 11 million. Uh, uniquely barcoded 2 by 2 micron squares. Functionally, the assay still works the same, and the workflow is not going to be that different. It's just the resolution is going to be much finer. 
And so part of that is why, you know, within the data analysis pipeline, we do recommend bending the data to kind of balance resolution, signal, and computational power needed. Um, you know, we do have in our standard pipeline eight mi an eight micron bin, but you can bin in any, in any, uh, in any iteration of two. Um, so you could bend down to two microns, you could bend up to 50, 56 microns to kind of compare uh, back to the version two of the chemistries if you would like, uh, but you can really bend however you would like in iterations of two just because that's the, the square size. And we've been able to validate this on a number of different you know, FFP tissue types for human and mouse. Um, and, and so you know, I'll just quickly touch on our Zinium in situ platform, just one slide on this. Uh, you know, we are excited with how well it's doing. We tried to design this to be a turnkey solution uh, where you can essentially get the, the, the instrument delivered. Um, you know, it's not a small instrument, it's about this big. Um, and essentially, once it gets to your lab and we, we do the installation, it's, it's ready to go. Um, and you know, we're already seeing preprints and papers come out with Zinium. Uh, what I would mention, because this is a multiomics workshop, uh, is we do have different things coming up with Zinium. So we have the ability uh, now actually to do multimodal segmentation, uh, so cellular segmentation is a crucial aspect of these types of assays, like being able to accurately call cells where they exist. And so with the multimodal segmentation, we'll have membrane stains and cytoplasmic stains. Uh, we will have higher scale panels, so we'll have a 5,000 plex panel and also 2,000 plex. Uh, but the point that I was going to make, because this is multiomics, and we are really trying to continue to develop all the platforms to be able to, you know, read out these different analytes, we will have the ability on the same tissue slide to do both RNA and proteins as well later this year. And so I'll just end the talk by saying we're trying to build these platforms out uh, to measure more biology because we think the more biology that we can accurately measure uh, with the right resolution, the more true nature of the biology we can really discover. And we're working on trying to improve how easy these workflows are. So we're trying to improve the robustness of the, the single cell workflows alongside the ease of use for the spatial workflows as well alongside lowering the cost to make it more you know, accessible to everybody. So I, I don't know if I have time for questions. Um, I might. I, I have 16 minutes on mine, so. Thank you for your attention, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> this is not a picture of me, by the way. It's the end of the day, it's okay. You can come, we'll be here today and then tomorrow. Yes, okay, cool. If you wanna come chat about anything, we're also happy to do it there as well. So in what situation would you use digital voice? This is a good question and it's, um, it's a really tough one, but really what it comes down to is, is partly uh, what biological question you're trying to address. Uh, and part of this is the sample type that you have, and can we design probe panels? So, so Zinium, it works based on probe panels right now. Is there like a limitation on the design of the so, panels? So this gets very convoluted, um, but yeah, so right now we have scale up to about 500 plex for the RNAs. Um, so part of it comes down to, is there enough genes in these panels that could help me understand the biology, right? Um, and, and so, so uh, you know, part of this with Zinium, you know, you get that subcellular resolution, so very fine structures, it's going to be able to be a better able to resolve those fine structures than even Visium HD will. Um, you know, so it re I guess that's a, not really an answer to your question, but it really comes down to the biological question that you're trying to ask whether, you know, profiling the whole transcriptome at two micron scale is going to be a good fit, or if getting subcellular resolution uh, for a smaller panel of probes is going to be a better fit. And we're happy to talk through this on a project-to-project uh, project basis. Uh, you know, myself and my colleague Jeff Byland, who's got a large microscopy background, um, we're happy to meet with you all to be able to try to help think through, you know, which one is going to be a better fit for what I'm trying to do in particular. Also, the, the, the tissue size, so the, the Zinium slide, it's, tw it's a 12 by 24 uh, millimeter um, it's rectangle. It's not a square. Uh, but and then the Visium is six and a half by. So there's like all these questions we try to help you think through to be able to ask it, but usually it comes down mostly to the sample types that you have and the biological question you want to address at the end of the day. Yeah. Any other questions? Great. Here you go. So in the sake of time, we are going to move on to the next speaker. So next speaker is Fred Soret, a lead from Singular Genomics.
All right. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's, uh, thank you very much for the organizer to, uh, to invite us today uh, to present on our uh, new uh, G4X uh, special sequencer platform. It's also a pleasure to be back at Georgia Tech. I spent a lot of days, weeks, and meet a lot of you, so it's great to see uh, former uh, customers. Um, as most of you may know, uh, I used to be in the company that just presented before me. <laughs> All right, so... Um, let me first introduce you to Singer Genomics. I don't know how many of you actually are familiar with Singer Genomics, but we are located in San Diego. We were founded in 2016. Um, we actually have commercialized, uh, we have been commercializing the G4 uh, bench top sequencer for about a year and a half ago now. Uh, this is a mid throughput sequencer. It's a very modular sequencer that allows you to do all your traditional NGS sequencing application from single cell to bulk RNA-seq to whole exome or genome. Uh, it's very flexible because we allow you to run multiple flow cells at a time. Uh, it's a very rapid uh, instrumentation that allows you to do all your sequencing in a single day. Uh, and you can generate up to 1.6 billion reads uh, within 24 hours. And why I'm saying this is really because what we have developed under G4 in terms of the chemistry, the high resolution optics, the fluidics, was actually the start to our journey into a spatial sequencing. So we actually used the technology we have developed for sequencing on the G4 to extend its capability and basically make it now um, available for in-tissue, um, uh, uh, in-situ tissue sequencing. So what we tried to do with the G4X that we launched about two months ago now, it's to also address some of the limitation that's currently available on the market with a, with a current spatial platform available, which is really related to flexibility, throughput, but also cost, and the imaging area you can actually look at when you put your tissue and analyze them. So the G4X is actually a multi-omics platform, a true multi-omics platform, because you can actually look at transcriptome, proteom, direct seq, you can actually do fluorescent HNE, all this from the same FFD tissue. So we are looking actually up to four modalities from the same section. So all those modalities are actually uh, analyzed on the sequencer itself. So the readout is a sequencing readout, very different from what we currently have on the market, which is generally speaking, using fluorescent barcode and hybridization protocols. So what we do is once the tissue is on the flow cell, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this and the workflow later in my talk, is then you are able to look at a panel of uh, genes to look at a hundred of targets. You can image a dozen, a dozen of protein, and then at the end you can actually visualize the morphology of the tissue by staining uh, your uh, section. So you do the three modalities sequentially, and that takes less than a day. So tell you a little bit more about the chemistry itself, because this is a unique uh, uh, te uh, technology. So we actually, when we developed our sequencing platform, we actually also developed a four-color SBS chemistry, a rapid chemistry by engineering new enzymes, and that's exactly what we are using to actually doing sequencing now inside the tissue. So we can look at, uh, we can count transcripts. For that, we use panel of uh, a target. Those targets are basically panel of probe that comes to bind to the mRNA target. We ligate those uh, circular uh, probes. We amplify them. And then what we do, we use our SBS chemistry for color to basically sequence or read the RNA target to identify the gene of, uh, of the, uh, you were looking for. Uh, then we have a modality called DirectSeq, which is something very unique that we're starting to develop uh, as singular genomics. In that case, we also use probes that come and bind to a conserved region, but now we're able to actually fill gap a variable region between those binding sites and sequence this. So one of the applications we have already demonstrated is, for example, TCR and BC analysis where you can actually get probes that bind to your conserved region in the CDR3 region, and then you can sequence a variable region. 
We can also do that for uh, CRISPR and single guide RNA analysis, as well as we can see that also being developed for SNP analysis, where or uh, indel or deletions, when you actually have that variable region that, you, that it's unknown and you want to identify it. And then the last modality is protein detection. What we do is we use antibody with a link to a DNA oligo. Uh, that basically antibody is specific for the proteins you're looking for. But what we do is, in that case, the pilot probe uh, bind to the uh, DNA oligos. And in that case, after ligation and um, amplification, we actually do in situ detection where we read the, only the first base pair. And we do several rounds of sequencing. So we basically image four, put, four proteins at a time. So to give you a little bit more insight, this is what's happening on the instrument. So in, uh, the uh, tissue is on the flow cell inside the instrument. You're sequencing like you do your NGS. So you have your sequencing reagent. It's a four color. So every spot is actually a transcript. And we basically flush sequencing reagent on the flow cell and then record the, the signal. Then we basically uh, pull all the signal together, do base calling alignment, then allows us to look at which transcript is present, where it is, and then to identify the different structure within a tissue. In that particular, particular case, this is a kidney tissue, and we use about 150, 105 transcripts. So again, this is uh, direct sequencing, so we don't use uh, barcode to profile uh, your, uh, your uh, panel of genes. Uh, we read the target RNA sequence to identify the uh, gene transcript. We also use very short probes. So actually, the probes that bind to your mRNA is actually about 30 base pair. Uh, so it's really well suited for FFB tissue. Right now, this is what the technology is, um, is using for, for analysis. So it is not designed for uh, fresh frozen tissues. Uh, we use multiple probes uh, per target really to improve the sensitivity of the platform. And we also use multi uh, round of uh, uh, sequencing priming uh, to actually minimize optical crowding. Uh, what also this does is like if two transcripts are colocalized on top of each other, by using different priming sites during sequencing, you can actually see those two transcripts and identify them. So similarly for a protein, as I mentioned to you, in that case, we don't read the entire uh, RNA target. We actually read the first uh, base pair. So we uh, do several rounds of sequencing using different priming sites. And we read four prote up to four protein at a time. This is in tons of FFP when we look at 10 proteins. So the first round, we did four. And then the next two rounds, we did three of them. Um, on and all, the resolution on that platform is about 500 uh, nanometers. So as you all know, and I think now, you know, uh, several of the speakers have talked about this, and there's several data out there that show really what's the advantage of doing multiomics from the same FFP section. First, you do not need to aggregate your data between a uh, uh, section, but also it allows you to look at protein and RNA from the same section uh, on the same tissue, it allows you to look at spatial classification of cells, where they are, where are the structure on the tissue, but also relate that to uh, cell clustering, and even single cell resolution. So, um, so far, we have validated the platform on several tissues, tonsil, uh, kidney, breast tissue, um, uh, and a couple of others that are escaping lymph nodes, but also on very challenging tissue, such as uh, bone marrow um, tissue. So, this is one of our early access collaborators, Dr. Catherine Wu at the Donna Ferber Institute, where we actually uh, took some bone marrow tissue from 12 different patients uh, pre and post treatment. And those tissue are actually very difficult to analyze uh, for a spatial resolution, just because to be able to process those tissue, you need to decalcify them before you actually embed them. And usually, decalcification is going to really degrade your RNA. Because of our very small probe footprint, we actually were able to generate some very interesting data on about 150 transcript panel together simultaneously with about 10 protein panel. Uh, very exciting data. They're actually expanding the study right now, and hopefully it will be published uh, very soon. So uh, the platform, as I mentioned so far, is offering uh, the ability to do multiomics analysis 
but we're not stopping there. Um, when we talk about uh, expanding uh, spatial biology at scales, what we are talking about is also the ability to do more section in a, uh, more rapidly and really expanding what you can do, the data you can generate from spatial analysis. So what we have developed also with our flow cell is the ability to look at dozens of cross section in, within a single run. So to do that, we actually have developed flow cells that allows you to look at larger imaging area that is com com uh, currently available on the market. So ranging from four centimeters square of imaging area to 10 centimeters square. As a reference, four centimeters square is pretty much the imaging area you have on a Xenium right now. And then because all FFP and blocks are not creating equal, they have different size, uh, samples uh, are the, the different configuration. We actually have designed our flow cells to be compatible with different uh, size of uh, FFP section, uh, as little as four by four millimeter up to uh, 10 by 17. So really that's opened the breadth of uh, samples and the, uh, the, 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 not only the size, but also the throughput that are, is available on the G4X. As I mentioned earlier today, on the G4 right now, you have the ability to run up to four flow cells at a time. This is also to be the case on the G4X. So now, not only you'll be able to run one, but you'll be able to do multiple flow cell, really expanding the ability to run dozens up to hundreds of sample in a given run. So we have talked about the ability to do multi-omics analysis, increase the, uh, the imaging area you can analyze in a given run, but we also combine that with a much rapid turnaround time using the chemistry we have developed. So current technology allows you to run your spatial analysis between four and 16 days. The workflow on G4X will allow you to have your sample to data in three days. Two, day, two days will be on the bench, basically getting from your block, cross-sectioning it to mounting onto the flow cell and then doing the molecular, uh, molecular biology steps. And then an additional day, the third day that is done on the instrument where you basically will do the sequencing. So altogether, what we want to emphasize on the G4X is really we're gonna open up the, uh, biology, the spatial biology at scales. Today, while you can do a couple of cross sections in a single run within you know, a week or so of, um, of time to get your data. Now with the G4X, the imaging area, the throughput and the speed, you actually can do more sample, do larger study, whether it's multiple sample or multiple cross section per samples, really opening this new opportunity for 3D reconstruction. So this will be the uh, G4X. So the G4X is actually commercialized uh, in early 2025. And again, this is a platform that allows you to two technologies. You can do uh, NGS uh, sequencing one day, the next day you can do your spatial sequencing project. So it's really two technology, one platform, one instrument. So what's next? While the system will be commercialized early next year, what we have done is we have developed an immuno-oncology panel. This is going to be the first panel that is going to be available. That'll contain 300 genes, about 150 uh, immune genes and about 150 um, genes for uh, tissue specific. Uh, this is going to be offered for FFP tissue, compatible on the tissue only. And we are going to make that technology available right away through our research service program. So you'll be able to send your sample to our uh, customer application lab in San Diego. And basically we'll be able to run project with you so you can start your uh, special project on the G4X right away. And we also have uh, running a grant program that is going to close in a couple of weeks, actually next week. So if you're interested, just let me know and I'm happy to send you some information. And then finally, we also have some early access program. If you're interested, again, please uh, don't hesitate to reach out and I'll be more happy to address your question. And that's all I have. So I thank you again for your time and I'm happy to address any questions.
Uh, great talk. <clears throat> so question I have is like, uh, you said like you have a smaller probe size, but is that smaller probe size, like have you looked at like if that is compromising the identification of cells? Because like there can be a non-specific alignment as well as non-specific binding basically. So have you looked at that in the detail? Because I think that's very exciting data uh, in spatial, but main concern is like, is that compromising what we can identify? Uh, so that's a very good question. So this is something we actually, this is outgoing, ongoing right now at Singular Genomics, looking at specificity. Uh, we have not, for example, locked exactly the number of pro per target. You know, it's likely going to be in this range of like six to 13, 14. But they're going to also doing a lot of like a study about specificity, adding you know um, you know um, ERICC probes to see whether there is some you know um, issue with like binding and things like this. So this is ongoing. That platform is still being finalized. So this will be kind of like the type of data that will be generated, are being generated right now and be published you know in the next few months to look to address this question. Thank you. Oh, it's me. Hi, Fred. It's Jasmine. Hi, Jasmine. Um, so when you, it's direct, sorry, I'm most interested in direct seek, so I'm waiting for that, but I'm trying to be happy to the crowd. So in that immune on panel, oh gosh, in the immune on panel, um, do you do RNA, RNA first? And it goes through the decalcification process for bone marrow and it still survives and then you do protein? Is that like the, I'm just gonna do that. I missed like. Oh, sorry, okay. Yeah. So I'm specifically talking about the bone marrow, but in general, the immune onc panel, right? Which is 300, it goes RNA and then it goes some protein. Right. It goes decalcification first before you even do the RNA? Correct. So it survives RNA, how many RNA probes and then like how many protein? So for that uh, bone marrow, we did 156 RNA, 10 proteins. Across how many samples? Uh, like, did you do the so little punchies, or was it like the whole slide? Like, what was the situation? Because it doesn't like to stick either, right? So right. bone marrow has like two situations. One, the decalcification, but it needs enough surface area to stick. So I'm thinking about things like lung, et cetera. Have you guys, like, I know you haven't tried as many tissues, but is surface area an issue as well? So I don't know the answer to that question, but I definitely circle back with you uh, because we can definitely uh, internally address that. Thank you. Very interesting. On bone marrow, but I think I don't know, like, and, and um, they have reported, I think, sticking is not an issue, but I think the falling of the tissue, like, mm, like after a few cycles, has become a big issue. Yeah. 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 So I know they, we play, internally they play with the chemistry of the slides, so I, that's why I want to get the right answer to you, Jasmine. I don't know how much they're going to disclose, because I know there's still ongoing project with uh, Dana Ferber, but I'll try to get as much information. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, next speaker is uh, Chaitanya Acharya, aka Czech, from Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation. Thank you.
Last talk of the day. Um, <clears throat> I'm Chuck. Um, I'm the lead scientist at um, MMRF. In, uh, <clears throat> it's also called Multiple Element Research Foundation. So the focus of my talk is a little change of pace from the previous two talks. The focus of my talk is on how MMRF is driving some of the projects uh, with a particular focus on curing multiple myeloma and looking at immune microenvironment uh, at a single cell resolution, being a single cell workshop. So <clears throat> just a brief intro, Multimalum Research Foundation, even though name says Research Foundation, we operate as a biotech company. We have a CSO who's George Mulligan, we have a CF CFO, and we have a CMO who's um, Han Cho, uh, who's, who are instrumental in driving the strategy of Multimalum Research Foundation. So before I joined, most of the work done by Multimalum Research Foundation or MMRF is focused on initiating research projects by partnering with academia or by uh, partnering with uh, biopharma. So very briefly about MMRF, it's the largest nonprofit focused on accelerating cure for multiple myeloma. It's completely patient-centered and it is driving innovation by forming these strategic alliances with leaders in academia, pharma and biotech. We also have sponsored lots of fellowships and we have initiated some collaborative programs in translation and clinical research. We also do not shy from investing as a venture philanthropy. You, you through, through our Multiple Myeloma Investment Fund or MIF, and we are instrumental in generating ton of single cell genomic data um, and also a creating consortium that work together in processing and analyzing and interpreting this uh, vast amount of data. So in short, we've raised about $600 million, more than $600 million for research, uh, helped initiate about 100 clinical trials, brought about 15 plus drugs to the market, and we have seen approximately uh, three times the increase in life expectancy of patients. As you can see, the average age of patients with multiple myeloma is about 60 or so. Uh, the three strategic object objectives of MMRF uh, with a centralized focus on uh, DEI and health equity include accelerating the development of novel therapies, driving optimal and more personalized treatment approaches, and empowering patients uh, within the myeloma community. Our vision is a world free of multiple myeloma, and our mission is to accelerate a cure for each and every myeloma patient. So the core functions of MMRF include patient education. We have a separate department that focuses on that, and we also um, help in fundraising. We uh, frequently organize hikes, uh, uh, marathons, half marathons, bike rides, um, you're more than welcome to go to mrf.org to figure out, uh, to check out some of the uh, events organized by our fundraising committees. Uh, then we have marketing and communications department, MIF, and we have clinical operations, which specifically focuses on constructing these adaptive clinical trials, which you'll probably be hearing pretty soon. Uh, we recently uh, started initiated by, uh, initiated Horizon clinical trial, which focuses on relapsed refraction multiple myeloma patients. And we have a separate department for research informatics and I'm the first sort of uh, scientist within the research informatics division. So all in all, we are investing with more than $30 million um, annually <coughs> in research, uh, research and development. So through translation research, we are partnering with academia, um, clinical institutions mostly, to design and implement these clinical trials, and we generate vast amounts of data, and we make them available to all researchers. Uh, first of all, our partners, and secondly, to the public for data analysis, and most importantly, interpretation. You may have heard of this study called COMPASS, which is our flagship study, started in 2011. Patients have been followed longitudinally, and this is one of the biggest 
uh, clinical trials ever conducted. And this is also a largest genomic data set of any cancer worldwide. Approximately more than 1,000 patients, 76 sites worldwide, with the goal of identifying precision therapy for every single patient by looking at their somatic and germline variation. So it requires the collection of integration of data and a critical molecular and cell events in disease biology with respect to clinical outcomes. And it is a definitely collaboration between MMRF and leading academic medical center across the US and the European Union. And most importantly, because multiple myeloma is a rare disease, about four and a half, six patients out of 100,000 individuals get affected, it's important that we understand their somatic and germline variation before we even start understanding the disease characteristics. So right now, patients are treated with a cocktail of chemo that includes either doublet therapies or triplet therapies. Um, regardless, we don't really understand the risk uh, classification or stratification of these patients uh, because of lack of data. And so this is a way we generate data and make it publicly available so we can start dissecting individual patients with uh, multiple myeloma into various risk groups. Uh, in this case, uh, compost data has been instrumental in identifying patients at risk uh, of relapse. So you may have seen a uh, talk this morning by uh, William from Manoj's group who talked a little bit about immune atlas of multiple myeloma patients. And that, the motivation behind that project was that simply by collecting somatic variation and germline variation on these patients may not fully explain the biology of multiple myeloma. So additional extrinsic factors may drive disease biology and the clinical course of disease. Uh, well, seems like that's the end of my talk. Probably, you should probably not walk away from here. <laughs> you should probably not walk away from there. Yeah. You should do, are you logged into the computer now on the desktop? You are? Oh, still out there. I don't know where you are. Okay.
unless you were a teacher back then. Oh, okay. Then you know, you might find them in school for your PE or PE class. And then the different classes are available for you. But you probably could be in a hot spot in the summer and it might be your like high hot summer job to be able to get some of those people that want it. I think it's a little, the court is giving us the business. Thank you all so much for your patience. We are working hard to try to fix this. Hand me back. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, where was I? Okay. So. Um, <clears throat> All right. So the talk that was presented earlier today by William focused on Immune Atlas Project that spun out of this compass study, and the reason why that was uh, that that project was initiated was because we wanted to add an extra component to what we already know about these patients, which we think is still incomplete. So that was the immune biology of these multi melanoma patients. So if uh, we want to focus on immune microenvironment of multiple myeloma, uh, we definitely want to look at uh, CD138 negative cells within bone marrow microenvironment. Uh, and we, uh, I, uh, uh, I suppose we went ahead and we analyzed multiple different data types generated from this data. The, uh, the study that was presented earlier focused only on one single data type, that was single cell RNA sequencing data, but then we also have T cell receptor sequencing data, CyteSeq, CyteOff, um, and we are planning on having some sort of spatial biology on these samples, but we don't know which platform we're going to go with. Uh, maybe some of the uh, vendors today have, uh, have, have influenced my decision on using in one particular platform to explore bone marrow microenvironment. But regardless, we have generated treasure trove of data from COMPAS study to understand the immune microenvironment of these multiple myeloma patients. These are newly diagnosed multiple myeloma patients that have been followed for about eight years. So we do have longitudinal data on these patients, which means we can learn a lot more about the disease given the size of this data set. So from, again, from the COMPAS study, since we have learned about these individual mutations for these patients, another umbrella trial that we started is called MyDrug, or Myeloma Developing Regimens Using genomics, this umbrella trial was developed to evaluate activity of select targeted agents in relapsed refractory multiple patients. And these patients have been exposed to multiple uh, therapies and they have been refractory or resistant to some of these therapies. 
this trial has multiple arms. As you can see, the one that I want to focus on today is, uh, is an arm that focused on patients with RAS activating mutations for NRAS, KRAS, KRAS, and BRAF mutations in these patients that have been treated with cobimetinib, which is a MEK inhibitor, along with dexamethasone, which is a standard protocol. And they have been targeted for two cycles, followed by a backbone therapy, which is pretty normal in myeloma. So patient assignment or study arm is very dependent on presence of very specific oncogenic gene uh, or pathogen mutations. So a very quick look at patients. Again, we couldn't recruit multiple patients for this analysis for the study, uh, my drug study, particularly in this arm. Uh, we had about like 10 to 12 patients. And here is uh, sort of an idea of what sort of activating mutation is present in these individual patients. The time points, uh, not all the time points were available for patients uh, to access samples from. But one of the things we did with respect to, multi with respect to single cell analyses is that given the advances that we have made in single cell RNA sequencing data analysis, we wanted to leverage what we already know about bone marrow microenvironment by using something called azimuth developed by the same folks who developed Sura. So you can project information that we only know about bone marrow microenvironment over the data that we are in possession, which is the data you're looking at on the screen right now. And in order to give it a context, if you want to look at samples that have been relapsed and samples have been treated with a particular drug as an like, selective pressure, you also want to go back a little bit to see what happens to normal bone marrow samples and newly diagnosed bone marrow samples, multimalum samples. So we collected data sets, external data sets that were recently published from Irene Gurbiel's uh, lab and also some of our pilot study uh, data. So we put them together in order to create this single cell UMAP um, embedding that you're seeing, 2D embedding. And we made use of, we leveraged information from a previously published bone marrow atlas and, and, and we labeled cell types. Labeling cell types is always a challenge. So, so what you're seeing here, you have to take it with a grain of salt because we're not really interested in every single cell type you're seeing on the screen. Uh, essentially because of the number of cells that you're annotating based on expression levels of certain markers. And, and, and some of our, um, some of the audience members, I'm positive are not appreciative of that way of labeling cell types in single cell sequencing. But eventually what we'd like to do is look at the distribution of cell types before and after selective pressure. In this case, we want to use normal bone marrow or newly diagnosed multiple myeloma samples as our reference, um, relapsed refractive multiple myeloma samples at baseline, followed by two cycles of MEK inhibitor uh, and, and uh, backbone therapy. So what you're seeing here is a stacked bar plot with showing some trends in changing cell abundances. And most of the time, we want to focus on T cell distribution uh, and monocyte macro macrophage distribution. That's because these are the majority cell types that you find in, 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 in this context. Uh, and once again, you have to take this with a grain of salt because you're identifying multiple different types of T cells, whether CD8, CD4 T cells. In this case, given the sample size, we did, a, we did find multiple different kinds of effector cells. And we want to focus on one because we can clearly see trends in changing abundances uh, of CD effector T cells for normal bone marrow samples followed by newly diagnosed multi myeloma and relapsed refractory uh, with and without treatment with MEK inhibitor. You can see something similar in monocytes and macrophages. So that begs the question if there's any interaction happening between monocytes and macrophages. And what this plot is showing you is uh, a one such result from uh, a cell-cell communication network analysis, a 2D plot but your vertical axis focuses on incoming interactions and your horizontal axis focuses on outgoing interactions, essentially the receptor ligands. And individual dots is an individual cell type. And because we have a ton of cell types that we have identified, you're looking at multiple cell types across all different time points. 
beginning with newly diagnosed samples, followed by relapse refractory and, um, and two time points uh, following MEK inhibition. So I think what this tells us and what this helps us do is sort of zero in on the cell types of interest that will that will then will drill down into the mechanics to understand the underlying mechanisms which can be functionally tested uh, down the road. So essentially we looked at, we investigated cell communications between monocytes and CDT cells. Once again, we did that because most of them, because those are the two cell types that are most abundant in our uh, single cell milieu. And these dot plots, which are representing the percent cells expressing individual markers and also average expression of that marker of interest. Uh, following our cell-cell interaction network analyses, we've identified that interferon gamma is being highly expressed by CD8 T cells following MEK inhibition. Uh, and we don't know why that's the case because interferon gamma usually is highly expressed under selective pressure and that is always associated with good prognosis, again, correlative. In this case, we want to see if there is anything beyond that because we know that MEK inhibition is particularly trying to, uh, trying to interfere with signaling pathways that drive CD8 T cell activation. So in this case, this figure is describing you, describing how MEK inhibition is affecting not just your tumor microenvironment, but also tumor cell itself, vis-a-vis, -vis, it helps us sort of draw some inferences on how MEK inhibition is influencing CD8 T cell activation and how can we leverage that using synergistic therapies. For example, you can perhaps uh, mix MEK inhibition with uh, checkpoint inhibitors uh, because we've noticed that uh, uh, PDL1 is highly expressed in plasma cells following MEK inhibition. So there's one example of how we can uh, use synergy to um, uh, perform these um, uh, downstream assays. So this is where um, MMRF is trying to um, drive innovation in forming these collaborations that can help us do these uh, further studies. Uh, and as I've mentioned before, all the data sets that we have generated and we're planning on generating in the future will be made available through our virtual lab site, which is not up and running yet, but we are hoping that it'll be, uh, it'll be out soon for scientists and clinicians alike. Uh, and I'm gonna stop right here because I'm out of time and uh, I will take any questions. Hi, Chuck. Um, great talk and a lot of things that I didn't know about the MMRF doing. And I wanted to ask, you know, if you project the strategy 10 years from now, do you see it like a converging strategy? Do you see it as a MMRF's role to be wide in order to identify things that are unexpected and potentially not supported by NIH? Or do you think, you know, its its, it's goal is to just push beyond what one lab or one institution can do just bigger. So wh what do you think if you project it 10 years from now, what, what's the vision? So now, we want to be able to work with everybody within the multi field and be able to um, form more alliances and make it like one-stop shop for multiple model research. Essentially through our VLAB analytics, uh, hopefully we will welcome a lot more people into this alliance, uh, you know, uh, because our research strategy right now is not sort of, um, we are not, we're not, we, we are thinking more about widening our research initiatives because in the past, COMP was focused mostly on newly diagnosed samples, but now our focus is, our focus is mostly on 
relapse refractory because as I said, we are operating with biotech and most of the drug discovery is happening in the relapse refractory uh, myeloma field. So we haven't really done much there. And so right now, our new initiatives that you're gonna hear soon, um, most of those initiatives will be focused on relapse refractory for which we need more people coming in and helping us out with uh, data collection, uh, patient enrollment, um, data generation, data analytics. And part of the reason why we want to have something like a mile initi initiatives at MMRF, uh, you know, that's why we want to invest more money um, in, into all these initiatives, um, at, uh, projects that will help us get to a point where we can say we are trying to cure myeloma. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, Yuck. <clears throat> Great talk. So I think I, I want to maybe like uh, you comment on two points. One yeah. is <clears throat> most of the studies I think multiple myeloma is doing, they're in full-blown stage basically mm -hmm. of multiple myeloma. How about myeloma prevention? Uh, <clears throat> that is first question. And second, I think because the conference is attended by most of the trainees, right. so how do multiple myeloma research foundation right. is <clears throat> really uh, trying to help the young uh, right. trainees right. Uh, right. to come into this area. Can right. you comment on both of these? Yeah, thank you so much for your questions. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, so we have fellowship opportunities. I'm going to answer the second question. We have fellowship op op options and opportunities. Please reach out to me, and I will definitely direct you to uh, the right person to talk to you about these opportunities. We, uh, we uh, support uh, uh, postdoctor fellows. We support medical fellows. Uh, we also have internships. Uh, we have uh, recently, we are thinking about having uh, an, an extra omics initiative where, where we're going to identify uh, people of different backgrounds, diversity, uh, uh, all-inclusive program where we're planning on uh, investing more in uh, training individuals who, are, who really want to contribute to the field of myeloma. Uh, first question, prevention of <laughs> myeloma. Uh, I can answer that question um, to some degree, but most of the answers probably uh, may not may not be um, may not may not be satisfying. So, the goal of having the compass study looking at newly diagnosed samples is actually lean back to see what is that one triggering event that is causing myeloma, whether it is uh, a single clone or whether it is multiple clones. We don't have the answer to the question yet. Ideally, you'd want to have uh, some basis of identifying patients at, at risk of relapse because the event has already been triggered. The reprogramming has happened like upstream some, at some point in time. I don't really know when that is. And to get to the point, we probably have to focus on the tumor cell itself uh, and um, and the data that we have right now may not be helpful to answer that question. How do you prevent myeloma from happening in the first place? But right now we focused on how can we keep people alive? <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. That concludes uh, today's sessions and uh, I would like to request uh, the organizers if you, know, you need to say anything about tomorrow's program or so tomorrow i think we will be starting at nine o'clock and there are two exciting talks one is by Anis from howard medical school and followed by zue zhang um, so one is focused on spatial other one is focused on computation uh, biology and then uh, we have uh, a session on AI and uh, omics, uh, followed by poster session. So I think uh, I look forward to see everyone here tomorrow. And um, thanks, everyone. Please remind them to return. Yeah, uh, please return your tags um, at uh, the reception. Just the plastic. Okay, just the plastic. Yes, the bags, because they recycle them because they're like magnetic, so a little bit pricey. So you know, there we, we would like if you remember to have the you know the bags back. Okay. Thank you. Sorry Thank about you. that.